Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper, to please to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the order of business. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Mr President, committees have lodged proposals to meet as shown at item four of today's order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, we shall move on and I'll call the clerk. General business order of the day number 66, Social Security Administration Amendment Protecting Consumers from Predatory Leasing Practices Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr President. The Social Security Administration Amendment Protecting Consumers from Predatory Leasing Practices Bill 2020 is a long overdue reform. Labor Senator Doug Cameron first attempted to legislate a similar proposal in 2015, and he received support from the Senate only to have it rejected in the House of Representatives. And since that time, the calls have only grown louder and louder and the evidence more and more compelling about the damage that is being done by allowing consumer lease providers to access automatic deductions from social security payments through the service known as Centrepay. Now, this bill is timely because the uptake of the JobSeeker payment caused by unemployment during the pandemic means there are more people now with access to Centrepay and more people in the general community who are under financial pressure and vulnerable to unscrupulous behaviour and sharp practice. Time and time again, we find examples of people who are locked into consumer leases that they cannot afford, paying well above market rates for goods that they will never own. And yet the government continues to ignore these concerns Action through legislation would not be necessary if the government used its power to act administratively and enforce the existing rules. We know that this government consistently fails to act when low-income and vulnerable Australians need its support. They prefer to do nothing, which again and again exposes the community to predatory lending practices. The purpose of this bill is to amend the Social Security Administration Act 1999 and it would remove the ability for consumer lease providers to sign up recipients for social, of social security payments and access their payments directly through the centre pay service. The bill removes the ability for the departmental secretary to make any deductions requested by a person from their social security payments if the deduct deductions relate to goods hired under a consumer lease entered into by that person. I repeat the point I made earlier. Under existing legislation, Centrelink is enabled by section 61A of the Act, which provides that if a person asks the department secretary to make deductions from instalments of a social security payment payable to the person and pay the amounts deducted to a business or an organisation nominated by the person, the secretary may make the deductions requested by that person to that nominated business. So the main provision of this bill removes the power from the department secretary to enable these deductions from a person's social security payments if those payments are about a consumer lease. It's worth having a think about how Centrepay works. It was established back in 1998 as a budgeting and financial capability tool to assist clients of what was then known as Centrelink, now Services Australia, by paying rent and utility bills through automatic deductions from their welfare payments. And more than 600,000 people use Centrepay to pay bills, rent and ongoing expenses. But the proliferation of consumer leasing businesses as approved centre pay service providers 
is contrary to the policy rationale of Senate Pay, which was to enable people to budget and ensure that regular bills and essential living services, living expenses are paid directly from their welfare payment. The purpose of Senate Pay is to support recipients with payments of their expenses. But we know that these products are exorbitantly expensive. And given the expensive nature of consumer lease products, they are not suitable in nearly every case for people in these income brackets, and the use of this service is not in line with the purposes of centre pay. Now, the department actually acknowledges that centre pay's terms and conditions are supposed to prevent its users from being exploited by banning products, and I quote here, this is a quote from the department's own policy. Banned products are those which have significant potential for high cost but low value goods and services or expose customers to unacceptable risks of financial stress or exploitation. You couldn't imagine a descriptor that more closely aligns with the products being offered by some consumer lease providers. And it is hard to understand how Services Australia can possibly claim that many of the consumer lease providers that they have on their books right now could possibly meet this test. The payment structure of consumer leases can cost consumers so much more in the long run than an ordinary purchase would, and it can further entrench low-income low individuals who are vulnerable in a spiral of debt. The Salvation Army observed in evidence to the Senate Economics Committee the following, and I'll quote it. This appears to be contrary to the original principles of centre pay, which we understand were to help people on low incomes with money management. In our experience, a consumer lease payment is more likely to cause money management issues. In fact, centre pay is effectively underwriting the business risks, the cash risks for these consumer lease providers by providing a guaranteed payment stream to these providers. This money comes out of a Centrelink recipient's benefit as a priority payment. And ASIC noted that although Centrepay lowers the risk of default on such payments for these providers, the evidence is that these companies charge people who are using Centrepay more than they do the general population. It is disgraceful. It is disgraceful that this persists, and it's disgraceful that it persists with the government and the department in full knowledge of the harm that it is doing to vulnerable people. And by retaining consumer leases in the categories of goods and services eligible for centre pay deductions, centre pay is being used for the benefit of commercial interests rather than in the interests of Services Australia clients who are making these payments. Centipay has, Centipay has been open to access by businesses whose products, particularly consumer leases, disadvantage consumers and have the potential to cause very serious financial harm. And there is evidence that some parts of the consumer leasing industry actively use Centipay to prey on the financially vulnerable. Now, not all consumer leases are bad, and not all consumer lease providers act unethically. But the government's failure to enforce its own policy means that the dodgy consumer lease providers in the market have a free pass to use centre pay to target pensioners and welfare recipients with unfair contracts and poor value services. Services Australia clients are subject to exorbitant interest charges, in some cases over 800 per cent. And the Australian Securities and Investment Commission has found that the cost of household goods leased from rent to buy businesses can cost nearly nine times as much, nine times as much as the retail price of those same goods. ASIC also found, as I mentioned, that the lessors often charge higher amounts to recipients of social security payments than they advertise to other customers. And at the end of the lease, and after all that expense, the consumer does not even own the goods. Between 2013 and 2018, ASIC's enforcement action against some of these businesses resulted in fines and community benefit payments of $3.4 million and remediation to consumers through refunds and debt write-offs of almost $27 million. If that is not evidence 
of sharp practice, of exploitative practice, of practice which is not consistent with Services Australia's own policy, it is hard to know what evidence would be necessary to have this hapless department actually act on these harmful products. The bill follows significant campaigns by the advocates, by the non-government organisations who are calling for further action on payday loans and consumer leases. It follows investigation after investigation by Senate committees on this issue. The 2019 report of the Senate Economics References Committee into credit and financial services targeted at Australians at risk of financial hardship found that the benefit of consumer lease providers of being registered with Senate Play is very clear. <coughs> Automatic deductions reduce the default rate for companies while also allowing them to charge the consumer for products well above the cost of the product. Thorn Group, the parent company of Radio Rentals, noted that 52 per cent of their customers paid via Centrepay. The damage that occurs through Centrepay's deductions, because they are automatically taken out, is that payments for consumer leases are prioritised for Services Australia clients ahead of paying for things that they really need—basic goods or services like childcare. The Consumer Credit Legal Service of Western Australia told a Senate committee hearing in March 2020 that in Mekathara, community workers told them of issues that the community faces with community leases. And the evidence was this, and it is disgusting. Many of the sales are unsolicited. They drive around in a grey ROV, park in the street and entice passers-by to sign up. The consumer lease provider charges hundreds of dollars in delivery fees, which are also paid for from centre pay deductions. In one case, a person mistakenly received brand new furniture meant for someone else. Then the consumer lease provider attempted to deliver that furniture later to the correct person. However, that person no longer wanted the furniture as it had been used, and the consumer lease provider demanded that that person pay $8,000 for the furniture. But despite this, and despite countless other examples, Services Australia refuses to enforce its own policy. That policy is supposed to prohibit products that are financially exploitative. But Services Australia continues to allow the worst consumer lease providers to access vulnerable customers via centre pay. There are alternatives. Certain types of household goods, rental or consumer leases and other types of financial products, including short-term loan repayments to cash lenders, payday lenders and pawnbrokers, they're already excluded from centre pay. And this bill will ensure that centre pay is prospectively closed to all consumer leasing companies for the same reason it is closed to payday lenders and these products. The prohibition contained in this bill will apply prospectively, meaning no individual who has entered into a consumer lease agreement using centre pay will be required to terminate this lease, their lease as a result of this legislation. And the legislation will only prevent consumer lease agreements using centre pay from being made in the future. If enacted, there are other payment options that would still be available to people wanting to purchase household goods. People would have the option of paying for their goods by direct debit, credit card, bank transfer or other payment services. And Services Australia clients also have the option of signing up for a fee-free basic bank account that can let them set up and cancel a direct debit with a different service provider, including a consumer lease provider, free of charge. They wouldn't be charged an overdrawn fee if they make a payment, transfer or a debt debit while there is insufficient or no money in their account. But for many low-income people, the best option may be to utilise microfinance programs such as the No Income Loan Scheme. And if you're experiencing financial hardship and you're listening to this, I would always suggest seeing a financial counsellor who can provide independent and free advice. I'll conclude now, Madam Deputy President, by saying this. Labor first introduced legislation to remove consumer leases from centre pay in 2015, and our legislation was supported at that time in this place. And since that time, the need for change has only grown. Government members of the Economics Legislation Committee have supported excluding consumer lease providers from centre pay, so I look forward to them backing up that commitment today by voting for this bill. Labor is once again taking the initiative to ensure that this service cannot be used by consumer lease providers to exploit Australians on low incomes. And for these reasons, the bill should be passed. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Seward. Thank you, Deputy President. 
I rise to make a contribution to the Social Security Administration Amendment Protecting Consumers from Predatory Leasing Practices Bill of 2020. This bill is necessary because the government has failed to act. They have failed to take the necessary measures to protect low-income and vulnerable, financially vulnerable Australians from these predatory practices. This bill provides that the Secretary may not make any deductions requested by a person from their social security payments if the deduction relates to goods hired under a consumer lease entered into by the person. Centrepay was set up to help people receiving income support payments pay rent and bills, essential bills, through automatic deductions from their payments. This has clearly been abused from consumer lease providers, from predatory lending practices. And this has been reported on in this place, in, community, in committee inquiries, um, through uh, a, a range of uh, community service organisations who see their clients come under the impact or affected adversely by these predatory practices. The government won't act. It's up to, um, in this case, Labor has brought this bill. Um, we have also raised this uh, issue many, many times. It's absolutely outrageous that Service Australia, Services Australia and before that the Department of Human Services had not met its uh, has not used its powers to ensure that these practices are not continued. It's very, very clear that these predatory uh, companies are clearly deliberately targeting those on income support, vulnerable Australians, knowing very well that centre pay will prioritise their payments. So it's a guaranteed source of income at, at absolutely outrageous interest rates. Centre pay should not be used to facilitate these appalling practices. We know that there are many Australians on income support payments who are suffering financial harm after entering into consumer leases that deduct payments through Centrepay. When consumer lease providers are able to access individuals' income support payments via Centrepay, these this can often does result in significant financial harm. People are locked into high-cost, low-value products which expose consumers to unacceptable risk of financial stress or exploitation. Consumer lease providers often employ predatory tactics and target vulnerable Australians who are doing it tough, particularly financially tough. Consumer leases come with huge fees and interest rates that often exacerbate financial hardship. For example, a consumer lease for a baby cotton mattress from Direct Appliance Rents costs $4,368 over 24 months, compared to only $1,487 when purchased direct from the retailer. That's nearly three times the cash price of goods and all payable via Centrepay, apparently with no questions asked from Services Australia. That's fine. No questions asked. Meaning that, and this means that payments are made before income reaches the person's bank account. Nobody should be forced to prioritise repayments for expensive consumer leases ahead of paying for essentials like food and housing. Consumer law action, the Consumer Law Action Centre have witnessed consumer lease providers restart Centre pay deductions after consumers have cancelled payments without obtaining the, con the customer's consent. They have also assisted consumers who have suffered harassment as a result of cancelling deductions or have had consumer lease providers continue to deduct payments through centre pay after the relevant contracts are finished. How is that possible? Where is Services Australia? They are negligent. In, re in regards to this issue, and it's been raised time and time and time again in this chamber, as I said, in committee inquiries, in estimates. This, this we were told, wasn't happening anymore. They were going to take care of it. Well, clearly, they have not taken care of it. The Commonwealth Ombudsman recently agreed with complaints brought forward by the Consumer Law Action Centre that Services Australia wasn't adequately enforcing its own policies against consumer lease providers. And you have to ask why. You have to ask why. Is it just because they haven't got enough staff that are able to do this, to provide this sort of oversight to ensure that rip-offs of people aren't happening? 
or is it because they're turning a blind eye to this sort of outrageous lending practices? This bill is necessary because Services Australia has failed again and again and again to respond to breaches of its own policies by consumer lease providers and therefore leaving vulnerable Australians open to exploitations. exploitation. In other words, a government department is basically facilitating these rip-offs. By failing to implement their own policies, they are facilitating the rip-off on a massive scale of vulnerable Australians trying to survive on income support. And we all know how, how poor, outside of the COVID um, supplement, how poor these payments are. Centrelink access, sorry, centre pay access is not needed by people to obtain, to, to obtain household goods through consumer leases, as there are other payment options available that enable people to make regular payments. If consumer leases were removed from centre pay, people would still have the option of paying for their goods by direct debit, credit card, bank transfer, POIL, um, sorry, uh, or signing um, for free, free basic bank accounts that do not charge default or overdraft fees. So they can also uh, go apply for an interest-free loan. These are options that are obviously not explained by these consumer lease providers when they are trying to flog people these products, because they know that if they go through Centrepay, they're not going to get pinged by Services Australia, and they can, they can simply rip these customers off to three, or we heard earlier from Senator McAllister, up to eight times the fees. These are appalling practices that if the government was doing the right thing, we wouldn't need to be standing in this chamber talking about it time and time again if Services Australia was doing the job it's supposed to be doing, which is actually, I think they forget that actually they're there to help vulnerable Australians, not facilitate the rip-off. The Greens support this bill. We think it's way past time that people on income support were protected from these predatory practices. It is appalling that action has not been taken earlier on this issue. Thank you, Senator Seward. Senator Ayres. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. Um, I uh, am very happy to rise to support this bill. I am very pleased that uh, Senator McAllister has introduced it uh, into this place, and I only wish that the government would either support the bill or act to deal with the exploitation that Services Australia is facilitating. Uh, centre pay is designed, was, was set up originally to help low income people manage their finances, not to facilitate the mining of profits uh, from the household incomes of some of the most vulnerable people in Australia. More than 600,000 Australians use centre pay to pay bills, to pay rent, ongoing expenses through automatic deductions. It's a sound proposition, but it has been open to access by businesses whose product, particularly consumer leases, disadvantage consumers and have the potential to cause great harm to Australian families who should have the government's support. About 10 per cent of payments made through Centrepay are for consumer leases—10 per cent. One in every $10 goes to these uh, operations that largely exploit vulnerable Australians. Consumer leases are an under-acknowledged, under-regulated and misunderstood cousin of payday loans. They are marketed to the same people, poor people struggling to get by, and they make their money from the same ruthless exploitation. Consumer leases are subject to responsible lending obligations. But there's no maximum cost of a consumer lease. Almost every time, the consumer will pay far more than the cash value of the goods. Services <coughs> Australia clients are sometimes subject to exorbitant interest charges. In some cases, 
over 800 per cent. And Services Australia says there's nothing to see here. They sign off on these propositions and allow them to be deducted out of people's accounts without a second look. ASIC has found that the cost of household goods leased from rent to buy businesses can cost nearly nine times the retail price of the same goods. With every consumer lease payment arranged through Centrepay, the government effectively endorses these practices. Our social security system should be supporting people, not endorsing a business model that creates poverty traps that many ordinary Australians can't find their way out of. The government is facilitating predatory lending and leasing practices that rip money and food off the kitchen tables of some of our most vulnerable families. This bill will, would ensure that centre pay is prospectively closed to, to consumer leasing companies for the same reasons that centre pay is closed to payday lenders. There are safer payment options. They include no interest loans from microfinance organisations. There are other payment services that are better regulated to avoid uh, uh, poverty traps, direct debit arrangements, credit card arrangements, bank transfer arrangements, all designed to support people making large purchases for, from a low income basis without being ripped off by predatory interest rates. A similar bill to ban centre pay for consumer leases, which was introduced by my predecessor, Senator Doug Cameron, in 2015, was the only private member's bill to pass the Senate in the 44th Parliament with every crossbench vote. During that debate, coalition senators consistently said that there was no need for such a bill because their government was working with regulators and the Department of Human Services to stop exploitative consumer leases. Five years later, contracts continue to be signed and they continue to get the stamp of approval from the Morrison government. Five years later, they simply haven't done enough. Always on the side of big banks, not on the side of ordinary people. In this case, always on the side of some of the most predatory, unscrupulous operators in the market, never on the side of low-income families. We have consistently advocated on this side for greater protections for consumers in response to consistent concerns about improper behaviour by consumer lease providers and payday lenders. I want to congratulate Senator Jenny McAllister for bringing this bill to this place, for doing the work that's required, talking to the advocacy organisations, talking to ordinary Australians, talking to people in the finance sector to develop a bill that's capable of resolving the problem that is so manifest for so many hundreds of thousands of Australians. While debating the 2015 private members' bill to close the centre pay loophole, now Minister Rustin said this. She said, I think it's incumbent on government not to interfere in people's lives to the extent where we tell them what they can buy or not buy. Oh, what a hypocrite. That's exactly what the government does. Uh, when it comes to other legislation that's before this House this week. In their dissenting report to the Senate Committee on Credit and Financial Services targeted Australians at risk of financial hardship, Senator Hume said, Coalition senators wish to emphasise that centre pay is free and voluntary. It helps individuals to budget, and people can start, change or cancel their centre pay deductions at any time. Well, choices don't exist in a vacuum. Desperate people Low-income families are not free to choose between feeding their children, buying their school uniforms or paying off a predatory consumer lease arrangement. Consider that when the coronavirus pandemic hit, the payday lenders were certainly ready. By April, they were sending text messages to potential customers. Need a COVID-19 relief loan? Fast cash loan paid in 15 minutes, no credit check one of the text messages said. In testimony to the Senate COVID Committee, ASIC Commissioner Sean Hughes said, when we get to what has been referred to colloquially as the cliff at the end of the various support programs, we think there will likely be an increase in utilisation of those payday lending programs. So it goes 
for these consumer lease programs. There are already millions of Australians in deep financial trouble under this government's watch. A million Australians are unemployed will peak at 8 per cent next year. 2.4 million Australians are unemployed or underemployed. Wage growth has stalled for the life of this government, not just this year, at historic lows for the life of this government, and the wage share of national income is at record lows. Last week, an ANU study found that Australian workers lost a total of $47 billion in wages in the first eight months of the COVID-19 recession. In particular, the recession has hurt those who completed Year 12 but who do not have a university degree, workers born in non-English speaking countries and older Australians. Are these people really free to make voluntary financial decisions? Well, look at the early access superannuation scheme much trumpeted by this government in their vain effort to undermine industry superannuation. APRA's data from the 22nd of November shows that 3.4 million Australians applied to the government's early release super scheme. The average release was $8,400. 1.4 million Australians applied for a repeat amount. The average release, $7,400. The total amount of money released, $35.5 billion. Treasury estimates that this will rise to $42 billion by the end of the year. Note for comparison, the 2021 budget has only $25 billion in direct, in direct COVID-19 support measures, according to KPMG. After taking into account inflation and the cost of living, a 25-year-old who withdraws $20,000 will be between $80,000 to $100,000 worse off in retirement. A 35-year-old who withdraws $20,000 will be at least $65,000 worse off. 590,000 superannuation accounts have been drained to zero. Almost all of those were workers under 35. Senator Hume said, for many people who have made that decision, they know that there's a trade-off, but they have made the decision to take that money today because they need to pay bills and pay down their mortgages. It's a choice she will never have to make, a choice she is incapable of understanding. And she went on to say, and that might be a better financial decision for their personal balance sheet to take that money today rather than lock it up for the future. It's free. It's voluntary. But it's robbing Australians, especially young Australians, of a decent retirement because it serves the ideological interests of those opposite. So the Liberal Party is incapable of understanding the position that low-income families are in, incapable of understanding the choices that they must make day to day. And what they're doing with every, every step of the way is making those choices harder is pushing them in a sort of path determinacy towards more poverty, towards less resources, towards less choices and more misery for low-income families. The people opposite Mr Acting Deputy President only understand the economy from the perspective of financial services that prey upon poor people. And that's what they're here to represent in this chamber. That's why they voted 26 times to oppose the Banking Royal Commission. Always on the side of the big banks, never on the side of ordinary people. In this case, on the side of some of the worst creatures in Australian financial services, the people who make ordinary, working class, low income Australians pay eight times the value of a consumer good and rip that money out of their pockets facilitated by the government. When, confronting, when confronted with the Banking Royal Commission, the then Treasurer, now Prime Minister, said it was nothing more than a populist whinge. He went on to say that the Labor Party was playing reckless political games with one of the core pillars of our economy. He said the only product of that approach could be to undermine confidence 
in the banking and financial system. I mean, what hypocrisy for the guy who was out there after the Banking Royal Commission waving his finger and tut-tutting. Uh, the real approach of this government has never been to be on the sides of ordinary Australians. It's why they are so determined to abolish responsible lending obligation laws introduced by Labor after the GFC, which will free up banks to aggressively push credit onto their customers. As I said before, Minister Rustin had to say about the Centre Pay loophole, I think it's incumbent on government not to interfere in people's lives to the extent where we tell them what they can buy or not buy. What hypocrisy. The coalition believes that vulnerable people deserve the right to be targeted by banks, to be ripped off by consumer loans and to be forced to drain their superannuation accounts in order to get through the recession, but not to conduct the basic transactions of everyday life. There's robo-debt, a project that Scott Morrison introduced as social services minister, made a centrepiece of his budgets as treasurer and has failed to take responsibility for as Prime Minister. Total debts, $721 million, 470,000 of them, 370,000 people affected. Not only did the coalition support dodgy financial schemes that prey on the poorest Australians, they created one. And it was illegal. The current line that income averaging was the issue is a fig leaf for a system that forced Centrelink recipients to prove they didn't have a debt, not the other way around, and it caused immense suffering. Family by family, 370,000 families, immense suffering. In Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, two tenant farmers debate the nature of the bank that is about to kick them off their farms. How can an institution designed by and maintained by people perform such inhuman acts? They say the bank is something else than men. It happens that every man in a bank hates what the bank does, and yet the bank does it. The bank is something more than men, I tell you. It is the monster. Men made it, but they can't control it. There's something similarly cruel in the logic of this government's approach to low-income families. And in this case, consumer leasing arrangements, they have made an arrangement that makes poor people poorer, that reduces their choices. What they should do is unmake it. They should support this legislation or do something to remove this cruel practice from Australian financial life. Thank you, Senator Hayes. Senator Henderson. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. It's my pleasure to rise and speak on the Social Security Administration Amendment protecting consumers from predatory leasing practices, Bill 2020. Uh, and before I speak about this bill, I just want to make some general um, responses to Senator Ayres' contribution, which I find found to be highly offensive and wholly misrepresented the government's actions that it has taken in so many respects to protect low-income earners across this country. Uh, we actually, in this country, have one of the most generous welfare systems in the world. And Senator Ayres attempts to misrepresent the fine work of our government in caring for those who most need our help is most offensive, even ridiculous comments like draining superannuation accounts when we have given Australians the ability to um, deduct some or t take some of their superannuation during this shocking year, the year of the coronavirus pandemic has been wholly welcomed by so many Australians. And I'm not going to sit, stand here and accept Labor's attempts to set up some sort of class warfare. I am incredibly proud of our government's work to support low-income earners, and particularly look at the work of this government this year. Job seeker, job keeper, job trainer, the most massive amount of investment in Australians to get them through the coronavirus pandemic, in excess of $500 billion. We have stepped up and we have stood side by side, all Australians, during this very difficult year. And it is quite telling that Senator Ayres never actually mentioned any of this in his contribution. 
Acting Deputy President, I um, want to explain the reasons why the government does not support this private member's bill before the Senate this morning. If this bill was passed, it would impact Centrelink customers who want to use consumer leases and who want to use Centrepay as their preferred method of payment. Just a couple of facts. Currently, there are 94,000 customers, or 14 per cent of customers, who use Centrepay to manage the purchase of goods using consumer leases. The value of Centrepay deductions for consumer leases represents 9 per cent of all deductions made. It's really important to reiterate that entering into any consumer lease arrangement is voluntary. Using Centrepay to pay for a consumer lease uh, is an important right of all Centrelink recipients. Deductions from a customer's payment via Centrepay can cease at any time, although this does not cease any obligations under the consumer lease, of course, that has been signed. Customers have to provide informed consent before a deduction arrangement using Centrepay can, can be put in place. So there are a whole range of safeguards uh, in relation to attempts to utilise Centrepay um, in some sort of improper way. All consumer lease businesses currently accessing Centrepay must have other payment options available, such as BPay, cash or credit card. And to help protect customers and not unduly restrict their access to finance, Centrepay only allows consumer leases covered by the regulatory framework under the National Consumer Credit Protection Act 2009. And that was a point that's not been made properly by those opposite. This is a very important safeguard, the regulatory framework, which requires consumer lease businesses to be licensed and comply with responsible lending obligations overseen by the Australian Securities and Investments Commission, ASIC. Businesses that use Centrepay need to comply and act in accordance with the Centrepay policy and terms and consumer protection laws. Services Australia made changes to protect customers in 2015 by removing unregulated consumer lease businesses from Centrepay. Services Australia employs a range of measures to further protect Centrepay customers and ensure businesses meet their obligations under Centrepay terms and conditions, such as ongoing compliance activity and regular monitoring. It's also important to point out that many Centrelink customers have um, limited access to microfinance. So if there is an emergency, such as the need to replace a fridge, a Centrelink customer can use consumer leases to address that issue quickly. They can then choose whether and how to make those regular payments uh, using, of course, centre pay. So, Acting Deputy President, the government takes its responsibility to consumers very seriously. Centre pay is a free and voluntary service which allows people to pay bills and expenses as regular deductions from their Centrelink payments. People can start, change or cancel their centre pay deductions at any time. To help protect customers and not unduly restrict their access to finance, as I've made very clear, there are very important safeguards uh, included in the centre pay, access to centre pay arrangements. And this was introduced back in 1999, and it is a very important bill-paying service to support um, income support customers. And most of, of course, the centre pay uh, mechanism is used for housing and utilities costs. So, obviously, this is a very, very important scheme. And since it was introduced in 1999, centre pay has grown and expanded into more than just a means of paying a bill. In the last five years, 46 per cent of all Centrepay customers have used Centrepay for more than one service reason, um, suggesting that it is actually used as a financial management tool. It's used actively by government and non-government entities 
uh, including such, uh, including the likes of state governments for court fine repayments, or um, not-for-profits offering low and no-interest loans, and um, the categories of goods and services approved for centre pay include a cost for accommodation, education and employment, health, utilities, household goods, travel and transport, social and recreational purposes, legal and professional services and financial products. So centre pay, as I say, is a very important mechanism to assist cu customers in managing expenses which are consistent with the purpose of welfare payments and also which have the effect of reducing financial risk and also supporting uh, financial management. In the, 19, in the 2019 20 year, an average of 648,000 customers per month used the service to make 26 million centre pay deductions worth $2.76 billion to approximately 14,000 approved businesses. Around 75 per cent of the monies dispersed through centre pay are for accommodation and utilities. And as I say, this is the core foundation of centre pay. Uh, being that it is voluntary and it is designed for regular ongoing deductions. And of course, I, I will also um, make the very important point that it is actually since 2001 that consumer leases for household goods have been allowed under centre pay. So it is only in the last couple of years that Labor has decided that this is an issue. So for all those years that Labor was in power, it never took any appropriate action. Uh, one can only assume because it didn't see that there was the need. And then, of course, uh, in 2015, uh, the then Department of Human Services um, introduced these new centre pay policy in terms which excluded unregulated consumer leases for household goods and also funeral insurance. So we understood where Australians were being improperly targeted and we took that action. Unregulated leases are those uh, exempt under the National Consumer Credit Protection Act and are less than four months um, or indefinite in their duration. Due to the gap in accessibility for some customers to access microfinance and money for emergency, regulated consumer leases remained on centre pay as a viable option. And that, I think that's really important. I mean, this is not necessarily the first port of call and anyone engaging in any sort of consumer lease does need to be properly informed and there are the appropriate mechanisms to ensure that that happens. But Payday lenders, short-term loan repayments to cash lenders, pawnbrokers and buy-now, pay-later schemes like Afterpay are excluded from centre pay and they've never had access to centre pay. So that's a really important safeguard because we understand that there are some operators in the market um, which are predatory uh, and which will try to take advantage of more vulnerable Australians. And that's why the likes of payday lenders and short-term loan repayments to cash lenders and the like and pawnbrokers, that's why they do not have access to centre pay. But I tell you who does have access to centre pay? The Good Shepherd Microfinance No Interest Loan Scheme. It commenced using centre pay for repayment of these loans in 2001. And Good Shepherd uh, Microfinance, that's a wonderful scheme. There are also no interest loans provided by other welfare or not-for-profit organisations like the Salvos or St Vincent de Paul, and they also use centre pay. So anyone who does need to access um, low interest or no interest loans because of an emergency or because of a dire need, they should absolutely look to these very credible providers to ensure that they get the best deal in the market. It's also important to reiterate that Services Australia undertakes assessment of business applications for centre pay and compliance audits of approved businesses. That's why that category of lenders uh, is excluded 
because the compliance work is done and we make sure that those safeguards are put in place. So approved businesses must meet and maintain essential criteria. And it's tough. The criteria is tough. The assessment process needs to consider whether the business conduct, whether the business conducts its operations in a manner that is lawful, ethical, and does not take unfair advantage of customers. It needs to consider the past behaviour of the business and the business representatives, information provided by regulatory bodies, consumers or consumer groups or law enforcement agencies, previous dealings with the business and complaints made against the business. So the bottom line is that where there is a provider which has a poor or dubious record or has engaged in, engaged in improper conduct, including conduct which may have risen issues under the law, then Centre Pay will not approve them. Centre Pay will not approve them. But if there is a credible organisation, why should Australians be denied from accessing consumer lease, leases and using Centre Pay to manage their repayments for those emergency items? Otherwise, many Australians could be placed in an even more vulnerable position. I also want to make the point that where a business breaches centre pay policies, including other laws and regulations, uh, the agency will review the business and reconsider its ongoing approval for centre pay. So once centre pay, a centre pay provider is approved, it doesn't stop there. There is an ongoing obligation to ensure that all businesses which provide a centre pay option are acting in the best interests of consumers. In the 2019-20 financial year, 326 compliance orders were completed. Audits were completed, I should say. The centre pay policy and terms retains the discretion for Services Australia to not approve, to suspend or to withdraw the approval of a business uh, if in its option opinion the, the business or representatives has not conducted or is not likely to conduct itself in a lawful manner, um, has failed to comply with the centre pay framework, um, is obviously subject to investigation or where other enforcement proceedings are brought against it. They're just some of the reasons. So Services Australia is playing a very important role to safeguard consumers and uh, that is um, many of the reasons why the government does not support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. I too would like to make a uh, contribution in the Social Security Administration Amendment Protecting Customers from Predatory Leasing Practices Bill 2020. And I suppose uh, to take a leaf out of Senator Henderson's book, I'll just take uh, exception to some of the comments that have been made from the other side uh, in the same way as she made them about Senator Rares. Now, she did manage, uh, did manage, uh, manage to uh, reference ASIC, and uh, ASIC has found that the cost of household goods leased from rent to buy businesses can cost nearly nine times the retail price of the same goods. So, in that environment, where she pointed to the regulator and said they're over it, they're across it, people can't uh, go astray here. The contribution from ASIC is that it's probably going to cost you 800 per cent if you go down this path of rent to buy. And I think uh, it's really instructive. The other comment was about superannuation and how the government's done everybody an enormous favour by allowing to access their superannuation payment early. And to be fair, that's given them cash in their pocket today or this week or this month, but it's taken a substantial chunk out of their pocket at retirement. It's reduced the potential lump sum exponentially. It's reduced their retirement expectation exponentially. And if you're a welfare recipient, it may well have compromised your ability to actually get welfare if you have a remaining uh, amount in your, uh, in your bank account because that would be listed as an asset and may well uh, you know, complicate your access to uh, Centrelink and the like. But this is a government that had an algorithm that went out there and punished enormous amounts of people. 
And indeed, there may even have been some, some suicides and the like if the pressure that was put on people with their algorithm. And they backed off and paid $1.2 billion in, comp in compensation. Why haven't they got an algorithm to have a bit of tickle around here and see who is providing the best value for money in this space? Because I accept if it's 40 degrees and you haven't got a fridge, you're going to get one. You're going to get one somehow. You're going to rent, borrow, buy, and perhaps other ones toward uh, means of getting it. So if your children haven't got a cold drink of water or a cold drink of milk, you're going to get a fridge. You're not going to sit back and say, oh, what is the best way of doing that? Will I get three quotes? No, you'll get a fridge within a day. And let's be fair. I have had little experience in this space. I've been encouraged by Senator Seward's contributions and Senator McAllister's contributions, Senator Pratt's contributions, to go out and do a bit of digging in this space. And if you go and get a briefing from a Centrelink social worker, they'll tell you some really interesting things. And I've had briefings in uh, areas of Adelaide which are chronically underprivileged, where there are three generations of unemployed people. And one contribution has never, ever gone out of my head. And they said, Senator, we're really worried about the grandmothers. And I said, the grandmothers? And I said, yes, Senator, because 16 and 16 makes 32. And we have people on welfare here who are 33 years old and already grandmother. Some of them made a bad decision once. Or an inter, you know, not a bad decision. They made a decision that affected their whole life. They had a child at 16, and it, you know, it precluded their in from continuing education or continuing into useful work. And sometimes that goes on and on generationally. And this social worker said, the ones that are facing like another 30 years of settling, we're really worried about those people, and they don't make good decisions. They need education. And I. On a, I came across a constituent who had a successful career in, in business and ended up doing some good work at a bank and in a, an air services company. Then he retired and he went and volunteered. Went and volunteered for the Good Shepherd organisation. And he went into homes, examined budgets, gave counselling and pointed the way forward. And the no interest loan scheme is incredibly good. And the way he was sort of explaining it was that we look at people's finances and say, look, there are other ways of doing it. We need to clear that debt, and then we need to let you go and buy the washing machine of your choice, the fridge of your choice, the TV of your choice. But we need to do some really hard work first, and we need to get you in a position where you can you know, get $1,000 to go out and do a bit of shopping. And he would then say to them, go out in the marketplace, don't commit. Come back to me and we'll have a look at your circumstances, your budget, your situation, and we'll try and get you on a path to success. And some are very successful at this. They appreciated the actual experience of learning from their budget, going into the marketplace, getting quotes. And there is a great organisation, the good guys, that looks at this space and says, whatever everybody else does, we'll do better. And they do a relationship with the, you know, the no interest loan situation. And people actually learnt from the experience. They learnt that it was expensive to go rent to buy. They learnt that it was expensive in these other areas. And they became much more successful and very proud of their own achievements because they're actually budgeting and making decisions about their life instead of reacting to what's happening in their life. And I give full credit to the, uh, the not-for-profits who are doing this no-interest loans area. Full credit. This government should be giving them more money. If you're really serious about getting people off welfare, you need to let them control their life. And controlling your life is being able to budget. Even on a meagre subsistence allowance like a Centrelink payment, being able to budget is the key to re-entry of the workforce, re-entry to education and a better life. And let's be fair, I mean these people don't have a lot of support. You know, if they had the family support that I'm fortunate enough to be able to provide or my son and daughter are fortunate enough to be able to provide. You know, people don't get too far away from you know, education, contribution in the economy and success. But these people are not in that situation. There are areas in Australia, well known, well documented, where people are subsisting. And this government, if it can take a robo-debt attitude and try and bang out big bills all around the country, could take a slightly less adventurous but perhaps a more private equity approach 
put a small amount of money, put, put $100 million into no interest loans, run an algorithm and see that it is successful. And perhaps they could even rejuvenate some of these areas. Because what we do know worldwide is that women particularly are incredibly good at managing small loans. They're incredibly successful. It's been proven in Pakistan, it's been proven in India, proven in many developing countries that if you give women who have a responsibility for children and the family a small amount of money, they'll become productive because they can articulate it, work it out and go forward with a, a reasonable degree of success. Now, unfortunately, there are many areas, many areas in Australia which have embedded underprivilege. And I thought Senator Henderson's contribution when she referred to ASIC was hilarious because isn't it Telstra that's just been found to have been predatory pricing indigenous communities? Is it not Telstra that's been found to sell mobile phone plans which are incredibly overpriced and disadvantaged to indigenous Australia? Where's ASIC? Where's ASIC in that space? Are they having a look? Well, you know, I think it's a free for all. I think it's a free for all. I don't accept Senator Henderson's contribution that these people are on the job looking at protecting indigenous communities, looking at protecting welfare recipients from predatory behaviour. Because if it's the case that ASIC has found that these businesses can cost, or these rent to buy businesses can cost nearly nine times the retail price of the same goods, then the only people who would enter that space are those who are completely vulnerable completely vulnerable or completely desperate, because no one would knowingly go and pay nine times the price of, a, of, a, of a, you know, an article in the, in the marketplace. But that's what we've got here. We've got a Liberal Party that is opposing what I think is quite a, you know, quite a sensible proposal to look carefully at who has access to services and Centrelink uh, Services uh, Australia uh, clients and make sure they're not being preyed upon. Pretty straightforward. It's not, a, not rocket science. I'm struggling to understand how anybody could actually support the rent to buy scheme. It's, uh, it's incredible. I mean, we should, if we're really serious about those on uh, Centrelink and those social security recipients, we should be giving them some free financial advice. We should be encouraging more not for profits. We should be stacking this area with more finance. And we should be measuring it very carefully to work out exactly what does work, what contribution in what area is capable of moving people. Because as my um, constituent told me, this is really good work. You can get a great deal of satisfaction out of moving people incrementally uh, towards that education pathway through a proper budget in the home or into the workforce through a proper budget in the home. These people want no less than anybody else. They want no less, and I don't blame them for making poor decisions. Because if I didn't have a TV and I was on Centrelink payments and someone said you can have one for seven bucks a week, I'd be there. I'd be there just like anybody else would be. And I'd count the cost later. So I think the, the contribution from the other side is, is thin. Uh, I think when you go over the superannuation area, <laughs> you, can, you can have 20 grand now or fine. And those who are most in need of it will take it. I accept that. But they kick themselves an own goal on a lower lump sum or a lower retirement future. And if you put it in as a Centrelink recipient and it reduces your ability to claim a payment, which is a bit of a contest at the moment, you've doubly kicked the goal. Government doesn't tell them any of that. So in summation, I really do think that everybody should support this, uh, this area because when you meet social workers in Centrelink, when you get briefings, People are in a struggling place and they need more help. And the help they need is not you know, just another handout. The help they need is to lift them up the ladder. The help they need is a proper household budget to identify previous mistakes and not make them again. To offer no interest loans, to get them into a space which will allow them to take pride in their, their home, pride in their children, their education. And if I, I cannot get that contribution from that social worker around the northern suburbs of Adelaide out of my head, we're really worried about the grandmothers because they face a lifetime of Centrelink, never having had a decent education, never had the opportunity to contribute in a, in a decent job. 
And all are because they probably made a very, well, arguably a poor decision when they were very young and vulnerable, or someone uh, made that decision and then abandoned them. So, you know, we've really got to do better in this space, and I don't know why we would argue about um, a product that's nine times the value um, being unsuitable for people who can barely afford to pay for their food, clothing and rent. Why would we, why would we argue about that? But we are. And, you know, the contributions from the other side uh, through Senator Henderson, who I frankly expected uh, a more considered, more amenable contribution because uh, that has a public sort of persona and reputation that she's a fair-minded person. But to defend this stuff really, uh, you know, really intrigues me. To defend when their own policeman on the job, ASIC, found that it was nine times the, uh, nine times the value is completely mystifying. But I suppose that's politics and that's what keeps the place going round and round. But if we're going to make a difference in this space, I think we have to be completely innovative. And I, I'm probably a heretic on my side too. I don't accept that uh, people should be allowed to uh, you know, live a life on the, on the Centrelink payment. I think there should be some strong responsibilities to the community. And I know that if we took a more private equity approach to this space, where we became more adventurous and less risk averse, we would probably move a lot of people. We, we should move a lot of people. And we do know from the worldwide experience that small loans to particularly women with families uh, is a very successful way of creating empowerment, of creating better education opportunities and better outcomes financially because they are smart enough intrinsically and determined enough to feed their families and be successful. And it would be my, uh, my advice to any government that you do no interest loans, get people back to square, you fund that area, you get them back on the books, and then you look at the moving them through proper financial advice, through proper advice about education, proper advice about how to get into the job market, and you do that exponentially because it is no life on Centrelink. It isn't a life where you can take a trip away. You know, you're stuck in a repeating pattern of cycle of debt to pay or bills to pay, next contribution in. And they have fewer decisions in respect to the autonomy and the life that they should be able to lead because there's no funds to do it. So my contribution would be pass this bill and then get to work on making the whole thing better by taking a more private equity approach. Do some innovative projects in these place, places. Measure how many people you get back into education. Measure how many people you get back into work and work at reducing the whole taxpayer bill in this area. Because we can do it if we work collegiately and responsibly together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Chandler. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to address the Social Security Administration Amendment protecting consumers from predatory leasing practices, Bill 2020, which the government will not be supporting today. If passed, this bill would adversely impact Centrelink customers wanting to engage in a consumer lease and prevent them from using Centrepay as their preferred payment method. As my colleague Senator Henderson has outlined, Centrepay was introduced in 1999 as a bill-paying service to help Australians on income support to pay for housing and utilities costs. Centrepay helps welfare recipients manage their expenses for priority services and goods and reduces financial risk for clients by allowing for regular deductions made from their welfare payments. During 2019-2020, an average of 648,000 customers per month use the service to make deductions from their welfare payments to pay their bills. It is important to note that Centrepay can only be used for approved services and to approve businesses. Bill expenses range from accommodation, education and training expenses, health, household utility expenses, transport, legal services and household goods. The vast majority, or around 75 per cent, of the deductions made through Centrepay are for accommodation and utilities expenses. Since 2001, consumer leases for household goods have been allowed under Centrepay. Many Centrelink customers have limited access to microfinance, and the provision since 2001 gives them greater options to make essential household purchases. For example, if an essential household item, such <coughs> as a fridge or washing machine, breaks down, 
A Centrelink customer can use consumer leases to purchase a new appliance quickly and easily. The option is available for them to engage in a consumer lease if they so choose. The Centrelink customer has a choice as to whether they want to arrange for regular payments for the lease, including if they want to use Centrepay as a way of making payments on their purchase. Deductions from a customer's payment via Centrepay can cease at any time, although this does not cease any obligations under the consumer lease that they may have signed. The inclusion of consumer leases since 2001 has given consumers a viable option to purchase essential household goods when access to microfinance and money may be difficult to secure. There are 94,000 customers who are making use of Centrepay to manage the purchase of their goods using consumer leases. But as I have said, if passed, this bill that we are debating here today would impact those Centrelink customers who want to use consumer leases and who want to use Centrepay as their preferred payment method for such things. It is important to note, Madam Acting Deputy President, that a number of changes have been adopted since 2001 to better protect Centrelink customers using Centrepay. In 2015, new Centrepay policies and terms were introduced by the then Department of Human Services, excluding unregulated consumer leases for household goods and funeral insurance. In early 2017, all unregulated leases were removed from Centrepay. To help protect consumers and not unduly restrict their access to finance, Centrepay only allows consumer leases covered by the regulatory framework under the National Consumer Credit Protection Act 2009. The regulatory framework requires consumer lease businesses to be licensed and comply with responsible lending obligations overseen by the Australian Securities and Investment Commission, or ASIC. Businesses that use Centrepay need to comply and act in accordance with the Centrepay policy and terms and consumer protection laws. And as my colleague Senator Henderson said earlier, these are incredibly important safeguards for those Centrelink customers using Centrepay, contrary to what those on the opposition benches might have been contributing in debate this morning. Services Australia undertakes assessment of business applications for Centrepay and compliance audits of approved businesses. Again, another safeguard that is in place regarding this policy. Approved businesses must meet and maintain essential criteria and the assessment process may consider whether the business conducts its operations in a manner that is lawful, ethical and does not take unfair advantage of customers the past behaviour of the business and business representatives, information provided by regulatory bodies, consumers or consumer groups and law, enforce law enforcement agencies, previous dealings with the business and any complaints made against the business. Most identified non-compliance is remedied as part of the review process. If a business is unable to remedy the identified non-compliance concerns in addressing the criteria I've just outlined, they are either partially or fully suspended from the Centrepay program until they comply or until a decision is made by the agency to withdraw their Centrepay approval. Whilst businesses are required to meet the Centrepay policy in terms, they are also regulated through their industries legislation and relevant regulators such as ASIC and the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, or the ACCC, as it is usually known. The agency considers any non-compliance or active investigations with these, regulatory, with these regulatory bodies and, when notified, will review the business's ongoing approval. Where a business breaches Centrepay policies, including other laws and regulations, the agency will review the business and reconsider its ongoing approval for Centrepay. So again, Madam Acting Deputy President, some important safeguards that are in place to ensure that the businesses that Centrelink customers are dealing with under Centrepay are behaving appropriately and are not taking advantage of their customers. In conclusion, Madam Acting Deputy President, the government takes its responsibilities to consumers very seriously. But this bill, proposed by Labor today, would only reduce the payment options available to Centrelink customers to pay for household items. This would have an adverse impact on customers in times of emergency, where an essential item such as a fridge or a washing machine might need to be replaced as a matter of urgency. The option to engage in a consumer lease has given consumers a viable option to purchase essential household goods 
when access to microfinance and other financial st uh, money streams may be difficult to secure. The Centrelink customer has a choice as to whether they want to arrange for regular payments for the lease, including if they want to use Centrepay as a way of making payments on their purchase. As I said, Madam Acting Deputy President, in 2015, a new Centrepay policy and terms were introduced which excluded unregulated consumer leases. And to help protect customers and not unduly restrict their access to finance, Centrepay only allows consumer leases covered by the regulatory framework under the National Consumer Credit Protection Act 2009. The regulatory framework requires consumer lease businesses to be licensed and comply with responsible lending obligations overseen by ASIC. Service Australia, services rather, Australia undertakes assessment of business applications for Centrepay and compliance audits of approved businesses. Like I said, Madam Acting Deputy President, the government takes its responsibilities to consumers very seriously, none more so than in the space of Centrepay, where, as I have outlined today and as my colleague Senator Henderson has outlined and I suspect other colleagues will also detail, there is a strong framework of safeguards in place to ensure that consumers are not taken advantage of and to ensure that this, uh, this policy process operates in a fair and reasonable way. But this bill that we are debating here today, the Social Security Administration Amendment Protecting Consumers from Predatory Lending Practices Bill, would only reduce the payment options available to Centrelink customers to pay for household items. In effect, it removes choice, and that is something that we as Liberals should always be incredibly cognisant of and, I believe, should always seek to protect. So on that basis, Madam Acting Deputy President, I urge the Senate not to support the bill. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Antich. Acting Deputy President, um, I rise uh, to speak in relation to this bill uh, as well, the Social Security Administration Amendment Protecting Consumers from Predatory Lending Practices Bill of 2020. This is a bill that the government does not support. Now, the purpose of this bill as a private member's bill, as described in the explanatory memorandum, uh, is purported to be amending the Social Security Administration Act of 1999 to provide that the department secretary may not make any deductions requested by a person from their Social Security payments if those deductions relate to goods hired under a consumer lease entered into by the person. But if passed, the bill would impact Centrelink customers who want to use consumer leases and who want to, pay, to use centre pay as their preferred payment method. And, Madam Acting Deputy President, this bill, in my respectful submission, fits comfortably into the remit of the statement, uh, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, Centrepay is a free and voluntary service that allows people to pay their bills and expenses as regular deductions from their Centrelink payment to approved businesses. People can start, change or cancel their Centrepay deductions at any time. And, uh, as we've heard earlier this morning, it was introduced in 1999 effectively as a bill-paying service to support customers in paying household and utility costs. And As the deduction is taken out before the income support payment is made, the program is designed to reduce the default risk for the customers uh, as well as the businesses themselves. And It's unique in this respect compared to other financial products such as, for example, direct debit. And since this time, Centrepay has grown and expanded into more than just a means to pay a bill. In fact, in the last five years, 46 per cent of all Centrepay customers have used the service for more than one service reason, suggesting that it's actually being used as a financial management tool. Now, the categories of goods and services that are approved for Centrepay use uh, include, but are not necessarily limited to, accommodation, education and employment, health, um, utility costs, household goods, travel and transport costs, social and recreational, sometimes legal and professional services costs, and indeed the costs of financial products. And around 75 per cent of the monies dispersed through Centrepay are actually for accommodation and utilities. Payday lenders, um, short-term repayments and the type of schemes known as uh, 
buy now, pay later schemes are actually excluded from centre pay and have never had access to the scheme. And it's important to note that all consumer lease businesses, which are actually uh, accessing centre pay, uh, must have other payment options available, um, such as uh, cash or credit card. So those using centre pay are not forced to do so. It's actively used by government and non-government entities, such as state governments, for the purposes of matters uh, including court fine repayments and, and sometimes for not-for-profit so not for profit organisations offering low and no interest loans. Now we know that there are presently 94,000 customers or 14 per cent of customers who use Centrepay to manage the purchase of goods using consumer leases. And the value of Centrepay deductions for consumer leases actually represents 9 per cent of all of the deductions made by this scheme. Entering into any consumer lease um, and using centre pay to make payments due under a consumer lease are, as we've said, voluntary. Deductions from the customer's payment can cease at any time, although this doesn't necessarily cease uh, obligations pursuant to, to the consumer lease itself. Um, customers must provide informed consent before a deduction arrangement using centre pay can actually be put in place. To help customers be protected and not unduly restrict access to their finance, Centrepay only allows consumer leases which are covered by the regulatory framework, framework under the National Consumer Credit Protection Act of 2009 and requires consumer lease businesses to be properly licensed and to properly comply with responsible lending obligations as overseen by the regulatory body um, ASIC, the Australian Securities and Investment Commission. And the history of accessing consumer leases is now actually 20 years old. And since 2001, consumer leases for household goods have been allowed. On 1 July 2015, the then Department of Human Services introduced a new centre pay policy in terms which excluded unregulated consumer leases for household goods and funeral insurance. Now, unregulated leases are those which are exempt from the National Consumer Credit Protection Act and are less than four months or indefinite in duration. But by 17 February 2017, all leases not regulated were removed from the scheme. Due to the gap in accessibility for some consumers to access microfinance and money for emergencies, regulated consumer leases now uh, remain on centre pay as a viable option to acquire household goods. So the government takes its responsibility to consumers very, very seriously. And while Labor will tell you this bill helps protect consumers and that it ensures low-income, vulnerable Australians are not exploited, they seem to have missed the crucial outcome of this bill if it were to be passed. That being that this bill would allow for discrimination against people who are currently on Centrelink, individuals who may not otherwise have access to payment terms because of this predicament, or lower income people who have maybe have a low, uh, uh, have a lack of credit rating or a low credit rating. So I remind this chamber that unfortunately many uh, of those who are recipients of welfare may actually be unable to access some forms of credit such as credit cards. And for many, regulated consumer leasing is one of the very, very few ways of obtaining essential household goods and, and in obtaining them in an expedient manner. Often we're talking about very basic, very fundamental items like a fridge or a washing machine or a freezer or something of that nature. And any bill that would seek to discriminate and result in the unfair uh, and to the detriment of those in our society who are mostly in need purely because of their financial predicament shouldn't be supported. Labor argues in support of the bill by alleging that centre pay is being used for the benefit of consumer lease, lease or commercial contracts rather than the interests of Service Australia customers. But this, of course, ignores the careful scrutiny of businesses taking part in the centre pay program. Now, Services Australia undertakes an assessment of business applications for centre pay and compliance audits of approved businesses. Approved businesses have to meet and maintain um, essential criteria and the assessment process may in fact consider items such as whether the business 
conducts its operations in a manner uh, that is lawful, that is ethical, and does not take advantage of customers. They must take into con consideration the past behaviour of the business and the business's representatives. They have to take into account information provided by regulatory bodies, consumers or consumer groups, or law enforcement agencies, and they have to take into account previous dealings with the business and any complaints that have been made against the business. So this process is beyond rigorous. In the 2019-20 financial year, 326 compliance audits were completed, and most identified non-compliance is actually remedied as part of the review process. And if a business is unable to remedy the identified non-compliance concerns, they are either partially or fully suspended from the program. And they are fully suspended from the program until a point in which they comply or a decision is made by the agency to withdraw their approval. And whilst businesses are required to meet the policy and the terms, they're also regulated through the industry's legislation and re relevant regulators such as ASIC or the ACCC. These agencies will consider any non-compliance or active investigations with these regulatory bodies. And when notified, they'll review the business's ongoing approval. And where a business breaches centre pay policy, including other laws and regulations, the agency reviews the business and, as I've said earlier, um, reconsiders its ongoing approval for centre pay. The policy terms and conditions of centre pay retain the discretion for Services Australia not to approve or to suspend or to withdraw approval of a business if, in its opinion, uh, the business or its representatives have not con conducted or are not likely to conduct its operations uh, in a lawful manner, if they have conducted or may potentially conduct their operations uh, in a manner that is unethical or inconsistent with the objectives or takes unfair advantage of customers. Um, they may do so if the business fails to or is unlikely to fully comply with Centipay's framework or where making payments to the business through Centipay would adversely affect the reputation of the agency or the Australian government. Uh, they may um, do so if, uh, if they're under investigation by a regulatory body or a law enforcement agency or if they've had enforcement proceedings brought against them. So there are a range of um, different um, approaches uh, and matters to be taken into account by Service Australia. The process is clearly extraordinarily rigorous. Services Australia will refer customers to programs uh, in this event such as uh, the NILS scheme, the No Interest Loan Scheme, or in fact to set up, as well as other payment options uh, to purchase items. And Services Australia staff also refer customers to the relevant support services for financial assistance and counselling. Now, I remind um, those in this place that entering any consumer lease arrangement is, as we have said and as some of my colleagues have said earlier today, a voluntary matter. And it wouldn't be for government to interfere unduly with one's personal choice, and to do so would not be fitting of a society like ours. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, there can be little doubt that Centre Pay is and has a proven track record of being uh, a valuable bill-paying service that assists many Centrelink recipients with their ongoing expenses and their ongoing financial management. Uh, and as a government, it's uh, our um, view that we should aim to have as little interference in people's lives uh, as possible. Services Australia has provided targeted messages to centre pay businesses to remind them of their obligations under this scheme. They remind customers to check their centre pay deductions regularly, uh, particularly when there may not be a service uh, at the moment to provide links to manage your money, uh, which provides useful tools and information. Um, and in addition to this, centre pay um, services Australia operates the financial information service or FIS, which uh, is there to help Australians make informed decisions about their finances. And the FIS um, or the Financial Information Services Scheme helps people um, to understand a range of implications, including um, understanding how financial products work, how they affect government payments. It helps them to understand uh, the results of their decisions in the short term, the results of their decisions in the longer term, to prepare for their retirement, 
uh, even while they're still working, which of course we know is uh, critical, uh, to access other resources uh, and to access the details of um, other groups that can assist. So, in conclusion, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, it is my view, it's the government's view, that the centre pay scheme maintains, um, it must maintain its core features, including the voluntary nature of the program, uh, the issue of consumer consent, and the strong focus, focus on essential items and the need for essential items in a timely manner in, in uh, low-income households, such as uh, utilities, essential household goods, as I've said earlier, and white goods. And for these reasons, Madam Acting Deputy President, and more, the government does not support this bill. Thank you, Senator Antich. Senator Roberts, with Thank my you, apologies Madam. too for departing from the um, planned list. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to discuss this bill that aims to put a stop to some predatory lenders. Now, it's a topic new to me, and I'm not familiar with it. And on the, on the surface, it seems a laudable aim to protect people on, dis, on disability or with cognitive impairment or otherwise disadvantaged. I feel disappointed and sad with predators who lend taking advantage of vulnerable people. It doesn't meet my needs for integrity, for fairness or for compassion. Yet while we support the intent of this bill, we do not support the solution. Our office called Senator McAllister's office. Apparently there's been no research regarding the number of predatory lenders, and apparently it's based on an unsighted ASIC report some years ago lacking data. Now this bill, as other speakers have pointed out, would stop all arrangements in a way that some worthy and capable people may miss out altogether on necessary goods such as fridges. This bill would therefore disadvantage in this way the people it's designed to protect unless there's a better solution in place. High-risk borrowers, people on low income, disadvantaged, mean high risk to lenders. That means high interest rates. In fact, these lenders may be the only alternative some people have. And this bill impinges on a person's right to make the arrangements. There are some lenders in these circumstances who are decent people. There are other alternatives to funding, and these need to be understood. In short, this bill is too blunt an instrument. We believe that the issue that this bill attempts to address needs to be addressed through the Treasury, through consumer law. And we're expecting that the responsible lending law that the government has circulated in draft form will address this in a better way for all Australians, not just those on Centrelink. So we won't be supporting this bill, and we look forward to the government addressing this through the Treasury with a, a proper bill based on consumer protection. Uh, thank you, Senator Robert. Senator Stoker. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak in relation to this bill that has been put forward by um, Senator McAllister and her team. And the purpose of their bill, as is stated, is to amend the Social Security Act to prevent centre pay deductions from being made in relation to consumer leases. Now, for those people in the gallery who may not be familiar, um, consumer leases don't relate to property in the, in the real sense. It's not about your house or your apartment, um, but it's about when you take out a lease to get yourself a refrigerator or a washing machine, um, the kinds of appliances that can be really important for people's lives going to plan. Uh, but they relate to generally smaller sums than the kinds of leases that we associate with real property. Now, the government doesn't support this bill, and I would suggest, Madam Acting Deputy President, with good reason. It brings into sharp focus the approaches of different parties to some really fundamental issues. We have, on the one hand, some people in our community who can be vulnerable and who, by reason of their um, being a recipient of Centrelink payments rather than um, somebody who is in work, can face some real challenges meeting all of the expenses they might um, have or, or wish to incur in their lives. Um, on the other hand, however, 
we face the important value that is the right of individuals to choose what they do with their money and the right of them to do so without governments telling them what they are and aren't entitled to spend their money on. And they are entitled to the opportunity to learn from um, participation and from experience how and whether they wish to interact with all of the different types of items for sale, all the different types of products um, in the financial space that are available to them. And so when we think of financial literacy as being one of the real problems um, that people who find themselves in something of a, um, a cycle of hardship, financial literacy is a real, really big part of both the problem and the way out. One's more likely to end up in circumstances where they need assistance um, if they have lower financial literacy. But at the same time, if we take away the rights of all of those individuals to make choices about what they want to do with their money, then they are denied the opportunity to build their financial literacy by gradual experience. And so we need to make sure that the way that we handle this area of law takes into account the need to balance the risk that a person might be exploited by an unscrupulous provider against the really important value that a person should be able to choose and should be able to learn by participation. They're both really important things. And so this government has done what I would suggest is a good job of balancing out those considerations. And so rather than taking away the ability of people to engage in leases or enter into different financial products that might suit their individual needs, despite the fact that they're in receipt of social security assistance, we have instead taken the step of conducting a detailed review from 2013-2015 into the way that these um, types of products are offered um, and assisted in their delivery uh, by payment using the centre pay service. And in doing so, it was this government, importantly for the record, not those opposite who did nothing about it when they were in government, but it was this government that knocked off hundreds and hundreds of loan shark-like businesses that were indeed unscrupulous in the way they operated in this field. Um, one example that um, I was quite confronted to see was that some of the unscrupulous vendors who um, have since been pushed out of this system, they are no longer able to participate since 2015, um, they would go into Aboriginal communities and sell insurance products, for instance, funeral insurance to 10-year-old kids. And you know, that, that isn't fair, it isn't sensible, and it's not the kind of thing that meets what I would suggest is our sense of right and wrong. The consequence of that, that review and that process, which I understand was led by both um, now Minister Payne and now Minister Robert, was that over a thousand providers that were at that time registered to deliver um, services that were paid for through centre pay were kicked out of the system. And I think that says something about the rigour that has been applied to this sector. So it's worth turning our minds to this. What exactly is centre pay? Because um, for those people who haven't had the experience of being in receipt of social security benefits, they may not have come into contact with it. But for those listening from home, centre pay is a free service. It is offered as a part of the, the suite of tools that is offered by the Department of uh, then Human Services, now Services Australia, to help people who are in receipt of a welfare benefit to um, manage their money as they grow that financial literacy. And the way that it works is that it allows a person to set up a whole series of direct debits if they wish. They can use it as many or as few times as they want to. And 
it means that they can set it up so that bills, utilities, rent and the like come out of their Centrelink payment and then the residue that remains once all of those important and core expenses of life are taken care of is deposited into the bank account for use. It was created in 1999 and in the last five years it was used at some point by 46 per cent of all people who are Centrelink customers. And that, that speaks to something of the need and it speaks to its usefulness as people are going through um, a phase in their lives where they are um, getting hold of their financial situation and doing what they can to build financial literacy. It means that for those people who use it, all of the essentials of life can be covered before the remainder of the payment is deposited into their account. And it's really important for making sure that a person in receipt of Social Security benefits is able to manage their household budget well. Now, the categories of goods and services that are covered by it are quite broad. It can cover accommodation, education and employment, health services, utilities, household goods, travel and transport, even some social and recreational type activities, legal and professional services in um, some circumstances, and a range of financial products. And in the financial year just gone, there was an average of 648,000 customers a month who used the service, and they used it to make 26 million centre pay deductions worth over $2.76 billion to approximately 14,000 approved businesses. So you can see that it is really quite a widely used service. Um, <coughs> pardon me. That's important in the lives of many Australians. Now, we're coming up to Christmas, and I think it's worth acknowledging that for people who are on Social Security benefits, um, it can be a time that is tough to manage your money. Um, and controlling and staying on top of managing your income in circumstances where you've got dependents too can be really difficult. But centre pay gives control back to people so that they never miss the fundamentals, they never miss paying rent, they never lose the roof over their heads. Um, and it is the kind of responsible approach to managing money that this government tries to bring to everything. Um, we want to empower people who are in receipt of government assistance. And of course, we hope that that will be short-lived. We hope that people will be able to um, make their transition back into work as soon as possible, as soon as um, their life circumstances and the, and the job market permits for them. But we take the approach that it is important to empower people as individuals to make the best possible choices for their own future. Because, Madam Acting Deputy President, what is the best choice for you to do with your money might be well different to what is right for me or indeed right for every other Australian. We'll all have different priorities and different values, different things we want to achieve. And it would be really quite arrogant for any government to think that they know and they should decide what a person is allowed to do with their money. But instead, this voluntary free service helps people manage <clears throat> the pressure of their competing priorities so that the fundamentals, the rent gets paid, the lights stay on, that all can happen, but they're also able to make some choices um, for themselves about what they want to do with the rest of their money. The success of centre pay is really about the fact that it's so voluntary. So when we strengthen the help that's available for individuals who are receiving government assistance, who are developing their financial literacy. Um, we are also on the other side strengthening the help that's available to them by making sure that this system is only able to be accessed by those who participate according to clear and defined rules of the game, which means that those suppliers who receive payments through centre pay have to comply with quite rigorous standards of auditing. They have to sign up to a code about how they um, interact with and treat the people um, from whom they are receiving payments through Centrepay. 
and importantly, they have to work with them to hear on a regular basis how they can continually deliver better outcomes for customers. So this is really a program of consumer consent with a focus on the basics. And it's entirely consistent with that, that a person who finds themselves in a situation where um, one of the basics they need to operate is on the blink, whether that's a washing machine that they must have as a matter of urgency to get the kids' school uniforms clean and get them getting on with their education, for instance, is able to make decisions for themselves about what works best. Now, some people will be able to just go down to Harvey Normans and pick up a new machine, but that's not the case for everyone. And for someone who can't access microfinance, for instance, that's um, part of one of the really low or no interest programs that already exist, the existence of consumer leases can be a really important resource. And provided it's done within the bounds of ethics, um, as this government has sought to make sure is the case by all of the different types of registered leases that are available, um, regulated, I should say, not registered, the regulated leases that are available, um, they get the balance right between giving people choice and making sure they're not exploited. And for who are we as a parliament to tell the mother who needs to get uniforms washed for their kids for school so that they can participate in their education for the coming week that no, they can't go down um, and get themselves a washing machine on a plan? Um, now this isn't a buy now, pay later arrangement. This is the rental of an item. Um, but it can be just what's needed to fill a hole in. Um, a person's um, laundry, shall we say, but also to help them get through a hole in their budget for the short term. Um, and that is only right. Of course, when a company who is a participant in the centre pay scheme is found to do the wrong thing, this government steps in and they boot them off it until they fix whatever it is that's causing problems. The regulatory framework means these types of businesses have to be licensed. They have to comply with responsible lending obligations. They are overseen by a regulator. And this isn't a service that's offered to um, cash lenders, pawnbrokers, or buy now, pay later schemes. This is really an important part of the services that are available to people who are in receipt of government assistance. And using centre pay to help them get on top of their expenses is um, not only a sensible thing, but it is the right thing to do as we, to bring it back to where I began, Madam Acting Deputy President, President balance their need to be protected from vulnerability with their need to develop um, the skills they need in financial literacy through participation and experience in the market as the capable individuals they are. Thank you, Senator Stoker. The question is that this bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. And do we then have amendments? Do we know? Are you back for amendments? No, ah, Jackie, do we have amendments?
Thank you. Oh, did Stop the bells. The question is the bill be read a second time. The eyes will pass to the sorry, is this a second time? The question is the bills be read a second time. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Billick, tell if the eyes, Senator Dean Smith, tell if the nose. The result of the division is eyes 34, nose 33. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk.
a bill for an act to amend the Social Security Administration Act 1999 and for related purposes. Now, as no amendments have been circulated to this bill, unless a senator requests a committee stage, I, should, I will progress to calling on the mover of the bill to move the third reading. I wasn't here for this session, so I don't know who moved the bill. Oh, Senator McAllister, you can do it from you can do it from any seat. Yes, you. Well, I need someone. If no one wants a committee stage to move the bill be read a third time. Uh, I move that the bill be read a third time. Sorry, Senator Senator Smith. Uh, President, um, I think there might have been an error in the pairing. Uh, Senator Urquhart or Senator Polly might be able to um, ask that the vote be recommitted. So, so I, I need a, so I just need a, I understand practice is that I just need a reason to state a reason and then I can seek leave of the Senate to put a division again given it was a second reading order senator order senator does one of the whips want to make a contribution so I can or so I can then seek leave of the Senate to recommit the vote I just I understand this is common practice. Senator Billick. Or Senator Sorry, Jackie. Uh, Mr. President, if we could, can we recommit the bill? The okay, vote? so I've got consent from both whips to recommit the vote. With the leave of the Senate, I'll put the motion again on the voices. The question is the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The noes have it. The noes have it. I have received a message from the House of Representatives returning the Australia's Foreign Relations, State and Territory Arrangements Consequential Amendments Bill 2020, informing the Senate that the House has disagreed to the amendment made by the Senate. Senator Payne. And I move that the consideration of the message in committee of the whole be made an order of the day for the next day of sitting. Question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Government business order for day number one. Recycling and waste reduction bill 2020 and four related bills. Resumption of second reading debate. Senator Roberts in continuation. Thank you, Mr President. This bill is a massive opportunity. In summary, this bill is a massive okay. opportunity for free enterprise to fix an unprecedented byproduct of human progress. I urge the CSIRO to work with industry to produce biodegradable and compostable plastics that allow Australians to simply switch from environmentally damaging materials to environmentally friendly materials. The Recycling and Waste Reduction Bill 2020 is a win for the environment, a win for Australia and a win for the countries we have been dumping our rubbish into. The extent of this win depends on the response from the CSIRO and from industry. I'd like to take this opportunity to address the fact that the environment can be an opportunity, a huge opportunity, for high pro productivity and for a competitive advantage. Let's consider the evolution, for example, of management attitudes in business and society's attitudes to safety, quality and the environment. One has followed the other. Safety initially was seen as a cost, a burden. But incidents, whether they injure people or not or just simply near misses, are waste. Removing that waste, removing incidents, near misses, improves productivity and profit. And this has driven me in my career in management. Improving safety reduces costs, improves productivity and improves profit. That's now accepted, although not widely, public, not widely followed still. Secondly, quality. Quality was seen initially as a cost. High quality came with extra cost. And yet the Japanese miracle in manufacturing in the 70s and 80s turned that around because the Japanese understood that defects are waste. Removing those defects improved quality, reduced costs, improved productivity, improved profit. This has driven my work in improving processes at work, in workplaces and in leadership processes. So quality is now understood to lead to lower costs. 
And that is why we now have the lowest cost producers in the world in, in manufactured goods have the highest quality. The same cannot yet be said for environment. Environmental issues are still sadly seen quite often as a cost. Yet looking after the environment removes waste and improves productivity and profit. Real environmental problems, like real pollution of air, water and soil, add to cost. Take an example of, some, of a removal of pollution. Car exhaust pollution in California, for example, is now one thousandth what it was compared with the 70s. That has led to increased, use, increased efficiency in the use of fuel, lower pollution, lower cost for motorists, lower cost for producers, lower cost for the cities of, of California. Yet today, there are still too many fabricated problems, environmental problems, non-problems, cloaked as supposedly as environmental issues. Making up environmental problems is physically and morally reprehensible. It hurts people. It adds needless costs that the poor pay disproportionately. For example, labelling carbon dioxide as a pollutant is dishonest and contradicts science and nature. Car pollution consists of nitrous oxides, sulphur oxides and particulates. These were cleaned up in California, cleaned up in our country. Now we have carbon dioxide fabricated as a pollutant and that is dishonest and contradicts science and nature. Carbon dioxide is nature's trace atmospheric gas essential to all life on this planet. It cannot be a pollutant. We cannot affect the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. The empirical evidence shows that. It is not a pollutant. So I call on the government to do its work on hydrocarbon fuels and to understand natural climate variability and how it has been fabricated dishonestly by the Greens and others into climate change due to human activity when that is false. This distracts from real and serious environmental problems. So while I compliment the government for its work on plastics and removing plastics from the pollution stream, we need to buck up when it comes to carbon dioxide. Claiming carbon dioxide is a pollutant leads to needlessly high electricity prices. Alan Moran, the noted and reputable economist, said, calculates using the government's own data that it adds $13 billion a year to the cost of electricity in additional costs. It adds $1,300 to the cost of electricity in addition to the uh, uh, typical household and 2.3 jobs are lost for every so-called green job it cre that are created by the subsidies. This is hurting the poor. It is, and then we also have, as a result of this climate change nonsense, stealing of property rights from farmers. That increases food costs, which hurts, which hurts the poor. This is hurting the poor. This climate scam is anti-human. It increases costs needlessly and disproportionately to the poor and those who cannot afford it. It increases waste right through our society. It decreases productivity. It, incre it decreases wealth. When, in, when, the, when ideology is wrapped as an environmental issue, as it is with the climate scam, then everyone suffers, particularly when the real aim of this climate scam is simply to control people. Everyone hurts. We need to get back to real and serious environmental issues. This climate scam is distracting us, our money, our time, our attention, our interest, our energy and our effort from real and serious environmental issues. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Um Minister. Oh, there you are. Sorry, I'm sorry. To ask you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Madam, uh, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Recycling and Waste Reduction Bill 2020 and associated bills, which were introduced to the House of Representatives on the 27th of August this year. The aim of this bill is to regulate the export of waste materials in line with the Council of Australia Government's COAG's commitment to ban the export of waste plastic, paper, glass and tyres earlier this year. Only those products that have been processed into a value-added material and that will be reused or remanufactured overseas will be permitted for export. The bill will also manage the environmental, health and safety impacts of products, in particular the impacts associated with the disposal of waste products, and provide for voluntary, co-regulatory and mandatory product stewardship schemes. Planet Arc research shows 51 per cent of Australia's household waste is recycled, which is on par with recycling rates in many northern European countries. 
Even better, Australia has been a world leader in newspaper recycling for years, but we have a way to go with electronic waste recycling. E-waste is increasing at three times the rate of other waste in Australia, with voluntary industry programs like cartridges for Planet Arc and Mobile Muster providing recycling options for many years now. But we've been slow to provide recycling services for televisions, computers and batteries. This bill means we'll be slow no more. COAG's commitment to ban the export of certain waste materials was target one of the National Waste Policy Action Plan 2019. This plan was developed to drive change within industry, businesses, governments and the community to turn waste into a reusable commodity. The strategy to phase out exports of waste plastic, paper, glass and tyres was released in March this year and sets out both the challenges and opportunities presented by the ban and the longer term changes ahead for Australia's waste and recycling sector. The ban on exports of waste products starts with waste glass from 1 January 2021, followed by mixed plastics from 1 July 2021, whole used tyres from 1 December 2021 single resin or polymer plastics from 1 July 2022 and mixed or unsorted paper and cardboard from 1 July 2024. This bill encourages a circular economy for Australia's waste through the enhancement of voluntary product stewardship. Such an economy will support businesses to realise the full value of recyclable materials as a sustainable resource with full consideration of the product's entire life cycle. The bill replaces the framework contained within the Product Stewardship Act 2011. This Act will be repealed by the Recycling and Waste Reduction Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2020. Earlier this year, I visited the Dolverton Waste Management Facility at La Trobe in Tasmania's northwest. This facility is already following the recycling and reuse ideals we are aiming for in passing this bill. Dolverton provides sustainable landfill and organics recycling services for more than 80 commercial, industrial and government clients across Tasmania. It was constructed in 1995 at a former clay quarry site under the joint authority of four northwest councils, the Central Coast, Devonport City, Kentish and La Trobe councils. Around 40 per cent of the waste volume at the Dolverton Waste Management Facility is organic, which is then recycled into nutrient-rich compost used by Tasmanian nurseries, landscapers, public land managers, vineyards, flower and berry growers, orchids and dairy farmers. This recycled compost product stimulates plant growth, increases soil microbial, microbial life, unlocks soil nutrients for plants, improves soil salinity and sedicity, the amount of soil held in soil, and increases the soil's water holding capacity. Dolverton also collaborates with waste management groups throughout the state and works with businesses and industry bodies to raise awareness of waste avoidance and recycling best practices. The Australian government has made targeted investments to build a stronger Australian recycling industry and create more jobs as a result of these waste management reforms. A number of complementary measures have been introduced to support the objectives of this bill, and they include $190 million for a new recycling modernisation fund. This fund will leverage $600 million of recycling infrastructure reinvestment, creating more than 10,000 jobs and divert more than 10 million tonnes of waste from landfill to make useful products when combined with activity from the National Waste Policy Action Plan. Madam Deputy President, and despite comments made by those on the other side in earlier contributions, I'm very pleased to advise the Senate that an $11 million joint recycling agreement between the Australian and Tasmanian governments was announced in Launceston recently. This landmark agreement, signed by Federal Minister for the Environment, Susan Lee, and Tasmania's Minister for Environment and Parks, Roger Yench, will deliver a $16 million boost for the state's recycling industry, creating jobs and reducing pressure on the environment. This partnership is part of the Australian Government's $190 million Recycling Modernisation Fund and will leverage a further $5.5 million from Tasmanian industry via matched investment from businesses who will turn the high quality recycled material into new products. Other complementary measures supporting the bill's objectives include $20 million for the National Product Stewardship Investment Fund to grow new and existing schemes. This will this will contribute to meeting our national target of recovering 80 per cent of our waste resources by 2030. 
$35 million to implement Commonwealth commitments under Australia's National Waste Policy Action Plan. This sets the direction for waste management policy and recycling in Australia until 2030. $24.6 million for Commonwealth commitments to improve our national waste data so it can measure recycling outcomes and track progress against our national waste targets. $20 million through a special round of the Cooperative Research Centre's projects to find new and innovative solutions to plastic recycling and waste, including new ways of incorporating recycled plastics in manufacturing and construction. Strengthening the Commonwealth procurement guidelines to enable any procurement undertaken by a Commonwealth agency to consider environmental sustainability and the use of recycled content when determining value for money. By using our purchasing power, we can generate demand and encourage innovation. And also working with the states and territories to develop national standards and specifications for the use of recycled content in a broad range of capital works projects. We want to stop exporting untreated and unprocessed waste that is likely to have a negative impact on the environment or harm human health in the country that receives this waste. Our waste management and recycling sector will collect, recover, recycle, reuse and convert waste into new products as a result. Through better product design, manufacture, distribution and use, we will all take greater responsibility for environmental impacts. Australia is not only taking responsibility for its waste, but it is ensuring this waste is managed effectively and transformed into a resource we can use again and again. We've turned the tables on the thought that waste is just an environmental product problem that needs to be solved, instead seeing it as an economic opportunity to design, manufacture and create new products and foster new industries. Reforming our practices around unprocessed waste products will lead to a fundamental change in attitude that will positively affect our bottom line. Waste management and recycling practices that stem from this bill are expected to add $3.6 billion to the Australian economy's turnover and generate $1.5 billion in economic activity over the next 20 years. In addition to ensuring we are recycling and reusing our waste products, the bill will set out obligations for manufacturers, importers and distributors in relation to those products. This legislation also sets out accreditation arrangements for voluntary product stewardship, which will help Australian consumers understand the impact of certain products so they can make better choices when purchasing and disposing of products. Recycling and reusing products is something Australians care deeply about. We only need to look at the uptake of local government curbside recycling programs, the popularity of bottle recycling schemes and the number of people who spend their weekends combing through tip shops and travelling between garage sales to find products they can upcycle for their homes or resell at market stalls and in shops to understand this. People spend time sorting and separating their recyclable paper, glass and plastic packaging to put into their recycling bins or taking products to their local waste collection facilities. And they want to know these products are going to be repurposed effectively, not dumped in an ever-growing landfill facility or sent overseas. The export bans outlined in the bill are our way of ensuring these products will be reused productively. Recycling benefits our planet, our economy and ourselves. Reusing products decreases the amount of raw materials needed and the manufacture of new products from recycled materials uses less energy. Recycling creates more jobs than landfill does and new industries created through reuse boosts the economy. We are taking responsibility for our waste by regulating the way products are used from initial design and manufacture through to reuse or recycling into a different product. This commitment will expand the capacity of our industries, as well as open opportunities for new product ideas, new technologies and new markets for these products. It ensures our resources will be used in sustainable ways for future generations. I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Askew. Senator Faruqi. I'll oh, beg your pardon, Senator Henderson. I didn't see you there, um, Senator Henderson. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. It is a pleasure to speak on one of the most important issues currently facing our nation, protecting our environment for today, for tomorrow and into the future for generation after generation. A key part of this commitment is to stop the waste. 
That is key to our protection of the environment, on the land, in the air, along our coastlines and in our precious oceans. The Morrison government is committed to bringing to an end the 645,000 tonnes of unprocessed plastic, paper, glass and tyres which Australia ships annually overseas. The Recycling and Waste Reduction Bill 2020 will provide a vital phased approach to ensure this becomes a reality. As the Prime Minister said so succinctly, it is our waste, it is our responsibility. Madam Deputy President, I am incredibly proud of the many ways in which the Morrison government is, protected, is committed to protecting our environment. Whether it's meeting and beating our climate targets or supporting local environmental community initiatives, this is a government which takes the practical environmental actions which are required. By way of example, the government released the quarterly update of Australia's National Greenhouse Gas Inventory June 2020, just a very short time ago. The quarterly update confirms Australia has beaten its 2020 target, the target period being 2013 to 2020, by 459 million tonnes in lower emissions, including an overachievement from the previous record being between 2008 and 2012. This is an increase on the previous estimate of 400 million Eleven ton, 411 million tonnes are published in December 2019. Australia's overachievement on its 2020 target is due in large part to significant structural declines in emissions from the electricity and agricultural sectors. In 2019-20, emissions in the national electricity market which is Australia's largest electricity grid, fell 5.3 per cent to a new record low. Of course, this has also been driven very substantially by Australia's incredible investment in renewable energy, some $30 billion since 2017, as we continue to deploy new solar and wind at a rate of 10 times faster than the global average. Recent advice from the Clean Energy Regulator is that this trend is expected to continue in the coming years. So this is evidence of real action by a government with practical, real solutions. Labor, in contrast, remains committed to its reckless targets, and we have seen in recent weeks the internal war within the Labor Party over climate uh, and over energy policy. Uh, Labor is all at sea. Independent modelling by BAE Economics shows Labor's 45 per cent emissions reduction target and its 50 per cent renewable energy target would drive up wholesale power prices by 58 per cent, would cost the economy $472 billion, would reduce real wages by $9,000 per household and slash 336,000 jobs. And at least there are some in Labor which have worked this out and worked out the reckless policies which Labor, of course, took to the last election and which was soundly defeated. Yet it is very concerning that much of Labor's true thinking was revealed by its Environment Action Network, which said that high prices are not a market failure. They are proof of the market working well. Importantly, the Morrison government's approach with this bill before us today harnesses a cooperative approach with business, other levels of government, along with the community and individuals. As Minister Susan Lee said in her second reading speech, this bill implements the agreement by all of Australia's governments to ban the export of waste, plastic,
paper, glass and tyres. It also incorporates the framework of the existing Product Stewardship Act 2011. It includes improvements to better regulate and encourage our businesses, those which design, manufacture, distribute and use products, to take greater responsibility for their environmental impacts. And that's a key point. Governments can do so much, but in order for us to reduce our waste, in order for us to embrace the circular economy, we have to do this together with every single business which creates waste and with every single family in every household across Australia. And this bill is a very important part of our very significant efforts to transform the nation's waste and recycling sector. It says that we have to take responsibility for what we produce. And the more we can recycle, the less that goes into landfill, the better we are now and into the future. The Commonwealth's 2018 National Waste Policy identifies five overarching circular economy waste principles, which are firstly to avoid waste, and that is by prioritising waste avoidance, encouraging efficient use, reuse and repair, uh, designing products so waste is minimised so that they are made to last and so that we can more easily recover materials from products which are produced. A second important principle is to improve resource recovery. That is to improve material collection systems and processes for recycling and also improve the quality of recycled material we produce. The third principle is to increase the use of recycled material and build demand and markets for recycled products. One person's rubbish is another person's um, treasure. Very important principle in that ability for us to see as so much of what we produce being recycled throughout our economy. The fourth principle is the better management of material flows to benefit human health, the environment and the economy. And the um, fifth principle is to improve information to support innovation, guide investment and enable informed consumer decisions. All of these principles make good environmental sense and they are key to tackling the problem before us today. Our government, led by Prime Minister Morrison, is to be congratulated for its unwavering commitment to pursuing better environmental outcomes for all Australians. The export ban will be phased in, starting with glass, on the 1st of January 2021, and then including mixed plastics, whole-use tyres, single resin or polymer plastic plastics, culminating on the 1st of July 2024, when mixed and unsorted paper and cardboard will be included in the export ban. The export ban would only apply to unprocessed waste, which allows for the processing of waste materials within Australia for subsequent export and use in overseas manufacturing. Uh, Minister Lee has made it very clear that this offers an economic opportunity for Australia, saying the waste export ban is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to transform our waste management and recycling se sector to collect, recycle, reuse and convert waste into a resource, a resource we can continue to use as a nation over and over. These reforms are expected to see the Australian economy turn over an additional $3.6 billion and potentially generate $1.5 billion in additional economic activity over the next 20 years. So this is a big win for both the environment and our economy. Of course, we recognise that if action is not taken, scientists estimate that in 30 years' time, the weight of plastics in our oceans will exceed the weight of the fish in the ocean. And that's a pretty horrifying thought. And I know where I live in southwest Victoria, including in the wonderful electorate of Karangamite, 
that is a very important priority. We want to make sure that our oceans are as clean as they possibly can be, and there is a really strong and important focus on reducing plastic in our oceans in communities where I live uh, throughout the Karangamite electorate, a magnificent part of the world as we know. Australians create around 67 million tonnes of waste each year. We want to see less waste going to landfill and ending up in oceans and more being reused and recycled. We are building Australia's domestic recycling capability through our $167 million Australian recycling investment plan. This plan will increase Australia's recycling rates, tackle plastic waste and litter, accelerate work on a new battery recycling scheme and halve food waste by 2030. And I'm also very pleased that microbeads are being rapidly phased out. 94% of cosmetic and personal care products in Australia are already microbead free. National environmental initiatives are vital, but so are local environmental initiatives. And Madam Deputy President, I was very pleased recently to join with the Karangamite Catchment Authority to announce uh, some very important local environmental programs uh, for South West Victoria, uh, including the $6 million Wild Outwage Initiative, which includes a $1 million Community Environmental Grants Program, and that's been, of course, steered through Minister Lee's office. And that is a wonderful opportunity for local environment groups to make an application um, for funding to support a local environmental project, whether it be programs to improve weed and um, pest animal control, fencing and access track construction, or other improvement works and wildlife habitat improvement works. So, uh, for those who are reading this Hansard or listening to this debate I, and are interested in protecting our environment, uh, I would absolutely commend this local project, which is as a result of the Morrison government's commitment to our local environment. And of course, that was a commitment made before the last federal election. It was not matched by Labor, I note, which was pretty disappointing. These grants will provide um, an amount of funding between 50,000, 5,000, 50,000 per year for up to two years for each project. So they are very substantial local grants and are a really good example of how local initiatives do matter. This recycling and waste reduction bill represents an effective, cooperative government, business, community approach to protecting our environment. I'm very pleased that the private sector has shown a willingness to be part of the solution. At Australia's first National Plastic Summit, hosted by this government in March, uh, we saw a number of very major pledges from leading companies, including the PAC Group, Nestle, McDonald's, Coca-Cola and Coles, all of which, of course, produce an enormous amount of waste. And it is important and obviously very important that we see that sort of commitment from our large businesses and companies around Australia. So to every business, large and small, please have a look at what we are doing in terms of supporting waste reduction, recycling and the circular economy. We are absolutely determined as a government to protect Australia's precious environment, to reduce waste, to embrace our circular economy and our commitment in this bill is another example of our commitment to the environment, and I commend this bill to the Senate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Henderson. Senator Rice. Thanks, Deputy President. I rise to speak on the recycling and waste reduction bill, and I want to particularly acknowledge the work that my colleague, Senator Wish Wilson, has done, both through his extensive advocacy on this issue, his work um, in multiple inquiries on waste and the detailed amendments that he has circulated and he has been negotiating um, across the, the parliament um, with regards to this bill. Um, Senator Wish-Wilson has been on the case of 
waste management and the, much, the need for better waste management the whole time that he'd been in the Senate. Um, I mean, as we've said in our additional comments to the committee report, these bills, the Greens feel, are a step in the right direction, but that they are, it's a missed opportunity if this legislation is passed in its current form without substantive amendments. And so we recognise that there are some very positive elements in this bill, but there is much more that needs to be done. In particular, look, the idea of an export ban is great, and it's been, to, it's been really good to be here this morning and to hear government senators talk about their commitment to recycling, to waste management, talk about their commitment to no longer just be shipping all of our waste offshore. It's a good start. But where we think that we particularly need to have more action is that the various targets that are set in this bill they need to be mandatory. It is not going to be good enough just to have voluntary targets. I mean, this is waste and recycling and waste management is an absolutely serious issue, and particularly with regards to plastic waste. I mean, as um, Senator Wish Wilson has already outlined in his contribution, 40% of the plastic used here is single use. It's got an average lifespan of 12 minutes. That's absolutely shocking. And only 16% of that plastic is being recycled. And that means it's 84% that is going elsewhere. It's either you know, there as waste in the oceans, in our bushlands, in our streets, or it's in landfill. Regardless, you know, wherever it is, it's not being reuse, reused. It's a, it's a waste and it's having an impact on our environment. We know that 80 per cent of marine debris is plastic and that global consumption of plastic could triple by 2040. I mean, th there is a horrific amount of plastic in our oceans already, and tragically, more is on its way unless we act. And this matters for all of us. It matters for us, it matters for the fish that people eat, for the oceans we swim in, for the beaches that we walk on. And without urgent, drastic action, the situation is only going to get worse. And, I mean, recycling is something that really matters to people. It's something that people engage with every day. People want to do the right thing. People want to feel that they are contributing to creating a cleaner and a better environment that we all share. They know that they should do the right thing. And essentially, we need to have governments. The role of government is to make things easier for them. So that we need legislation that's got the government doing their bit, businesses doing their bit, and so it makes it easier for everybody. And that means that you need to have mandatory measures in place so that all businesses then know where they stand. You can't have some businesses playing off the, the situation against each other. And I cannot understand the reluctance to implement mandatory targets when basically we have the industry saying, look, it's not going to cost us any more. We've got some quite ambitious targets. We think we're going to meet them. Well, why not make them mandatory? Why not put it there in legislation that this is where we are absolutely committed to heading for? I mean, we have mandatory targets, we have mandatory standards across all other parts of our lives, you know, whether it's health and safety, whether it's in sporting competitions, whether it's in industrial relations you know, or in human rights. We have standards that are absolute commitments that we have to meet, and I cannot see why in the critical area of protecting our environment that those standards should be voluntary rather than mandatory. So, and plus, having mandatory standards actually gives certainty to business. It makes it clear about this is the standards that we are going to reach. And it gives business the confidence to invest in the hundreds of millions of dollars that are going to be needed um, to invest in the circular economy. It's the same, you know, the situation that we are in with the lack of certainty about investing in renewable energy and sort of all of the toing and froing and, and businesses not knowing where they stand, they're saying that is the reason that there hasn't been as much investment as, it, as there otherwise would be. Say, the same will go here. It's just not going to be good enough just to have the export ban. You need to have that certainty, that investment, the, the certainty to give businesses the certainty to invest in in the industries that are going to be part of the circular economy. I mean, people are aware of how damaging plastic waste is. 
And, you know, and we know that lots of people have taken the action to remove, try and remove plastic um, from their lives altogether because and they want to see government working with them to make it easier for them. <laughs> I mean, like so many other people, you know, I try and reduce the amount of plastic that comes into my, my household. You know, bring my own bags, whether they're cloth bags, reuse plastic bags. I wash plastic bags. I resist having t buying takeaway food if it comes in single-use plastic containers. And I know that there are millions of Australians like me who are just as, pa as, as passionate. And of course, I recycle everything I can, including plastic pa packaging and soft plastics. But at the moment, it's hard work because we don't have the industries set up to be using that plastic. We don't have the recycling industries. We know we've currently, with the drop in the amount that we've been able to export, with countries saying, no, we don't want your plastic waste anymore, the market has collapsed for recycled plastics. Local governments have stopped collecting the extent of the amount of plastics as they, they used to because there's just not anywhere for them to go. I mean, I now bring my mother's plastic containers home from her place which she gets her meals on wheels with because her local government is no longer recycling them. It's basically you've got to be really you've got to be committed to be able to be doing that and committed with the recycling of soft plastics where you've got to take them off yourself off to the, the supermarket. We need to be making it easier for people. We need to be having the government working with the community working with industry, and that means having the mandatory targets. It means doing more than what is set out in this legislation. But making best use of our resources and reuse and recycling, it's not just about plastics. There's been a lot of focus on plastics. Another area that we need urgent action is more action to be encouraging the recycling and the reuse of paper products which means that that will have a direct impact on protecting our forests. Um, five years ago, 2015, I moved a motion calling on the government to ensure that government agencies were using 100 per cent recycled paper. Of course, the response was there was some waffle about one agency of the many across the entire Commonwealth that was using 100 per cent recycled paper. But they didn't address the, the real issue, which was using the procurement power of the Commonwealth to support rate, um, paper recycling. I mean, it's, and it's tragic, because if we had that using the power of procurement, if, we, again, we had mandatory targets and it said that this is the level of recycling we're going to have, it would be directly impacting on the amount of wood pulp for paper that we need to be getting out of our native forests. We are continuing to devastate our native forests, primarily for wood chips that are going for pulp, whether it's here in Australia or being exported overseas. When we have got waste streams, paper in waste streams going to waste. We've got the situation where we are still continuing to log our mountain ash forests home to the critically endangered Leadbeater's possum in the central highlands of Victoria to feed the pulp and paper mill at Maryvale, the Nippon Mill in the Latrobe Valley. And yet they've got a paper line, a recycled paper line there that is underused. That if we had procurement of this Commonwealth government saying 100 per cent of the paper being used in Commonwealth agencies needed to be recycled, that would enable that production to lift and it would enable us to be getting less of the, uh, the pulp from our native forests. So you know, these things have consequences. These things are connected. And there are actions that people want to see having to, being taken that government is in a position to actually implement. I mean, we think of the, the situation that our forests are currently in. I mean, last summer, we're heading into, into another summer, last summer, the devastating bushfires so um, that wreaked havoc on our native forests the biggest impact on forests of any continent ever, anywhere in the world, through fire, in places that had never burnt before that were aflame because of the hotter temperatures drying them out. Lives were lost, homes burnt to the ground, and our firefighters working days on end protecting lives around the country. Our forests are under incredible threat, and incredible threat from the climate crisis. But still, you know, after last summer, the Liberal National Party they're in denial. It wasn't the time to talk about our climate crisis. It was too soon, they said. You know, well, it's a year later, and we're heading into another summer. 
and we're still waiting for a meaningful acknowledgement from them of the climate crisis. We are still waiting for meaningful action on climate. And this is connected with what we're talking about today, because there is a suite of actions that need to take place in order to protect our environment. We, you can't just sort of get up and give fine-sounding words about your commitment to recycling without seeing that these issues are all interconnected. That you need, yes, you need to be taking action on recycling. Not enough just to have fine-sounding words and voluntary targets, but you need to be addressing the pressures on, on our environment that are across the board, and that means taking action on our climate crisis. Now, again, back to, to forests. Instead of taking action in our climate crisis, instead of saying we're going to have mandatory targets for paper recycling, they're extending the regional forest agreements, extending the devastation of our native forests by years, when they should be shifting all of our forestry into plantations and getting out of native forest logging as quickly as possible to be protecting our precious wildlife, protecting our water supplies and doing something to be protecting the carbon stores that our, our forests are, and protecting our forests because for just intrinsically for how beautiful and precious in their own right that they are. So our handling of waste and recycling, it matters. It matters today for all Australians. I mean, we can have the Prime Minister rocking up to the UN and saying that he wants Australia to lead the world in recycling. But we know the truth, and the truth is that Australians are actually tired of being taken for mugs by this Prime Minister. I mean, people used to criticise Mr Shorten for having different answers as to whether he was talking to people in Brunswick or people in Townsville. But the truth is that when you base your approach particularly on the environment, on marketing spin, you're going to be caught in the same trap. I mean, the Prime Minister was very happy to make a big flashy speech at the UN talking about how much he cared about the environment and wanted to lead on recycling and waste handling. But it's time he stopped taking Australians for fools. I mean, we can see the truth behind the smirk. You cannot be serious about the environment unless you are being serious about the climate crisis. I mean, this is the same Prime Minister who brought his lump of coal into Parliament and sat on the front bench, sort of fondling it like Gollum holding his precious. I mean, the truth is, despite all of Prime Minister Morrison's marketing skin and spin, if you care about the environment, you must act on the climate emergency. I mean, the, the Prime Minister is happy to wear a hard hat and talk about mining coal when he's in Queensland, but when he goes to the UN, he won't admit to being one of the world's worst polluters or holding back action on emissions. Instead, he pretends to be doing something by talking about recycling. Well, Australian voters see past it. They see past the spin to the fossil fuel lobby that are propping the Liberal Party up. In conclusion, I mean, this bill it is a small, positive step in the right direction, but so much more needs to be done. And more than that, we need, in addition to action on recycling, we need action on our environment crisis and we need action on our climate crisis, urgent action on climate, not tomorrow, but today, or even better, yesterday. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Rennick. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise today in support of the Recycling and Waste Reduction Bill. I commend the government's commitment to stop shipping our unprocessed recyclable waste overseas. In the last reported financial year, Australia shipped over 4.44 megatons of waste overseas. 15 per cent of this was unprocessed plastics, glass, paper and cardboard. cardboard. That's over 600,000 tonnes. Given the nature of the recent bans on recyclable waste, in particular some of the largest waste importers including China, Malaysia, Indonesia, India and the Philippines, the issue of exporting waste is no longer a viable management strategy. Waste is a threat to our environment, and none more so than renewable waste. And I must admit I, I did uh, agree with Senator Rice's uh, previous statements that it should be mandatory for some companies uh, to clean up their waste, and none more so than renewable waste. Uh, renewable energy companies, industries and advocates are for notorious for hiding and minimising their environmental and human health impacts. 
They demand and receive exemptions from health and endangered species laws that apply to other industries. They make promises they cannot keep about being able to safely replace fossil fuels that now provide over 80 per cent of the world's global energy. A few articles have noted some of the serious environmental toxic radio radioactive waste, human health and child labour issues inherent in mine mining, rare earth and cobalt lithium deposits. However, we need quantitative studies, detailed, rigorous, honest, transparent, cradle-to-the-grave peer-reviewed analysis. It's been calculated that replacing 160,000 terawatts of global energy consumption with wind would require 183 million turbines, needing roughly 461 billion tonnes of steel for towers, 460 billion tonnes of steel and concrete for the foundations, and, and 59 million tonnes of copper, steel and alloy for the turbines. 738 million tonnes of neodymium for turbine magnets, 14.7 billion tonnes of steel and complex compost, uh, compost materials for nacelles, 11 billion tonnes of complex petroleum-based comp composites for rotors and massive quantities of other raw materials, all of which must be mined, processed, manufactured into finished products and shipped around the world. And once the uh, life is ended of these products, they then need to be either disposed of uh, cleanly or recycled. Shipping just the iron ore to build the turbines would require nearly three million voyages in huge ships that would consume 13 billion tonnes of bunker fuel, heavy fuel at that. And converting that ore to iron and steel would require 473 billion tonnes of coking coal demanding another 1.2 million sea voyages, consuming another 6 billion tonnes of bunker fuel. For sustainability disciples, does Earth have enough of these raw materials for this transformation? It gets worse. These numbers do not include the ultra-long ultra transmission lines required to carry electricity from windy locations to distant cities. And as I mentioned last week, in the 2009 bushfires, the cause of that was determined to be a fallen transmission line. And you know, if we're going to build more transmission lines, are we going to put them underground to reduce the risk of fire breaking out? Wind turbines and solar panels last just 20 years or less, while coal, gas and nuclear power plants last up to 50 years and require far less land and raw material. That means we would, have to haul, we would have to tear down, haul away and replace far more renewable generators twice as often, dispose of or recycle their composite parts and mine, process and ship more ores. Then, uh, then there are the bird and bat species deaths, wildlife losses from destroying habitats and human health impacts from wind turbine noise and flicker. These also need to be examined fully and honestly, along with effects of skyrocketing renewable energy prices on every aspect of this transition and of our lives. Solar panels are far more efficient at turning sunlight into heat than they are at turning sunlight into electricity. Solar panels produce more waste heat per watt than any other power source. In areas where there are large solar plants, temperatures can be as much as four degrees hotter than the surrounding land forming heat islands. Pilots fly flying lower than 12,000 feet have been reported to feel the hot, rising hot air. Plants and animals are the enemy of solar and must be removed from solar plants. Since solar plants require vast amounts of land, usually only available in environmentally sensitive areas, wildlife is devastated. And it's also worth pointing out that the CSIRO themselves have predicted that lith Australia's lithium battery waste could exceed over 100,000 tonnes in less than 20 years. Old lithium batteries are a fire risk and they are full of toxic heavy metals 
that have a limited life. Now it should be noted, we, uh, I, I should point out that uh, the opposition leader Anthony Albanese has been accusing uh, this government of playing accounting tricks with Paris. But if there was ever an accounting trick, it's the fact that the cost of building all these renewables occur in other countries, and the CO2 that's emitted in the production of these uh, renewables aren't included in Australia's targets. And nor, might I add, is recycling or cleaning up these renewables. So if you wanted to fix, you know, if you wanted to get serious about where the real accounting trick is, it's that either all countries are in Paris or they're not. Because what's happening is a lot of these renewables are being manufactured in non-Paris uh, committed countries, and those carbon dioxide emissions aren't being included in the countries where that energy is being consumed. So I suggest that the Leader of the Opposition actually uh, reflect on his comments about the accounting tricks, because if anyone's doing the accounting tricks, it's the way the Paris Agreement was actually structured to actually encourage renewables to be manufactured in countries where, where they are not a part of Paris. And perhaps he might look at other countries rather than trying to destroy our productive industries and destroy Australian jobs. Now, with the existing recycling collection methods and infrastructure, coupled with the recent international agreements related, relating to hazardous waste movement and plastic marine debris, as well as the development of foreign policy, current data suggests the export of recyclable material would no longer provide a cost-effective solution and would damage the economy and environment in the near future. Its heavy reliance on international agreements and policy is forefronted by the 2018 introduction of restrictions on waste imports in China. In 2017-18 financial year, China was the largest importer of Australian recyclable waste, importing over 1.3 million tonnes. China's new restrictions have caused large-scale changes to the market, including reducing the price of scrap paper, which was once valued at $124 a tonne, by almost 100 per cent. We've reduced the, the, the price of scrap plastic, once valued at $325 per tonne, has reduced by 78 per cent, and the price of cardboard, which was once valued at $210 per tonne, has been reduced by 40 per cent. With many other Southeast Asian countries reaching capacity and considering new restrictions on recyclable material, it is vital that the government moves away from the export of waste and towards domestic recyclable waste management, as is proposed by this bill. The export of recyclable waste is no longer a good investment. If nothing is done, it is likely that we will see the export of such waste being valued at less than worthless, leaving Australia with a waste problem that has no prior established solution. However, this is not just an economic issue. I have no doubt that everyone in this chamber has seen footage of the plastic-filled stomachs we find in some of our marine birds. Countless images of marine species becoming trapped and strangled by plastic pollution. I guarantee everyone has seen footage of a turtle hopelessly stuck after consuming plastic product pollution in the ocean. This is a moral issue and, more importantly, a strong environment issue. Contrary to the belief of those opposite, I am actually an environmentalist. You will struggle to find someone with more love for our natural environment than me, which is why I spent seven years in my early 20s uh, overseas, uh, travelling around various countries, climbing the slopes of Kilimanjaro or Mount Blanc, diving in numerous countries, hiking in numerous countries uh, and being fascinated by, by, by what a wonderful and beautiful world that we live in. And uh, it's, you know, if we're going to ensure, and it's interesting, one of the things I did notice though, that the poorer the country, the worse the waste problem was. And that is why we should never destroy our economy to save the environment. Because without a strong economy, you will not save the environment. And it's very important. Things like you know, garbage bins and uh, things that we take here for granted in Australia, many countries just don't have those uh, uh, freely available uh, to ensure that if you're out walking or whatever, there's a bin nearby. And for that matter, I should also, should also add sanitary um, 
uh, availability uh, facilities as well. You know, I've been in many places in third world countries where you get a bit of the uh, diarrhoea or something and you've got to find a toilet. And I can tell you it's uh, something that you take for granted in this country, but in many other countries it is uh, difficult to find. So we should be always ensuring that we do protect our economy and to ensure that we keep waste to a minimum. I believe that reliable, affordable, emission-free energy that is contained within hydropower, hydrogen power and, of course, one of the world's cleanest and most reliable sources of power, nuclear energy, is the path to the future. And it's why I asked in estimates about chirped pulse amplification, which is a technology uh, that's uh, recently come to the fore. Uh, in 2018, a Nobel Prize was given for the work in this particular area. And what that is is a very strong, powerful laser beam is sh is sh shines on a nucleus. And what that will do is, is with the idea of being you shine it on the uh, neutrons and you try and flip one of the quarks to turn it into a proton. And what that will do will reduce the radioactive waste of nuclear energy by thousands of years and reduce it to about 30 years. And if we could do that, that would be a huge step forward in being able to use nuclear energy as a clean, uh, green uh, method of energy, which eventually we're going to have to go there. I mean, you know, one of these days, if we've ever got to leave planet Earth, we won't be leaving it with a wind-powered um, spaceship. I can assure you, there's no wind, uh, power, there's no wind or, or much light up there in space. So if we're going to ever, you know, have to find means to find other resources somewhere else, it's going to have to be nuclear technology. And the country that gets on top of that uh, is going to be the country that leads on manufacturing and things like that, because nuclear energy, if used properly, will be the cheapest form of energy. Waste management is crucial to keep Australia's environmental wonders wondrous. That is why, on behalf of the Australian government, the Australian Renewable Energy Agency announced that it is placing over $15 million in, of funding into 16 projects to help address the solar PV panel efficiency and end-of-life issues. I have always been a strong supporter of adequate strategies and research being used to investigate solar and battery waste, as can be, be seen by my submission to the EPBC Act. Given the potential environmental disaster solar waste disposal could cause through the leaching of hazardous materials such as lithium and lead, this research funding could not come sooner. Unlike what many have been made to believe by those opposite, the disposal of waste from materials such as solar panels and plastics pose one of the largest environmental threats to countless ecosystems around the world, our beloved Great Barrier Reef being the biggest one close to home. Forget theories based on fundamentally flawed bomb data and methods. Forget the poten potential low to negligible impact of our farmers have on 3 per cent of inland reefs. Waste disposal is an environmental disaster that is affecting our marine ecosystems now and is only going to get worse as solar and battery waste are expected to become a major contributor to national waste in the decades to come. By banning unprocessed plastics, cardboard, paper and other recyclable material from being exported, we are creating a circular economy. This bill is simply the first step of, reform, of many reforms of our economy in a way better suited to the cli changing climate of foreign politics and to ensure the sustainable use of resources for our future generations. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Uh, Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Recycling and Waste Reduction Bill 2020 and associated bills. Uh, and I want to associate myself with the remarks made by my Greens colleague, Senator Peter Wish Wilson, who has been a long standing, passionate advocate for waste reduction and recycling. Um, I have a strong commitment to moving us towards zero waste and a circular economy. And I've had that commitment for a long time uh, through my work in New South Wales Parliament and before that in my role as environmental manage manager in local governments. While this bill in front of us bans waste export, which is really good, this bill is nowhere near enough to deal with the mountains of waste that we produce. The truth of the matter is, we should never have been exporting waste in the first place. I think many Australians were alarmed when they found out about this. If waste is produced here, 
it should be dealt with here. Out of sight, out of mind is not going to cut it anymore. If the government is really serious about addressing the waste crisis, this bill is not the solution. Um, this is just window dressing the problem. Banning waste exports is not going to help us crawl out of the mountains of waste that we produce. Neither is recycling by itself. Being serious about waste means starting at the top of the waste hierarchy, avoiding and reducing waste. Um, then moving on to reuse and repair, and then recycling and so on, when the least preferred option, of course, is disposal. And this bill does nothing to reduce waste. This bill does nothing to make product stewardship mandatory, nothing to ensure that the producers of the waste have the responsibility for it, and this bill does nothing to address the problem of plastic pollution. And before I say a little more on these issues, I want to highlight the size of the problem that we face. Um, to start the story of waste, let's get a snapshot of what we produce, recycle and dump. Australia produced about 76 million tons of waste in 2018-2019. That's at least 5 million garbage trucks full every single year. And to be able to visualize that, if you line up those trucks, it will form a queue of about 40,000 kilometers, which is well over the length of the whole of the coastline of Australia. That's the extent of the problem that we are facing. According to MRA Consulting, between 1996 and 2015, our population increased by 28% while our waste generation increased by 170%. That's a compound growth rate of about 8% a year. Our waste habits also have a significant, significant impact on the climate crisis. First, through the use of energy and material to satisfy our appetite for production and consumption, and then through the methane that is produced from landfills when we go off and bury our discards. Methane is much more potent than carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas, and that only exacerbates the climate emergency that we are already in. While there is no doubt that when you look at the numbers in our state of environment reports, the rate of recycling has definitely increased over the years, but the total amount of waste has also increased, and that is the crux of the problem. We can't keep on producing more and more throwing it out, and then hoping to recycle our way out of this mountain of rubbish. Waste and recycling was brought back into the public's focus just a few years ago with the Four Corners Exposé, aptly named Trashed. The program told us some things that we knew, and some that came as quite a shock to many of us, especially the revelation that possibly half of all that we think is being recycled was just ending up in landfills, or as stockpiled material in New South Wales, Queensland, and Victoria. We found out that what we diligently separate out for recycling at home wasn't being recycled at all. And it is deeply concerning that rather than focusing on the root causes of waste and how to manage that, governments have decided to go down the path of unsustainable polluting alternatives like waste incinerators. In New South Wales alone, there are proposals for five waste incinerators. If built, these incinerators would operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This will poison our air with dioxins, furans, heavy metals, and fine particles such as PM2.5 and PM10, putting in danger the health of communities living in the vicinity of these garbage incinerators. There is a real concern that these waste burners could effectively monopolize waste disposal as well. So what might end up happening is that material that is able to be reused or recycled might end up being burnt in incinerators instead. To meet the ap appetite of these burning machines, more waste will be produced, not less. These incinerators have absolutely zero social license. They have been thoroughly rejected by the community. 
When in New South Wales Parliament, I was part of a massive community campaign to push back on the gigantic world's largest toxic waste incinerator proposed for Eastern Creek in Western Sydney. Because of the courage of the community, it was knocked back by the Department of Planning, the New South Wales EPA, New South Wales Health, a parliamentary inquiry that I sat on, and the final nail in the coffin of this waste burner was driven by the Independent Planning Commission. Mel Melinda Wilson, spokesperson for Western Sydney Direct Action, was recently reported as saying, why and how can a project already rejected by the Independent Planning Commission come back again fivefold? Why did the minister not accept the IPC's advice and reject these incinerators once and for all? She's right. The risks to human health and the environment are serious and irreversible. These incinerators are no solution to the waste problem. Energy from burning rubbish is not renewable, clean or green. These big, dirty waste polluters have recently been banned in the ACT, and rightly so. The federal government should show leadership and stop at least any public funding going to these waste incinerators. And this bill is an opportunity to do that. And while we are talking about ways in which the federal government can show leadership, let's talk about plastics. 180 million plastic bags find their way into the environment every year. And microplastics have been found in a majority of drinking water supplies all around the world. Conservative estimates have stated that there are currently 5 trillion pieces of plastic on the surface of oceans and an additional 8 million tons of plastics entering oceans every single year. This is the equivalent of one garbage truck of plastic every minute of every day of the year. Australia alone produces over 2.5 million tons of plastic uh, per year. And that's a huge addition to the global plastic pollution problem. In 2018-2019, 9% of that plastic was sent to be recycled, while a whopping 84% was sent to landfill. That's, and a worrying amount of this waste ends up on our streets and in our waterways. The impacts of plastics are devastating on marine life, on our seabirds, dolphins, seals, and turtles. And I want to thank the wonderful people who work at facilities like the Ballina Seabird Rescue, where they rescue and rehabilitate marine animals and seabirds who are usually injured after having ingested this plastic. They also educate school children to reduce the use of plastics. The 2015 Senate Committee report into the threat of marine plastic pollution um, stated that there are worrying gaps in our knowledge about the effect of marine plastic pollution. And this includes impact on the population levels of native animals, the effects on human health of plastics in the food chain, as well as the short and long-term effects of microplastics. If the Prime Minister really wants to tackle the plastic pollution problem, and he should do this with gusto, then this bill must be amended to address plastics. I know that some state governments are moving to ban single-use plastics, but right here, right now, the federal government has the opportunity to show some guts. Let's not let this chance slip away from us. At the end of the day, we need to urgently reduce production and consumption and make big strides away from a throwaway society. Instead of starting at the bottom of the waste hierarchy with landfilling, with burning waste and recycling, why not start at the very top with waste avoidance or even better? Let's look at it with the perspective of material and resource management rather than waste management. And the other side of the waste coin is the unbridled use of precious natural resources like our forests and water. And there are many tools available for us to do this. For example, approaches like mandatory extended producer responsibility, which makes producers of goods responsible for their full life cycle, have been quite successful in reducing material use, extend the product, uh, product's life, and make it easier to reuse, repair, and recycle. Basically, the attitude of the industry must be to design for the environment. If it can't be fixed, 
reused or recycled, don't make it. The repair economy is also something really worth investing in. Waste is a hot topic at the moment, and we should reignite the conversation about drastically reducing and eliminating waste. While the idea of zero waste can be daunting, according to the Zero Waste International Alliance, zero waste is a goal that is both pragmatic and visionary to guide people to emulate sustainable natural cycles where all discarded materials are resources for others to use. Zero waste means designing and managing products and processes to reduce the volume and toxicity of waste and materials, conserve and recover all resources, and not burn or bury them. Implementing zero waste will eliminate all discharges to land, water, or air that may be a threat to planetary, human, animal, or plant health. And that's what we all should be trying to do. There is an overwhelming appetite in the community to reduce waste, but we need the government to step in and step up to play a role. Local councils are at the forefront of waste management, but need the state and federal government to come to the party with both funding, support, and policy that signals a shift towards avoiding, reducing, and reusing waste. This bill should not be a wasted opportunity. The time to act is now. Senator Van. Thank you very much, Mr. Acting Deputy President. In September last year, in my first Senator's statement, I said, our oceans are choking with plastic and other waste. Yet conversations with our within our community are repetitive and action needs to move at a quicker pace. So therefore it is a great privilege to stand in this chamber today to speak on the recycling and waste reduction bill. And what a time to get the opportunity to debate and pass this important legislation. Just last month we celebrated National Recycling Week. National Recycling Week is designed to engage with all Australians on the importance of recycling. This year's theme was recovery, a future beyond the bin, which is about closing the recycling loop and buying products made with recycled content. And we are seeing private industry play a significant role in reducing of single-use products. In my home state of Victoria, we're seeing innovative companies, such as one that I'm very familiar with called Returner, which was founded by one of the co-founders of Keep Cup, starting to see market growth on the back of developing ways to replace single-use plastics with re reusable solutions in the takeaway food industry. These local businesses are recognising that local communities, businesses and families have an important role to play in global sustainability. This approach leads to pragmatic, sensible outcomes and not just virtue signalling. Mr Acting Deputy President, the Recycling and Waste Reduction Bill is a wonderful example of, pragmatic, of a pragmatic, sensible approach to increasing our recycling and reducing the amount of waste which we send to landfill. One thing that we know for sure is that Australians want to be confident that when they put their bin out on the curb, everything will be collected and recycled. Australians do not want to see their recycling sent to landfill shipped overseas or stored illegally to become a fire hazard that could explode in a fire at any minute. As the Prime Minister has said, it's our waste, it's our responsibility. That is why this government, under the leadership of Scott Morrison and the tireless efforts of Minister Lay and Assistant Minister Evans, the government has introduced this legislation. This legislation will implement the waste export ban agreed by Australian governments in March this year and reform the Product Stewardship Act of 2011. The Recycling and Waste Reduction Bill will phase out Australia's offshoring of 645,000 tonnes of plastic, paper, glass and tyres. It is important to remember that whenever we export our waste overseas, we are essentially passing our rubbish onto other countries to deal with. The phasing out of Australia exporting its waste will ensure that 
it is dealt with here. It is our waste and we bear the responsibility for ensuring that the highest waste recycling standards are met. To meet the increase in waste being dealt with onshore, we must develop and transform Australia's recycling capabilities and capacities. And to do so, the Morrison government is leading a billion dollar transform, transformation of our waste and recycling industry. We are achieving this by helping to build onshore demand for recycled content and helping industry to, achieve, to invest in innovative technology to deal with it. These efforts will create more than 10,000 much needed jobs and divert over 10 million tonnes of resources from landfill. As I said at the start of my speech, that this bill delivered a pragmatic and, a pragmatic and sensible approach to increasing our recycling and reducing the amount of waste which is sent to landfill, which is why the next aspect of the bill really excites me. At the same time as phasing out of our export waste, we're also introducing reforms to the regulation of product stewardship. These reforms will incentivise companies to take greater environmental responsibility for the products they manufacture, including at the end of their life. As we on this side are very good at, it is both a combination of carrot and stick. Investing in greater environmental responsibility at the time of manufacturing while also investing in Australia's recycling capacity. Now, Ms Acting Deputy President, as this place is aware, I am a member of the Environment Communications Legislation Committee, which considered this bill in great detail. And one, of the many, one of the things that really struck me, uh, stuck, me stuck, stuck with me throughout the inquiry was how supportive Australian industry, business, the Green Groups, and local communities have been towards the waste export ban. All of these groups are supportive of this ban because they see, they see it as a positive catalyst for change. And the Morrison government sees it as an opportunity for change as well. I mentioned Returner before as a business that is shaking up the takeaway industry with their reusable products. But now I want to mention two other great businesses in the fashion industry who are also doing their bit to reduce waste. Newly back in Australian hands, RM Williams is offering $150 off new boots if you exchange uh, your old boots. All traded RMs will be restored and replenished for future resale. The uh, clothing brand MJ Bale will slash $20 off any new suit when you bring your old suit in to be donated to Moving the Needle which is a business collaboration between Australian Red Cross, the Salvation Army and uh, St Vincent's or St Vinnie's. These businesses are taking the challenge of dealing with waste and recycling head on. At the same time, supporting charities and ensuring more Australians have access to great Australian fashion. As, as, a, as a Senate, we should congratulate them for undertaking these initiatives. This government is striving to support these businesses that are supporting our waste export ban. We have introduced the most significant package of policies and funding commitments on recycling and waste ever brought forward by a federal government. We have introduced a national waste policy action plan that will achieve, amongst many things, an 80 per cent average recovery rate across all waste streams, a significant increase in procurement of recycled materials and it will halve the amount of organic waste sent to landfill. In addition, we are leading substantial investment in recycling through a new $190 million recycling modernisation fund. This fund will use its power to leverage $600 million of new investment in recycling infrastructure. We are providing $35 million to deliver on Commonwealth elements of the National Waste Policy Action Plan and $24.6 million to improve our waste data. These investments complement our already comprehensive $167 million Australian Recycling Investment Plan. And this plan includes $100 million under Clean Energy Finance Corporation for large-scale pr projects using clean energy technologies to support the recycling of waste products a $20 million 
$20 million for a national product stewardship investment fund to kickstart product stewardship action. Australia's first national plastic summit, which was hosted by this government in March, mobilised major pledges from leading companies including the Pact Group, Nestle, McDonald's, Coca-Cola and Coles. The outcomes from the summit will help inform Australia's national plastics plan and achieve a phase-out of problematic and unnecessary plastics over the next five years. Mr Acting Deputy President, the Morrison government have a strong and positive story to tell on our efforts to reduce waste, increase recycling, and I'm proud to tell that story in this place. Our policies will reduce waste, incentivise the recycling industry, reduce, uh, reduce uh, li and lift recycling rates. They will tackle plastics pollution in our oceans and waterways. They will ensure we build a healthy recycling and resource recovery ind industry in Australia. However, most importantly, we will give Australians the confidence that what they put in their recycling bin will actually be recycled. Waste is not just an environmental problem to solve. It is an economic opportunity, and because of the initiatives included in this bill, business will seize the opportunity to reuse and recycle. And they will do it here, at home, in Australia. Thank you. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, um, Mr. Acting uh, Deputy President. I rise to contribute to this. Uh, to the debate of this bill, and uh, in doing so, um, associate myself with the comments already put forward by the Green spokesperson on waste and recycling. That, of course, is Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Wish Wilson has been a um, avid supporter um, for uh, proper recycling and waste management industry in this country, and I think it's fair to say that uh, we wouldn't be here where we are today debating this piece of legislation if it wasn't for the work from uh, Senator Wish Wilson. Um, we know, of course, that reducing waste is and must be uh, the goal that all of us uh, strive for and advocate. Um, we need to be reducing uh, waste. We need to be reducing the stuff that makes waste. I think our uh, lives, and many people would reflect upon this, is just increasingly full of stuff stuff we don't really need, stuff that doesn't uh, last long enough, and stuff that at the end of it we think, why on earth did we, uh, how did we end up with this and what do we do with it now? And that is why we need a proper uh, uh, system and management system that is uh, circular, fully circular. We need to be reducing the amount of crap that's made that isn't recyclable, that isn't actually reusable, and perhaps Think about whether we need it in the first place. We need to be making sure that when we do put in place systems that uh, deal with the waste that we have, that that is done in the most environmentally friendly and sustainable manner. We need to stop producing in this country and indeed around the world single-use plastic. Now, if you can't reuse something, we shouldn't be creating it. And that, I think, is the principle that we need going forward, because there is a lot of rubbish out there already that we don't know how we're going to manage. And the last thing we need to be doing is creating more of it to make it even harder to deal with the problems at hand. We know that our oceans are choking. We know that our waterways are polluted. We know that our animals are dying because of the amount of plastic and rubbish and toxic waste that they have ingested. We know that animals are being caught and strangled because of the rubbish that is left in our rivers and winds up in our oceans. Sea Shepherd Australia has been running beach cleanups around the country, and I've been to a number of them uh, in my home state in South Australia. Since 2016, Sea Shepherd Australia has hosted nearly 700 beach and remote cleanups, joining with over 28,000 members of the community. And it is just incredible when you go to these beach cleanups. We put aside two or three hours. We all walk out with our buckets and our tongs and our gloves, and the amount of rubbish that is collected over one simple morning. 
And it is children in particular who are gobsmacked at the amount of rubbish that they, that they find. And I think it is children who are the ones who are really calling on us as adults and as leaders to take serious action on this front. For far too long, Australia has not cared about the rubbish we create and where it goes. This bill is a step in the right direction to starting to deal with this terrible pollution problem that we have. But it isn't the, isn't the final solution. We, it isn't the only answer. We still have many more steps to take. One of them, of course, is banning single-use plastics. We've got to stop creating this crap. We have to stop creating this rubbish, and we have to deal with the plastic that we have already. We also need to be putting in place systems that ensure that the disposal of the waste is done in the most environmentally sound and sustainable way. And that is why I am concerned that um, while this bill is a step in the right direction, um, I am concerned that there is um, uh, the hole uh, in this piece of legislation that would act as a perverse incentive for the incineration of waste. And why am I concerned about that? I'm concerned that unless we have a clear statement from this government that the aim is to reduce the amount of pollution that we have, to reduce the amount of toxic waste available, that allowing for the incineration of plastic in order to get rid of it is going to create even more problems for us into the future, particularly as we tackle the very, very serious environmental crisis of climate change and carbon pollution. Because, of course, we know we need to be getting out of fossil fuels. We've got to stop burning those fossil fuels. The last thing we want to do is create a perverse incentive that says, oh, well, you can create more plastic, but we'll, put, we'll, we'll create a market mechanism to ensure that we can keep burning it, because that is simply burning oil burning fossil fuels, creating more pollution. That is not the type of uh, pathway we want to take, which is why uh, I have moved a second reading amendment to this piece of legislation uh, that calls on the government to rule out any financial or regulatory support for waste to energy incineration. We can't afford, after all we know about the rubbish that is clogging our oceans, clogging our waterways, that takes so long uh, to, to deal with, the last thing we want to do is create a problem where there is an incentive by vested interests to not reduce the amount of plastic that's produced, but to simply put it into an incinerator and burn it claiming that this is uh, some type of clean energy production. It is not. It is toxic, it is backwards, and it's not how you deal uh, with the fully circular uh, waste management uh, agenda that we need. Now, don't get me wrong, I understand that across the country we've become better and better at dealing with um, the gases that come out of landfill. And in fact, there is a, there are many, many ways that the gas that is coming out of landfill is being captured and uh, turned into energy. But what we don't want to see is a market created because of vested interests, because of loopholes in the law, because of the wrong signals being sent by government, that we have a bunch of companies decide to set up and make a quick buck by saying that they will burn the plastic, put it into an incinerator and turn that into energy. Because what we need to be doing is reducing the amount of plastic we produce in the first place. Some of those um, landfill uh, to energy programs that already exist in Australia have taken the best available science from around the world, particularly in places like Germany, and they rely on the anaerobic digestion system. 
So this is taking green organic waste, capturing the gas that, rather than having it just uh, reduce, uh, uh, release into the atmosphere and to be toxic, that they turn that into energy. And I, un I understand that. And of course that needs to continue because we do have uh, this uh, organic matter um, in landfill. But there is a very big difference between that and setting up a market that is supported by government, whether through regulation or financial support or incentives, that send a signal that you can keep producing as much plastic as you want if these guys over here are going to make money burning it and creating pollution. That is not the pathway we need to be taking. So I urge the crossbench, I urge the government, I urge uh, the opposition to support my second reading amendment in relation to this because we have to draw a line in the sand somewhere. I've listened to a number of the contributions from senators on all sides in relation to this piece of legislation, and I think it's fair to say that there is goodwill across uh, the benches here in relation to dealing with waste and recycling and protecting our environment. Let's not undo all of that goodwill and that good work by providing an incentive for some cowboys out there in the industry who want to keep making plastic so that they can burn it and sell it as power. That's going to create more pollution. It doesn't deal with the issues of the plastic choking our waterways and our oceans, and it doesn't deal with this issue fundamentally that we have well, we create too much crap and we don't recycle or reuse enough of it. We have to make sure we get back to basics. Reduce, reuse, recycle. And of course, if we do all of this properly, what do we create? We create the greenest jobs available. Green jobs. There is a huge industry that is desperate for support for ensuring that we deal with the waste in a circular process. Um, but all of that will be undercut if we allow, through this piece of legislation, a loophole that provides a perverse incentive for cowboys out there in the industry to make a quick buck burning plastic and creating pollution. So I urge the government to consider this and to not let uh, that happen. Uh, I commend the bill to the parliament, but I urge those actions in relation to the second reading amendment be taken on board and supported by the government. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. A year and a half ago, I found myself on another one of my North Queensland trips to speak with a company that had developed a method of recycling farm plastics, often used for crops like tomatoes, strawberries and melons. For those of you who aren't familiar with farming, at the end of every season the crops are cut back and thousands of kilometres of this black plastic is ripped up and rolled into giant balls that were once upon a time dumped into landfill. This happened on thousands of farms across Australia each year, so you can only imagine how much plastic was ending up in the ground. Once the dumping practice ended, farms were just storing unmeasurable numbers of these plastic bales which were, a sticking time, which were a ticking time bomb for firebugs and environmental damage on prime agricultural land. You might ask why this plastic wasn't being recycled in the first place. The problem farmers faced was that when they'd rip the plastic up from the moist soil below, dirt would stick to the plastic. The dirt was enough to contaminate the recycling process, so therefore the bales of plastic would just get stored in the corner of a farm. But along came this young bloke, Corey Turner, who was Young Achiever of the Year, showing us that this device he'd developed that not just ripped up the black plastic but removed the soil and green matter. His biggest impediment was that he couldn't find the financial support to build these devices on a commercial scale. I was so impressed by what he'd developed that I helped him by becoming an investor in his company. I'm not sure too many other senators in this parliament have put their money where their mouth is when it comes to recycling. 
It would be an interesting question to ask Greens how many of them own shares or an interest in a recycling company. Let's face it, we all have a responsibility to deal with rubbish and recycling in this country, but we'd have a whole lot less to deal with if we weren't buying in cheap goods from countries like China. My generation and older, as well as those who are probably in their early to mid-40s, know what recycling was about. My father's garage had shelves of reused pickle jars full of screws and God knows what else he kept in there. He was the kind of man who could fix just about everything around the house. On the other side of the coin, our pantry had reused glass jars, repurposed for jams that mum would make out of fruit we'd grow in the backyard. We'd take the glass soft drink bottles back to the store for a credit or refund or donate them to the local scouts group. We drank from a tap when we were thirsty. We didn't buy water in plastic bottles. We boiled a flask and made our coffee or a cup of tea in the old enamel cups when we went for weekend drives, not throw away, take away cups. And we bought quality. We bought Australian-made appliances for the house, not this cheap crap we see in the shelves that last 12 months, if you're lucky. This bill talks about the action plan aimed at driving change in industry, business, governments and the community to turn waste into reusable commodities. I'm sorry, but I can't think of anything useful for a $7.50 Kmart toaster that breaks or burns someone's house down. Nor can I see how a $9 Big W sandwich maker can be turned into a reusable commodity. These are just two examples of the cheap rubbish we are being sold in stores across Australia. Most of these dead household items just end up in landfill. We bury it. Out of sight, out of mind. Let's face it, there's very little worth keeping on a cheap $7.50 cordless kettle from Kmart. This bill states it intends to regulate the export of waste material which is likely to have a negative impact on the environment or human health in the receiving country. But where's the regulations to stop the importation of cheap material that is likely to harm the environment or human health in our country, in Australia? As far as I'm concerned, the bulk of what we're sending back is their rubbish sent here to begin with. Just take solar panels for example. Here in Australia, we can't do a single thing with dead cells. We're burying them. And all of that cadmium, lead and other toxic chemicals eventually leach into the soil and into waterways. The same goes for other renewable energy sources like wind turbines. So we're screaming out for more solar panels in the country, more wind turbines, but no one's told me how you intend to get rid of them. What are we going to do with them? Some of the Greens might find this difficult to comprehend, but I've been working with the Turnbull and Morrison governments for about three years to enable the world's first commercial recycling plant for asbestos. Asbestos is one of the most deadly materials that are dumped and community will deal with, not only in this country, but right across the globe. This thermochemical plant that I've taken to the government has been approved by environmental agencies in the United States and the European Union, but not here in Australia. The Australian company, EnviroMaster, is being held up by a second feasibility study because of bureaucracy and government departments. They've been forced to undertake two feasibility studies worth more than $12 million. <laughs> it's the usual red tape we hear about that's helping to continue the trend of digging giant holes and burying <coughs> thousands <coughs> of tonnes of this deadly material each week. And this is happening every single day in suburban areas like my old hometown of Ipswich. <coughs> You've heard it first, Australia has a way of recycling asbestos, but we continue to bury it 
as best practice, which as it stands, leaves an eternal legacy. We can thank federal and state government bureaucrats who feel the need to stifle this new technology that's already been approved in the United States and Europe. If I knew the names of these bureaucrats, I'd name them here because they're doing a great job proving to taxpayers why they hate dealing with government departments. Australia could do much more recycling if, and I emphasise if for a reason, Australia could do much more recycling if we had cheaper energy. But because we're not prepared to build more coal-fired power stations, we've been forced to send glass and other recyclable products overseas where energy costs are at least half the price of Australia. Again, this bill is just a part of the solution to better recycling here in, in Australia, but Senator Roberts and I will be supporting the legislation. Thank you. Senator McKim. Well, thank you, Acting Deputy President. The Recycling and Waste Reduction Bills uh, 2020 and uh, the cognate package to uh, that legislation collectively represents a giant and gaping missed opportunity to tackle the waste crisis that is engulfing not only our country but, in fact, the entire world. As the Senate inquiry into this bill made abundantly clear, these bills do not nearly go far enough to tackle the waste crisis. And let's be clear, this is an absolute crisis. Microplastics have been found in the deepest parts of our oceans. They are leaching into the waterways and into our oceans on every part of our planet, and they are choking and poisoning our ecosystems and, in particular, our marine ecosystems. Now, we've all seen the shocking photos and images of uh, giant drifts of plastics, whether they be lapping up uh, on beaches uh, packed so solidly that you actually cannot even see the water, or whether they have congealed into giant mid-ocean rafts. This habit, this terrible habit that we have collectively got into of using fossil fuels and remember uh, plastic is generated from fossil fuels to create products that we use but once and then dispose of simply by chucking it out the car window um, into the ocean when we're down at the beach or uh, off the side of our vessels. This practice has to end because we are choking the planet and choking the planet's ecosystems with plastic. So we know, of course, that fossil fuel companies are cooking our planet, but when you remember that pl people who make plastic are also fossil fuel companies, they're not just cooking the planet, they are choking our planet with rubbish and with microplastics. So these bills are completely inadequate. And I want to congratulate Senator Wish Wilson for the way that he's engaged with this legislation and for the amendments that he has developed. And I do want to commend uh, his amendments to the chamber. Now, some of the flaws in this legislation. Obviously, they overlook plastic packaging, which is uh, one of, if not the biggest sources of the plastic waste problem. The bills also contain no mandatory targets. And you would have thought we would have learned from history, which shows us clearly that simply asking big corporations to modify their behaviour when they believe that the changes required to modify their behaviour will impact on their bottom line, on their profits, 
is not going to work. It's blindingly obvious. It happens time after time after time when we bring in these voluntary codes of conduct for corporations, they are almost never adhered to. What we need is legislated targets here to make sure that corporations do what they should be doing in the public good and to look after nature on our planet. Now, as a general principle, humanity simply cannot continue to create as much waste as we do. We cannot afford conti to continue to burn as much waste as we do. And we certainly cannot afford to continue disposing of waste in the way that we do and in the quantities that we do. Now, of course, as, as with so many of the topics that we debate in this place, the good news is that we can actually have a win-win here. We can actually look after nature, look after marine ecosystems, look after our environment, look after our climate and create jobs at the same time. Looking after waste is incredibly job intensive. And we need to make sure that we've got enough jobs for people who want them in this country, and currently we don't, despite all the spin that we'll get from the government benches, there are simply fewer jobs in Australia than there are people who want to work. That's not a controversial statement. That is simply a statement of fact. So why wouldn't we look to create jobs in areas where jobs have extra benefits over and above the simple creation of work? Looking after nature, looking after our oceans, reversing the climate breakdown, for example. And that's why the Greens have been talking about significant investment into the infrastructure that will reduce waste and help to rebuild our domestic recycling industry. Because, Senators, we've got lazy over the last few decades in this country. Overwhelmingly, we've made decisions to not invest into a domestic recycling industry, but instead to export our recycled products overseas. But for various reasons, that hasn't worked, and particularly in recent years, it's worked less and less. So let's invest into rebuilding our domestic recycling industry so that we can create jobs and address one of the most significant environmental issues facing our planet. And of course the Greens want mandatory product stewardship and a national container deposit scheme. But we also want to phase out single-use plastics. And I'll tell you now, when the history of this time is written, there are going to be some pretty big villains who are writ large in those pages. And those villains are going to be the people who dug in and resisted real climate action, the coal huggers, the gas sniffers of this place. They're going to be some of the biggest villains. And they're the people who, when they're retired out of this place, are going to have to answer to their children and, in particular, to their grandchildren. But it's not just the fossil fools who are going to have to answer those questions. It is those who either stood in the way of meaningful action on waste or who put forward solutions which are not strong enough to deal with the problem and then claimed 
that in fact they were dealing with those problems. So we have to phase out single-use plastics. How are we going to explain to our grandchildren that we allowed mass marine extinctions, that we allowed microplastics to permeate every, every underwater crevice on this planet because we simply kept using uh, fossil fuels to generate plastics which were used once and then cast aside to pollute our oceans in the long term. So addressing our waste crisis will take real leadership, and it will take leadership far, far above and beyond the mere tinkering that is encapsulated in the government's legislation. And what real leadership would look like would be leadership that did, in fact, phase out single-use plastics, that did introduce mandatory product stewardship so that the corporations that create the waste are ultimately responsible for managing it right through to the end of its life. Real leadership would look like a national container deposit scheme, and real leadership would look like a significant investment into rebuilding our domestic recycling industry. Because our land environments and our marine environments, which are already under massive pressure because our climate is breaking down around us, are also under pressure because of the massive amounts of waste that we generate. So we need to see a circular economy with a booming and productive recycling industry. We need to put the onus on companies that are creating this problem to take responsibility for fixing or for being part of fixing these problems. And I'll tell you now, if you make it cheaper for companies to change their behaviour rather than simply engage in the status quo, they will take that option. If you make companies pay for the end-of-life management of plastic, problem, uh, plastic products, for example, then it might become cheaper for them not to use that plastic in the first place. And that's what we want to see. We want, in fact, we not only want, but we need to see companies changing their behaviour. We need to see them phasing out of single-use plastics. Now we can do that at the corporate level, and we should do it at the corporate level. And we can also do it at the community level. And I want to give a shout out to uh, Ben Carney, uh, who uh, led uh, the campaign and the ultimate successful introduction of a ban on plastic bags in uh, the township of Coles Bay, one of Tasmania's premier tourist towns. And Ben, uh, as part of that community, had the conversations that he needed to have, built the community support that he needed to build, and ultimately it became the first town in the country to ban single-use plastic shopping bags. A small but extremely significant step that shows that we can do this if we're prepared to make the effort and to put in the work. So it is time, undoubtedly, to take far, far bigger steps than what the government is proposing in its legislation. It is time to, to get serious about addressing these problems. We owe it to nature. We owe it to all the beautiful creatures, whether they be um, you know, um, seabirds or aquatic mammals that are choking to death on uh, you know, plastic beer can holders uh, or who are ingesting dozens of plastic bags a day uh, and dying because their digestive systems can't cope with them. We owe it to nature to look after nature, but we also owe it 
to ourselves. We owe it to humanity and we owe it to all the people who believe that we should have a clean environment and that we should respect nature so that nature can continue to look after us. So let's end these small steps from the government and let's put in place a policy framework that actually would give us a chance at significantly addressing what is certainly a major problem that we are facing. And that's why the Greens amendments are so important, Senator Wish Wilson's amendments, because they show the pathway to the kind of leadership that we collectively need and that every person on this planet collectively needs so that we can get on top of one of the biggest environmental challenges facing humanity. Senator Paul. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Recycling and Waste Reduction Bill, but I must rise to speak about the protection of our lands and waters from waste. From our people, the connection we feel to country and waters can be difficult for settlers to understand. Our connection to country is about our identity as the first people of this continent. And our connection to country and water is about the interdependent relationship between us as people and our ancestral lands, seas, oceans and rivers. As our old people continue to teach us, if we look after country, country will look after us. Our relationship with country is sustained by our cultural knowledge, our traditions and the wisdom of our old people. Our people are not just from country, we are of country. Unlike the settlers to this country who felt that they could steal it, plant their colonial flags and claim these lands as their own, our people do not own the land. The land owns us, and that's why we look after it. To not know your country and its stories, songs and song lines, its healing places and places of cultural significance, causes our people pain and impacts our health, well-being and our identity. Our connection to country is our connection to our ancestors and their knowledge. It's this connection that allows our people to identify who they are, who their family is, who their mob are, who their ancestors and their elders and totems are, and guides our children on who will be. This is why country must be protected from logging, from the mass extinction currently underway and from waste and pollution. Our people never consented to our lands being taken or our oceans being choked with pollution. Before you fellas come, we cared for country for over 80,000 years. But today, 80 per cent of maritime debris in our waters is plastic rubbish. As a Gunai Gunditjmara mm. woman, both my countries have the most beautiful coastlines and beaches of anywhere in the world not just the best country, but in the whole world. Places that are now called the 90-mile beach, the Tambo and Mitchell rivers, Lake Centrance, Portland, Port Ferry and the beaches along the Great Ocean Road. These areas used to be pristine places that were abundant with food and shelter for our people. But studies have clearly shown that a majority of all plastic pollution found on the beaches in this country is produced and consumed locally. At the moment, we only recycle 16 per cent of plastic packaging. Recycling the rest ends up as waste or in rivers and oceans. When I heard this government was introducing a waste reduction bill, I thought, great, surely the government would do the right thing and ban single-use plastics like the many plastic straws and plastic cutlery choking our waters. Have you seen the story of the turtle that had a straw up his nose and the extreme excruciating pain that he went through to get that straw out of his nose? I thought, of course, they would be reducing plastic packaging and introducing really strong measures to reduce the amount of plastic entering our oceans. Surely the government would be mandating compostable recycling, but no. This bill does none of that because this government doesn't want to do the right thing. They just want to look like they're doing something. I'm not at all surprised that a government led by the marketing department is pulling a marketing stunt. 
I hope that for Christmas this year this government gets a little bit of shame as a present. When given the opportunity to introduce a once-in-a-decade waste and recycling laws, they just didn't even deal with plastic packaging. They tried. They just didn't try enough. The federal Labor government introduced a nationwide plan in, 20, in 2009 to build our local recycling industry and create a circular economy. None of these key, key policies have been acted on by this government. For the last three years, they have presided over bushfires, climate change, mass Order, extinction Senator and major Thorpe. waste crisis. You'll be crisis. in continuation when debate resumes. Questions without notice. Senator Chisholm. Oh, sorry, the mic. Senator, Senator Chisholm. <coughs> Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Under the Morrison government's current childcare scheme, a family with a full-time policeman and a physio working three days a week lose 91 cents in the dollar if the physio works the fourth and fifth day. Why is Mr Morrison refusing to support Labor's plan, which would see the same family more than $3,100 a, a year better off if they choose to work more hours? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Mr President, and, uh, and I thank the Senator for his question for the opportunity to highlight that our government, our side of politics, has taken childcare reform very seriously over recent years. Our reforms in terms of the application of the new childcare subsidy provided billions of dollars in additional support that was targeted, targeted to ensure that the more hours somebody works, the greater the number of hours of subsidised childcare they and their family are entitled to, and the less that they earn, the greater the rate of subsidy that they get. Now, it seems quite remarkable that the Labor Party seem to now be adopting a policy position that is all about providing higher rates of support in terms of the childcare subsidy to those earning higher levels of income. So, Mr. President, Mr. President, we absolutely want to make sure Order. that the childcare system works to support Australian families. And under our reforms, over 70 per cent of families have out-of-pocket costs of less than $5 an hour, and nearly a quarter are paying less than $2 an hour. Nearly a quarter are paying less than $2 per hour. And those families, Mr President, would be the lowest income Australian families. So we have targeted childcare subsidy support to give the greatest level of assistance to Australian families working the longest hours but earning the lowest amount of income. Now the question of course always is when the Labor Party comes along and says we're going to bed in the budget a whole lot of extra structural spending. Guess how they'll end up paying for it? Taxes? Higher taxes, no Order. doubt. Higher taxes. This will just be some little Labor trick where they pretend to give with one hand but take with the Order. other. Senator Birmingham. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Yes, Mr. President. Chloe from Chermside is a single mum who has been forced to say no to extra work because of the cost of childcare for her son. Why is the government blocking Queensland women like Chloe? from taking on extra work in a recession. Senator Birmingham. Well, thanks, Mr President. And I again draw attention to the figures that I just went through that, uh, that would, dependent of course upon Chloe's circumstances and Chloe's income, uh, see very high rates of subsidy provided for the childcare fees that might be incurred. But I note that the Senator hasn't tried to give any of those sorts of details. He's constructed an example that doesn't actually allow anybody to compare whether it could be an 80 per cent or an 85 per cent rate of subsidy that is being paid. Indeed, in special circumstances, in special circumstances the government pays even more than that. I hear the senators ask, where's the calculator? Well, indeed, people can go onto the relevant social services websites Order. and they can ascertain how much support they are going to get. Yes, childcare comes at a cost, but we subsidise that cost and we give the greatest support to those earning the lowest incomes. Order. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Thanks, Mr President. Why has the Morrison government budgeted $15 million for Mr Morrison's ad campaign about Australia's comeback, 
but included nothing in this year's budget to make childcare more affordable. Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, only the Labor Party could suggest that budgeting $9 billion for the childcare subsidy in 2020 21 was nothing. So we are budgeting $9 billion in expenditure to support childcare in this financial year alone. This is about $2 billion from memory, more than was being spent a couple of years ago prior to our reforms. So we came along as a government, we introduced reforms to create the childcare subsidy, we increased the rate of spending on childcare. That spending has now reached a point where in this financial year we will spend and invest $9 billion Order. to support the hardest working Australian families, to give the greatest support to those earning the least amount of money, and yet those opposite come in here and they pretend that $9 billion is nothing at all. Well, it's certainly order. not nothing Senator, at all. Bir Senator Birmingham, I've got Senator Keneally on a point of order. Uh, my point of order is relevance. The minister is almost through with his answer, and we've yet to hear about the $15 million comeback order. advertising Senator campaign Keneally, that the question Senator asked Keneally, about. Senator it was a very open-ended question. The minister is being directly relevant. Senator Birmingham, you have five seconds remaining. Senator Chisholm asked, why are we giving nothing to childcare? On this side, we think $9 billion is actually quite a lot of money. Order. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the state of the labour market following COVID-19 and how the Morrison government has supported Australians through this once-in-a-century pandemic to stay connected to the labour force and to find employment? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Fawcett for his question. And Mr. President, uh, as you know, sorry again, I'm Senator saying... Cash. Can you? We. Will, I thought we were going to have that looked at over the weekend. We've got the same microphone problem. You are blessed with a very loud voice, Senator Cash. But I'll ask you to lean into the next microphone, to, um, and we'll try and have that fixed overnight, Senator Cash. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I'm still just as loud. Um, COVID-19, as you know, has had an unprecedented impact uh, on the labour market. Uh, but new research that's been released by the National Skills Commission uh, on the Australian labour market shows that while the impact of COVID-19 has been unprecedented, there are signs of recovery and cause for optimism for all Australians. We have begun the long road to recovery. And in fact, we've seen 648,500 jobs return to the labour market since May. That is a good thing. Jobs are also returning in industries and occupations that have been impacted by COVID-19, but in particular the restrictions and the shutdowns. And what we're also seeing in regional Australia is job advertisements have been increasing by 17 0.6%. Mr President, in terms of the National Skills Commission and their report, it is critical to our understanding of the future of Australia's labour market. It shows where the new jobs will be created, but it also reinforces the Morrison government's work to make skills and vocational education uh, more flexible but also more relevant to actual labour market demand. In other words, we're actually training people to ensure that they have those skills to get into a job. Since the election, the coalition government, the Morrison government, we have focused uh, on improving Australia's vocational education and training system. And in fact, this year alone, we will now invest almost $7 billion in vocational education and training. We'll make the changes to this sector uh, to ensure that the training that Australians are undertaking is relevant and fit for purpose. And certainly, as we emerge from the economic impact of COVID-19, the government will utilise the National Skills Commission, which of course uh, we legislated, to further ensure that our skills sector is properly responding to actual labour market needs. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Minister, what has the National Skills Commission's research shown about which jobs are likely to see continued growth as we emerge from the economic impacts of COVID-19? 
Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And insights into future job opportunities are vital to support our economic recovery, but also to ensure that more Australians are able to get back into work as quickly as possible. And that's why, with the report that the National Skills Commission has released, it's highlighted the most resilient occupations in our labour market. This is good for people who are wondering what study or training they should undertake. Will they be entering one of those industries that has shown resilience despite COVID-19? And these occupations include, unsurprisingly, healthcare and social assistance, which have faced significant challenges as a result of COVID-19, uh, but also education and training, as well as mining and construction, and transport and warehousing. In terms of employment growth, it's expected to be in industries such as healthcare and social assistance, education and training, and professional scientific and technical services over the next five years. Uh, given the disruption caused by COVID-19 to the labour market, knowing that the Order. job you're training Senator for Cash, is going to be— time for the answer has expired. Senator Fawcett, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Minister, how will the research and work of the National Skills Commission ensure that the Job Trainer Fund is as targeted and focused as possible, ensuring that people receive training in the areas where there's actually demand for work? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr. President, as you'd be aware, uh, the Morrison government's $1 billion job trainer fund, this is a crucial component uh, of our record investment into vocational education and training, and it's also an integral part of the government's job maker plan. The co-investment with the states and territories, all the states and territories uh, came on board. It's all about providing free or low-cost uh, training uh, to job seekers and young people, including school leavers. The key to the training, though, that we have worked individually with the states and territories to determine what their individual labour market demand is, and the job trainer courses, the free or low-cost training, they actually reflect what is in demand in the states and territories' labour markets themselves. Um, our goal as a government is to ensure that Australians receive qualifications in areas of skills demand. In other words, they are training for where the jobs are. You can visit yourcareer.gov.au for more information about Job Trainer. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. As early as January 2017, when Mr Morrison was the Treasurer, the government was aware that up to 86 per cent of robo-debts were incorrect and needed to be reassessed. When did Mr Morrison first become aware that almost nine out of ten robo-debts were wrong? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Mr President. Well, I would refer the Senate to Senator Rustin's answers on these questions. <laughs> Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. <laughs> Order. <laughs> Senator Kitching, on my left, Senator Kitching. Senator O'Neill, Senator Kitching is on her feet. Senator Kitching. Thank you, Mr President. Nathan, who was called by a robo-debt debt collector three times a day, said his mental health plummeted and that, and I quote, sometimes they'd call and I'd tell them like, I can't deal with this anymore, I've been thinking about taking my life, and things like that. It didn't change anything. Why did Mr Morrison continue to pursue vulnerable Australians like Nathan when he knew his robo-debt scheme was flawed and potentially invalid? Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator, um, Senator for her question. The, uh, as Senator Rustin has made clear time and time again, uh, the government uh, is always willing to respond in confidence in relation to individual cases and to ensure that they are uh, treated appropriately and assessed and handled appropriately. When senators come in here with these sorts of questions, it's difficult to respond to the personal circumstances without the full details. However, in relation to all of these matters, the government has worked through them, has worked through the different, um, the different issues in relation to the debts that were raised, Senator and has Watt provided. On a, on, so, Senator Watt, on a point of order. On, on relevance, Mr. President, the question wasn't about Nathan's circumstances. The question was about why Mr. Morrison continued to pursue the robo debt program despite knowing of these problems. Okay, um, I've, I make the point again. Ministers can be directly relevant by being directly relevant to an assertion contained in a question. And while I allowed you to restate the question, Senator Watt, there, I think it's a stretch to say Senator Birmingham wasn't being directly relevant by addressing the first part and then going on to addressing the second part directly in the answer he was just giving. 
Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Now, the government has worked through these issues and, in doing so, has provided uh, payments that to the Senate is well aware of uh, to address them. Senator Kitching, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. David from Seaford was issued a robo debt variously calculated at $3,800, $4,088, $1,370, $1,500 before being reduced to zero. David says, and I quote, I think I could have been one of the people who died because of this. They nearly cost me my life. When the government was told in a department brief on 1 March 2017 that a third of robo debts had been reassessed and reduced to zero dollars, why did Mr Morrison insist on putting the lives of thousands of people like David at risk? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. Mr President, once again, uh, a number of these questions have been worked through. Direct questions to Senator Rustin, questions through Senate estimates processes, uh, and indeed, indeed what, uh, what I know has occurred over a period of time is the opposition tends to take one Order. AAT finding or one issue that might have been handed down and conflate that uh, as something that provided conclusive proof in Order. relation to all matters of this program. Order. This program obviously had, had issues that have been dealt with and have resulted in repayments appropriately Senators being made Watt where necessary. And Senator Scar. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Will the minister update the Senate on the importance of Australia's relationship with Southeast Asia and the ways in which the government is strengthening our relationship with ASEAN countries? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Scar uh, for his question. Mr President, the government's strong view is that ASEAN is at the heart of Australia's vision for an open, inclusive and resilient Indo-Pacific region in which sovereign states are able to make independent choices. It's a vision which aligns closely with the principles set out in the ASEAN outlook for the Indo-Pacific. And we've continued to deepen our engagement with our Southeast Asian neighbours. Indeed, at the ASEAN Australia Summit uh, last month, the Prime Minister announced a major investment of over $500 million in economic development and security measures to support Southeast Asia's recovery from COVID-19. It's a package which aligns with ASEAN's priorities under the ASEAN outlook. Maritime, connectivity, sustainable development, economic cooperation. We welcome the agreement also to increase the tempo of our leaders' meetings to annual summits, because that opens up a new chapter in the ASEAN-Australia strategic partnership. We've also signed a strategic partnership with Thailand, facilitated the entry into force of the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement with Indonesia, and agreed on a plan of action with Vietnam to deliver on our strategic partnership. Uh, I also met with Vietnam's ambassador uh, to Australia last week and took the opportunity to particularly thank Vietnam for their leadership of ASEAN during a very difficult year concerning the impact of COVID-19 uh, in particular. And also virtually last week with my Malaysian counterpart on Friday, Minister Hishmuddin Hussain, and thanked Malaysia for their role as our ASEAN country coordinator. Mr President, ASEAN is clearly more important than ever as we deal with the health and economic challenges that have been brought upon us by COVID-19. It is galvanising the region's response to the pandemic and particularly playing a central role in shaping how our region will emerge from the crisis. A strong ASEAN is critical to the recovery and the future prosperity of Australia and the Order. region. Senator That's Payne, why we stand together the in the challenges we face. Expired. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister advise how the government is continuing its strong engagement with South East Asian partners, our South East Asian family, during COVID-19? Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And again, I thank Senator Scar. Uh, because there have been constraints imposed upon us by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, but we have, of course, continued our strong political engagement and dialogue with our partners in the region, as well as the Prime Minister's recent virtual attendance at the ASEAN Australia Summit this month uh, the, uh, and also the East Asia Summit. The government has signed the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement with 14 Indo-Pacific countries under the leadership of the Trade Minister, Minister Birmingham. I've met with all of my ASEAN counterparts together 
four times since June, including a special ASEAN Australia Foreign Ministers meeting on 30 June to discuss our shared COVID-19 response, as well, of course, as the annual East Asia Summit Foreign Ministers meeting and the ASEAN-related meetings, both in September. Uh, notwithstanding limited travel this year, I visited uh, uh, Singapore in October, affirming the strength of our relationship, and Brunei in February. Our continued engagement across government demonstrates our strong commitment Order. to this region. Senator Payne. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Will the minister outline the Mekong Australia program and the ways in which it will support this important region within Southeast Asia? Senator Payne. Thanks, Mr. President. We know that a prosperous and resilient Mekong is an important part of a strong Southeast Asia region, and that's why we'll invest in a new $232 million Mekong Australia program to support economic integration and development uh, in the Mekong sub-region. That package announced by the Prime Minister includes investments for economic integration and development, high-quality infrastructure, support for our region's emerging security needs and for the development of maritime resources. The key elements Mr. President, include providing scholarships for emerging leaders, creating even more valuable people-to-people -people links, strengthening cybersecurity and critical technology capabilities, new funding to boost jobs and growth as part of the Vietnam-Australia Enhanced Economic Engagement Strategy, and opening a new liaison office in Naypyidaw in Myanmar in 2021. We're deeply committed to working with Mekong countries to manage the health and economic impacts of COVID-19 and to support economic integration and regional Order. development. Yeah. Senator Seawitt. Mr. President, Mr. President, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. The 2019-20 bushfires resulted in, a, in about 450 deaths due to direct in injury and air pollution exposure and sent thousands of people to hospital emergency departments with respiratory and heart problems. November was the hottest November on record. Leading health bodies, including the AMA, the Australian Nurses and Midwifery Federation, Australian College of Nursing and a majority of peak medical bodies, have declared climate change a health emergency. Will the government declare the climate crisis a health emergency? Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I uh, thank Senator Seawitt for her question. And Senator Seawitt, uh, you would be aware uh, climate change is a global challenge for all countries, uh, including Australia, and all of us need to take action to mitigate and adapt to its impacts. Uh, as part of the Australian government's response, uh, the Australian government is focused on developing a sustainable and responsive health system. You have asked the Minister for Health the question, uh, with a range of programs which can be expanded or operationalised to respond to emerging pressures, including those that are climate related. Indeed, the Australian government released its National Climate Resilience and Adaptation Strategy in 2015. And I'm sure you are aware, Senator Seawitt, that the strategy recognises that in Australia, national and sub-national governments, businesses, households and communities all have different but important roles in managing climate risks, including those that impact on health and wellbeing. The National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework, which, as you know, was released in April of 2019, provides the big picture for the work that government, industries, business, not-for-profits, communities and individuals in Australia must do together so that we can live successfully with these hazards and the hazards that you have referred to uh, in your question to me for decades to come. In terms of the practical steps that the government is taking, uh, we are working with the states and territories to ensure that Australia's capacity to respond to the health impacts of climate change are appropriate and effective. And they include the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee, which has, as you are aware, identified climate change as a health protection priority. Uh, the committee has in fact asked its National Health Emergency Standing Committee to develop a national heat health framework. Senator C, what a supplementary question. Thank you. The World Health Organisation calls the climate crisis one of the greatest th th threats to our health. The Grattan Institute and the MJA Lancet Countdown have called it the greatest health risk facing future generations. Why doesn't Australia's long-term national health plan address the climate crisis? 
Senator Cash. Uh, well, again, Senator Seward, I believe I've just taken you through some of the steps that the government is undertaking uh, in response to the issues that you have raised. As I've stated, the government in uh, 2015 released its National Climate Resilience and Adaptation Strategy. Uh, in April 2019, the government released uh, the National Disaster Risk Reduction Framework. Uh, in addition to that, as I've said, the government is working with the states and territories uh, in particular to ensure that Australia's capacity to respond to the health impacts of climate change are appropriate and effective. Uh, what I was unable to say to you uh, in answer to your primary question was that the Australian Health Protection Principle Committee uh, has also tasked the Environmental Health Standing Committee uh, with reviewing the science on the health effects of prolonged smoke exposure. You raised smoke exposure uh, in your primary question. Uh, and in fact, they published a statement on 7 August 2020. Uh, the government is also taking action in direct response to Order. the health impacts Cash, of the 1920 the bushfire crisis. Expired. Senator C, what a final supplementary question. Thank you. Leading health researchers and health bodies are urging an accelerated response to reducing emissions and preparing health systems. Does the government agree that the net zero emissions should be achieved by 2035 and that it's essential if we are to protect the health of future generations? Good question. Senator Cash. Uh, well, Senator Seward, I refer you to the incredibly eloquent answers uh, that the Leader of the Government in the Senate gives every time a question on this is raised. Uh, the Government is committed uh, to achieving this as soon as possible, and that is why we have put in place uh, the practical actions that we are taking to ensure that we respond to climate change, which, as I've said, is a global challenge uh, for all countries, including Australia. Senator so Seward, the difference between those of us on the government side of the chamber uh, and, unfortunately, those in the Australian Greens is that we are putting in place practical actions to ensure that we tackle climate change. You, for some reason, just don't seem to like the practical actions that we are putting in place. And yet, to date, the practical actions that we have put in place are being successful. Senator Billick. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. The Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with a Disabilities report into COVID-19 found that the Morrison government was responsible for significant failings from the onset of the pandemic. The Royal Commission heard evidence that a disabled woman was bedridden for nine days, surviving only on muesli bars with no help for meals or care. How many Australians living with disability were left behind by the Morrison government and forced to survive without meals or care? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Billick for her question um, on what is a very important issue, and that is the respect yeah. with which uh, yeah. we treat all Australians, but particularly those that live with disability. And for that reason, the government welcomed the interim report from the Disability Royal Commission. Um, because we believe that everybody, absolutely everybody, but most particularly the government, um, has an absolute huge role to play in stamping out violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability. Um, and so we thank the Royal Commission for the work it does. Um, we set up the Royal Commission because we wanted to shine a spotlight on what was going on to make sure that um, some of the, the actions of the past didn't happen into the future. But, um, I would also acknowledge in this chamber, and hope everybody else would acknowledge in this chamber, that um, this year we saw a once-in-a-century pandemic hit our country, um, and we acted as, as quickly as we could um, with every resource that was available to government to be able to support all Australians to make sure that, in the first instance, we uh, put in place the protections, the health protections that they needed. Um, look, we acknowledge that the the pandemic was traumatic for for all Australians, but it must have been, and I'm sure it clearly was, um, particularly traumatic for those people who live with disability, Senator yeah. to Steele John, um, and, and I absolutely acknowledge that. But I just want to make sure that I take this opportunity to assure um, all Australians, but particularly Australians who live with disability or who um, look after and care for people with disability, that um, this government absolutely has them foremost in their mind, front of mind. And, um, 
I mean, I'm happy to go through a, a, the list of consultations that I've had with the disability sector over the last nine months, and I, I thank the amazing uh, work of, uh, of those, uh, particularly the disability advocates, which has been an extraordinarily hard time for them. And I absolutely congratulate them for the engagement they've had with the government to make sure Order, that we Senator look after Ruston, people with disability. Senator Ruston, time for the answers expired. Senator Billick, a supplementary question. Thank you. The Royal Commission also heard evidence that another woman who went for four days without a support worker amid fears she and her husband had been exposed to COVID-19 said, and I quote, I just couldn't get PPE anywhere. I saw Scott Morrison saying PPE was being provided and I was like, hello, where's mine? There was none. How many Australians living with a disability were left behind by the Morrison government when it failed to provide them with the PPE they needed to stay safe? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, certainly um, one of the things that was absolutely a priority was to make sure that we moved with great speed so that nobody got left behind and nobody was forgotten during this pandemic. But we quickly forget on the other side about how extraordinary the circumstances were that we found ourselves in in March this year. Um, and can I also acknowledge the, the respectful and collaborative way that those at the other end of the chamber sought to work with me to provide me with information so that I knew what was going on in the sector. They didn't seek to come in here and publicise it. And I acknowledge um, Senator Steele John particularly, um, who picked up the phone regularly to raise issues with me of great concern to him, and we did our best to make sure that we resolved those. But I'd also point out, just as a matter of some interest, that the Royal Commission did Order. not speak to probably what I consider the two most senior public Order. servants. They did not speak to the Deputy Secretary of Disability Order. or the CEO of the NDIA to get more information Order, about the Senator issues. Rustin. Noise levels getting a little bit loud. Colleagues, Senator Billick, final Thank you. Supplementary and if question. that's your best work, I'm a bit worried. Under the Morrison government, vulnerable Australians, from those in residential aged care to those living with disabilities, have been left neglected and abandoned by Mr. Morrison. Why is Mr. Morrison leaving Australians living with a disability behind and failing to keep them safe? Senator Rustin. Well, I would completely reject the premise of, uh, of the question that has just been asked of me, because I can assure you that the Morrison government has worked tirelessly to make sure that no Australian would be left behind. But as we recognise the situation that we all found ourselves in this year, uh, it was a, it was a once-in-a-century pandemic. However, I mean, I can tell you what I did as the minister who has broader responsibility for disability, as opposed to the NDIS, um, that I worked with the uh, the disability sector. Um, I had numerous meetings, and I, I'd like to shout out Ben Gortland, who's our disability discrimination commissioner, for the extraordinary hard work that they did, along with the advocacy groups, to make sure that the voices of people with disability were heard during this time so that we could respond to the specific needs, because um, clearly every Australian um, was faced with a situation that they had never seen before, and um, we worked very, very well with the disability sector, and I acknowledge the huge amount of support they Order. gave me. Senator Rustin. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. My question is addressed to Senator Rustin, representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia. The Australian government used the weakest gas laws in the world to attract foreign oil and gas companies to exploit Australia's offshore deposits of natural gas. The government now receives approximately $200 million a year for the offshore natural gas taken from the northwest shelf, which drives tens of billions of dollars of exports, including to China, where we supply 10 per cent of their total energy requirements. Failure to get a fair payment for our offshore gas represents a gift of billions of dollars a year to foreign oil and gas companies, money better spent on Australians. What has stopped the government implementing the single recommendation of the 2017 Callaghan report so Australia can be fairly paid for its offshore gas? The Minister representing the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Hanson for her question. And at the outset, can I acknowledge um, you know, your long-standing and passionate commitment to ensuring that Australians are the beneficiary of our nation's endowment of natural resources. Um, and the government has worked very hard to strengthen the integrity of the Petroleum Resource and Rent Tax 
by addressing the design issues that were contained within the Callaghan um, re re independent review. In fact, uh, the government brought down its response to the Callaghan review on 2 November uh, 2018, uh, and in that, um, we then worked to make sure that we implemented the, uh, you know, many of the recommendations that were contained in that review. Um, you know, things like uh, reducing the uplift rates that apply to carried forward expenditure. Uh, we've also set up a process to uh, address the remaining recommendations relating to the gas transfer pricing uh, for LNG projects. Uh, indeed, legislation giving effect to the key changes came into force on 1 July 2019 and will raise an additional $6 billion over the next decade. We are absolutely committed to supporting the resource sector, which has invested over $600 billion in Australian projects over the last decade. Um, but in doing so, we need to make sure that we strike the balance between uh, making sure that, that investors around the world know that Australia's doors are open for investment, but at the same time making sure that the national interest uh, is being realised by making sure Australians are the beneficiary of our resources. So, Foreign direct investment has been an absolutely enduring feature of our national story, um, and oil and gas industry is one of those industries that has been absolutely at the forefront um, of making sure that we are able to prosper as a nation by realising the value of the resources that we have in the ground, whether it be under our depressial soils or under the sea. Uh, and we will make sure that the national interest is always served. Order. Senator Hanson, a supplementary question. Minister, I, I understand it's not your portfolio, but that response is, I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's not a response at all. The government advised Papua New Guinea on its gas laws. They got a better deal from the same gas giants operating on the northwest shelf. If we can, if we can help PNG negotiate fair payment for natural gas, gas why can't we do it ourselves? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and I would thank Senator Hanson for, for her follow-up question. Um, well, I believe that the Australian government, through a number of regimes, has always sought to make sure that Australians are the beneficiaries of the resources that belong to all Australians, um, and that's why um, you know we made sure that with the resource, uh, the petroleum resource rent tax. Uh, that was brought in by those opposite um, back in 1987 uh, to make sure that we put in place a regime um, around Australia to make sure that these projects were um, providing benefit to Australians, which most importantly included um, increasing the taxation revenue that, the Australia, that Australia was able to achieve. It. I mean, in, uh, as an example, the most recent data available from the Australian Tax Office uh, says that the resources sector paid approximately $11.4 billion in company tax in 2017-18, and I'm advised that in 2018 uh, Woodside alone uh, uh, paid 50, $555 million in Australian corporate income tax. Order, Senator Rustin. Senator Hanson, a final supplementary question. Thank you very much. Um, it's estimated that we actually uh, export about $55 billion worth of gas. We actually have um, Chevron, Exxon Mobil and um, Shell actually only have about $360 billion in tax credits. We're not going to get tax out of them. So, and the Reserve Bank says Australians need to buy shares in foreign gas companies or work for them to get any benefit for Australian-owned offshore gas. When will the government act Order, in the best Senator interest Hanson. of Australians and Senator change Rustin. laws? Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, well, uh, Senator Hanson, I'm actually not aware of the specific piece of advice you refer to um, from the Reserve Bank. Um, but one thing I can advise the Chamber is that resource companies operating in Australia, um, in our mineral and petroleum industries, are subject to corporate income tax. And as I said, in 2017-18 alone, $11.4 billion came into the Australian government coffers uh, as a result of the taxation that was paid. Um, by the mineral and petroleum industries. Um, royalty revenues also are received by state and territory governments uh, for onshore mineral and petroleum production. And my understanding is that in the years 18-19, approximately $14 billion was realised by state and territory governments um, in royalty revenues from these types of projects. So, um, 
maintaining a stable investment environment, um, including through our taxation system, is absolutely vital in ensuring we can continue to prosecute our resources for the benefit Order. of all Australians. Senator Rustin. Yeah. Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Defence. Can the Minister update the Senate on what support Defence has provided to international partners across the Indo-Pacific during COVID-19? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Well, thank you very much, Mr President. And I also thank Senator Abetz for that question. And I also thank you for your enduring support for our men and women in uniform and also for defence. Building a stronger Australia post-pandemic rests on a secure and stable Indo-Pacific. That's why Defence is supporting not only our own national recovery from COVID-19, but also the recovery of our regional friends and partners. We have already reorientated funding through the government's defence cooperation programs to assist our regional partners deal with COVID-19. This is in addition to the significant support that the ADF have provided on Operation COVID-19 Assist. Now, over 10,000 ADF members have been contributing to state and territory responses since uh, the beginning of this year. But in the South Pacific, our support has focused on very targeted country-specific priorities. This includes planning, health, logistics, vehicle and asset maintenance, the delivery of personal PPE and also supplies. In Southeast Asia, Australia has supported regional defence forces to respond to the pandemic. A couple of examples include a $2 million package of personal protective equipment to Indonesia's armed forces to support their assistance and their ability to deal with their own nation's COVID-19 response. Uh, secondly, a second example is a total of $3 million of assistance to the armed forces of the Philippines to enable their ongoing support to infectious disease, disease wards across the country and support their own armed forces personnel. And in the Indian Ocean region, we provided personal protective equipment for the defence forces of Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and also the Maldives. Defence stands firmly with its regional partners during these most challenging of times for us all. Senator Pett, a supplementary question. Uh, yes, Mr President. I thank the minister for that answer and ask the following. Can the minister update the Senate on the continuation of defence regional operations and activities during COVID-19? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Again, thank you very much, Mr President, and Senator Abetz for the question. Uh, throughout COVID-19, one of the proudest things that our nation has seen is the fact that the ADF have not missed a beat. Yes, we've had to adapt work practices, but we have not missed a beat throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. And during that time, Australia has continued to strengthen its military-to-military -military engagement with our partners, partners who share our vision for a stable, prosperous and rules-based Indo-Pacific. This is despite the many challenges facing us all with COVID-19. For example, our regional presence deployment, which ran from July to September, was the largest ever ADF deployment to the Indo-Pacific, and we exercised with 11 nations in total. Navy has also conducted seven separate maritime activities with Japan alone this year. Australia participated in the maritime exercise Malabar last month with our close partners, India, Japan and the United States. And those exercises continue. Senator Keneally. Oh, sorry, Senator Abetz. Final supplementary question. I've miscounted. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister update the Senate on how Defence is maintaining close engagement with Australia's Pacific family during COVID-19? Senator Abetz. Sorry, Senator. I'm having a bad run today. <laughs> Senator Reynolds. I can answer my own question. <laughs> Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President, and I'm sure Senator Bretz is very capable of answering his own questions. Uh, but in all seriousness, Defence is continuing to support our Pacific family to address the health and economic challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic. Work continues apace with Papua New Guinea, Fiji and Vanuatu on significant defence infrastructure projects in those nations, projects that enhance security and also provide much-needed economic stimulus and local employment opportunities in those nations. These projects, those projects in those three countries alone are expected to create over 350 jobs in Papua New Guinea, 555 jobs in Fiji and 178 jobs in Vanuatu, with many more to come. Defence continues to deliver New Guardian-class patrol boats throughout COVID-19, 
eight to date to regional partners under the Pacific Maritime Security Program. And in fact, Tonga received its second Guardian class patrol boat during a COVID safe handover at Henderson in October. This Order. program Senator fundamentally Reynolds, supports time for the regional has sovereignty. Expired. Senator Keneally. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, Minister Payne. Laura, who is stranded in Spain and wants to come home, has had her status changed by DFAT to, quote, not seeking to return to Australia, despite making it clear to a caller from DFAT that she was trying to return as soon as possible and had flights booked in coming weeks. She has said, and I quote, I can't shake the feeling the reclassifications on the DFAT portal are a cynical drive to deliver the government a Christmas miracle. Why isn't the Prime Minister setting up a national quarantine facility at Learmonth or other locations so stranded Australians can get home before Christmas, as he promised, instead of cooking the books to make it look like they don't want to be home by Christmas? The Minister of Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, thanks, Senator Kinley, for her question. And absolutely reject any suggestion that members of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade or any other public servants who are engaged in the consultation with Australians about their current status are cooking the books, to use her pejorative term, Mr. President. Order. Let me be very clear: DFAT will Order not remove any right. Australians from its registration database without their consent. I am not familiar with the specific example to which Senator Keely, Keneally has referred, but I will undertake to uh, take details from her uh, after question time and follow that up. What we have done, Mr President, is to work with Services Australia to contact registered Australians to ensure that the information we have in our database is up to date and correct. Having detailed information assists us with planning for facilitated commercial flights. That includes the Qantas flight, Mr. President, that arrived in Hobart yesterday from New Delhi. It also helps us to prioritise vulnerable Australians within the caps on incoming passenger arrivals. I don't know how those opposites suggest that we actually manage this process without having the most current information, Mr. President, without having up-to-date data from Australians. We are in the middle of a global pandemic, Mr. President, and people's circumstances do and are changing very quickly. Within the registration database, there are different status fields related to Australians' intentions to return. We will only change their status on their behalf based on information that has been provided to the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And as I said, we will not remove Australians from our registration database without their consent. Mr President, this is a very intensive process to try to support as many Australians as we can. Since the 18th of September, over 43,800 Australians have returned from overseas. That includes more than 17,000 Australians Order. registered Senator with DFAT. Payne, of which time for the answer has expired. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. It has been 80 days since the Prime Minister promised the 26,000 stranded Australians on DFAT's list that they would be home by Christmas. Only 17,000 on that list have come home. Given the Prime Minister only has three days to deliver on his promise and bring the remaining stranded Australians on DFAT's list as of the 18th of September home by Christmas, how many of those stranded Australians will not make it home by Christmas? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, as Senator Keneally has observed, and as I said in my previous answer, over 43,800 Australians have returned from overseas, which includes more than 17,000 Australians registered with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And of those, over 3,700 were vulnerable, Mr. President. We have been seeking information from those Australians uh, to ensure that we are able to assist them with the most up-to-date and timely information. Since the 23rd of October, we have facilitated 13 commercial flights, returning 1,847 passengers. In the last four weeks alone, Mr. President, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has made over 30,000 offers of places on flights to Australians registered overseas. This is a very complex process process to assist Australians who are in very difficult circumstances in many cases. I absolutely acknowledge that, Mr President. But since the 18th of September,
September, at least 43,000 Australians Order. have been Senator able to Payne, return from time overseas. Time has expired. Senator Keneally, final supplementary question. Why is it that Mr Morrison prioritises flying his mate, former Finance Minister Matthias Cormann, around Europe to the tune of $4,300 an hour, while tens of thousands of Australians are left behind overseas by his government? Senator Payne. Mr President, as I understand it, and we are grateful for that support, those opposites support the very important campaign to seek the election of Matthias Cormann to lead the OECD at a time Mr. President, when the world needs strong leadership such as that that Mr Cormann would deliver. The OECD has never been led by anybody from our region, Mr. President, but it does beg, beggar the imagination Mr. President, than those opposite would seek to conflate their cheap political point with the important process of getting Australians back to Order. Australia. And I would suggest, Mr President, that the effort that the consular officers of the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, that the effort of officials are making to return Australians literally in, in every capital where Australians are located and to support them is a very, very focused and conscientious one, Mr President. But we are operating in the middle of a pandemic, Mr President. We are operating with quarantine caps, we are operating with flight restrictions, and we Order. have returned Senator over 43,800 for Australians has expired. Supply... Order on my left and my right. Senator Dean Smith. Much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Could the Minister advise the Senate how the Morrison government's health response to COVID-19 is helping to underpin our economic recovery? and secure Australia's future. The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Smith for his question. Mr President, uh, we know that around the world, globally, COVID-19 uh, is continuing to spread. Globally, we have now reached 66.4 million COVID-19 cases, and sadly, uh, we have lost 1.5 million lives. Uh, we see that outside of Australia, the challenge of COVID-19 is significant and it is tragic. Uh, but when we look at the situation here in Australia, compared with other developed nations, uh, we are in Australia in a very good position. In the United States, for example, the death rate is 23.9 times what we have seen in Australia. In the United Kingdom, the death rate is over 25 times what we have seen in Australia. Uh, so our success in managing the health crisis uh, as a country and as a government has built the foundation for our economic recovery. Uh, we've had real challenges and genuine loss, but in terms of the outcome that we are currently seeing in Australia, it is certainly one uh, which other parts of the world envy. In Australia, we have now had 27,965 confirmed cases of COVID-19. Uh, and sadly, 908 deaths. Uh, as of 4 p.m. yesterday, we have had zero cases of community transmission in the past 24 hours, and certainly uh, that is a good thing. In terms of our response uh, to COVID-19, more than $18.5 billion has been committed to support the emergency COVID-19 health response. Uh, as a government, as you know, we took early action to close the borders and institute quarantine arrangements. We've established 147 GP uh, respiratory clinics, and we've now conducted more than 10.1 million tests in Australia since the pandemic commenced. Senator Smith, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister explain how the testing capacity of Australia supported this health outcome, which is enabling our economic comeback? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Senator Smith. And certainly. Uh, in terms of the testing, as I've said, Australia has now conducted over 10.1 million COVID-19 tests. Uh, this has indeed been a critical uh, component of our health success and our ability to track, trace and, as we've seen by the statistics uh, that I've referred the Senate to, contain the COVID-19 virus. Uh, in terms of the work that our health agencies uh, have undertaken to build testing capacity, it is quite remarkable, uh, and certainly we congratulate them. When you consider that in January of this year, 
there was no such thing as a COVID-19 test. So when you look at the work of our health agencies, the fact that Australia has now conducted in excess of 10.1 million tests, uh, they, certainly, they certainly deserve our thanks. Uh, Mr President, we've also taken a number of steps to ensure that we could build this capacity, including putting in place Medicare funding for COVID-19 tests and sourcing the materials Order, needed Cash, to keep our testing supplies. Expired. Senator Smith, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. How will the Morrison government's approach to securing and rolling out a COVID-19 vaccine ensure that Australians are safe and position our economy for recovery from a COVID-19 recession? Senator Cash. Um, well, Mr. President, when you look at the situation in Australia today, and certainly compared to uh, the rest of the world, um, it enables us to take precautions when it comes to rolling out the COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, while there are rapid rollouts, and we've certainly seen them um, announced last week around the world, uh, the situation here in Australia uh, is quite different. In fact, it's quite unique. Locally, the Therapeutic Goods Administration has given a priority assessment to three different vaccines. The TGA is currently assessing all of the available medical evidence of these vaccines to verify that they are indeed uh, safe for use in Australia. The safety of the vaccine program is, of course, our top priority as a government. Uh, we've made a deliberate decision to diversify uh, our vaccine portfolio with a range of vaccines and all of the different data. Uh, the rollout of the Pfizer vaccine in the United Kingdom uh, will provide us with additional information to assess the safety of the rollout of the vaccine in Order. Australia. Senator Cash. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Mr President. My question this afternoon is to the Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. A report out today from the Brotherhood of St Lawrence states that youth employment was, and I quote, already, already stubbornly high before COVID. Can the minister confirm the report's finding that one in three young Australians are unable to find any work or don't have enough hours of work to make ends meet? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President, uh, and thanks, Senator, for the question. And as I said in the chamber here last week, the youth unemployment rate at 15.6 per cent is too high. Uh, that's why this government has invested so much, which we have been criticised for by the opposition, uh, in measures to support younger Australians to get back to work, Mr President. Uh, in fact, in, in some of those measures, Mr President, the opposition has actually voted against those measures in this place, Mr President. Uh, and, and so, Mr. President, we recognised that the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic was going to be significant on younger Australians, Mr. President. And so that's why, as we've worked our way through the COVID pandemic, and in the budget that we released just a few weeks ago, we had such a significant effort that was focused towards getting younger Australians back to work, Mr. President. Mr. President, we invested four billion dollars, Mr. President in the job maker hiring credit, Mr President. Mr President, we invested a um, significant amount of money to provide a 50 per cent wage subsidy for apprentices who were starting a new apprenticeship, new apprentices in businesses, or recommencing. Mr President, we want to keep younger Australians connected with their employers, uh, and we want to provide incentives for employers to employ younger Australians because we know the longer term effects of unemployment for younger Australians have a significant impact on their financial capacity over a period of time. Mr. Well, Mr. President, I'll take the interjection. And that's exactly how I started my answer. The unemployment rate at 15.6 per cent is too high. I have acknowledged that, Mr. President. We've just been through, we've got, just been through an, uh, a pandemic, Mr. President, a global pandemic, which is having a disproportionate impact on younger Australians, Mr President, and so that's why this government has invested so heavily in measures to assist Order, younger Australians Senator Colbeck, to get Senator Pratt, a supplementary question. How many young Australians could have been spared from the unemployment queues if the Morrison government had not excluded so many of them from JobKeeper? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, the measures that we've put in place to assist younger Australians back into work are just not about one single measure. We have invested in a number of measures to assist 
employers to take on younger Australians. We were criticised for focusing too much on younger Australians in our budget only a few weeks ago, Mr. President, by those on the other side, Mr. President. They forget what they were saying Order. just a few weeks ago, Mr. President, when they were criticising our budget for being so heavily focused on younger Australians and assisting younger Australians to get back into work and all of the programs that we put into place, to Mr. President. We make no apology for focusing on younger Australians to get back to work. We recognise, as I said just a moment ago, Mr. President, that the impact on younger Australians who, who don't have work when they're young uh, is over a longer period of time and more significant. And we're doing, we will do everything that we can to assist the employers to get younger people Order, back into Senator work. Colbeck. Senator Pratt, a final supplementary question. How many young Australians are underemployed, and when does the government predict that the number will drop back to pre-pandemic levels? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, as the many measures that we've put in place to support younger Australians to get back into work, the, the unemployment rate will continue to, to improve. In fact, in some states it has improved over the, the recent period of announcement. Mr. President. So, In my home state of Tasmania, for example, uh, the, the youth unemployment rate actually order. reduced Senator over Keneally, the last report on point period. of order. Uh, point of order is relevant. The question the minister is providing an answer about unemployment. The question was actually about underemployment. It asked specifically how many young Australians are underemployed. I ask you to uh, direct the minister to be relevant to the question. This was um, I, this is where the test order. This is this is this is where the test of direct relevance, in my view, needs to be much more strictly applied than the test of relevance. It was a specific question that asked for a number without any what I'd call loaded or pejorative phrases. So to be directly relevant, in my view, the minister needs to address the issue of what was raised in the question uh, because it was specific and um, factual in nature. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. President. And as, I was, as I said, the measures that we put in place in the budget are designed to increase employment in younger Australians, okay. to get younger Australians back to work and to encourage employers, specifically, specifically encourage employers to employ younger Australians. And we will continue to focus in that area because we understand what an important order. part of the economy is. Senator Colbeck. Of Senator Keneally on a point of order. Thank you, and I acknowledge your ruling. And I realise the minister only has 14 seconds left, so we would appreciate if he could answer the question: How many young Australians are underemployed? Um, on this particular issue, Senator Colbeck, I, I am going to ask that you to come to the question um, that was factual in nature, uh, because there has been a period of time to comment more broadly. Um, and there was no political content to the question. Senator Colbeck, or have you concluded your answer? No. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. As I've said a number of times today, the number of people who are unemployed, and I'll add to that the number of young people who are underemployed, is too large. That is why we're investing so Order. significantly, Order. Mr. President. Order. Senator Colbeck. Senator Keneally. Thank you. Uh, I acknowledge your previous rulings about the relationship between unemployment and underemployment, but the minister is again talking about unemployment. This question is, as you have pointed out, quite specific. How many young Australians are underemployed? We asked the minister in the last five seconds to answer the question. I'm, uh, order. The minister did mention. I'll answer the point of order when there's silence. It's only Monday, everyone. Uh, now, on the point of order, Senator Keneally, the minister did mention underemployment then, as you got to your feet. I did hear him talk about both. However, I have not had to ask a minister to stop answering a question, but when I have a specific question that says how many are and when will it return, that is factual in nature without any political loading or phrasing in the question, that requires an answer to be directly relevant. A directly relevant answer is not a broad commentary on the topic. So, 
I'm going to remind ministers of that because I've always said if questions are specific in nature without political phrasing, then directly relevant is a very strict test. Where questions actually include arguable phrases and loaded terminology, ministers are allowed to respond in kind. But this was a very specific question about how many and when shall it return without loading, and I'm happy to be corrected if the Hansard shows me otherwise. So I ask the minister to be very specific. Ministers always have the ability to take it on notice. And we have five seconds remaining. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, and the rate will return to previous levels as the measures that we have put order. in place well, come to pass. Firstly, I'm going to take the point of order, but Senator Keneally, he was talking about the timing of the rate of, of when the rate would return. That was directly relevant. That was actually the phrasing of the second part of the question. Dude, I, I cannot be, instruct the minister how to answer a question. Senator Keneally? Thank you, Mr. President. And noting your previous ruling and your comments and your advice to the minister that he take it on notice. That wasn't my advice. I said ministers have the your option, Senator Keneally. Your observation that the minister could take it on notice, given that the minister has not advised the House, the Chamber this is, of the Senator number. Senator Keneally, this isn't a point of order. This is not a point of order, Senator Keneally. I would ask Senator Keneally, this is not a point of order. There's a time after question time. The minister was being directly relevant after my final ruling there, talking about timing. The clock time ran out. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. Will I ask, and indeed particularly invite the question of the opposition if they wish to place further questions on notice? Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator McAllister. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. And I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Birmingham to the question asked by Senator Chisholm. It's hard to imagine what would actually provoke this government to meaningfully respond to women's economic interests, and in particular the significance and importance of Australian women having access to the labour market and consequently developing their own economic and financial independence. Because the true meaning of independence is the ability to find your way out of circumstances not of your choosing, to make real choices in the knowledge that you have the economic resources to support you, and the indifference to women's labour market participation, the indifference to their economic interests, the indifference to their wealth, the indifference to their super is absolutely remarkable. This question on this occasion was about childcare, and for many families the cost of childcare is far too high. Childcare fees in Australia are amongst the highest in the OECD, and in fact our costs as a proportion of income are only eclipsed by a handful of other countries. And it comes at a cost and it shows in our statistics, because high childcare fees are not only a hit to household budgets but they act as a very, very significant barrier for parents, especially women, to return to work. And the issue is that the childcare subsidy interacts with the personal tax system and the family tax benefit to mean that many mothers, many mothers actually pay, actually pay if they take on additional hours and many, many more lose most of the additional income that they would obtain through working those hours. Women are being forced to, withdraw, to reduce their working hours, missing out on career opportunities and advancement, missing out on superannuation, missing out on income. Women need to balance earning enough money to afford these very high childcare fees, but not so much that the childcare subsidy plummets and makes the experience of work financially pointless. And the impact of this was shared by one young mother recently who said, realising it made more financial sense to work four days rather than five felt like an absolute blow. At no point did we consider my husband dropping down for four days. He was in a secure job and his employer would not consider this. I, on the other hand, being a mum returning from leave, is nearly expected to be the one to request part-time employment. And that young mum isn't alone, because her story is borne out again and again and again in the data. So data from the ABS shows that of parents with a child younger than five, 
only 64 per cent of women were in the workforce compared with 95 per cent of men. And of those mothers who do work, 60 per cent of those are working part-time compared to only 7 per cent of fathers. Even when children go to school, women continue to work part-time and women are much more likely to be underemployed than men. And one of the structural reasons for this low workforce participation amongst women is because of the high out-of-pocket costs of childcare and the punitive tax rate that secondary income earners face. We are facing very difficult economic circumstances. This is a time when governments all over the world are searching for solutions for growth, searching for solutions for productivity. If you want to increase Australia's productive capacity, it is pretty straightforward. There is an army of women out there waiting for opportunities to work, but on the condition that they actually are meaningfully financially rewarded for that contribution. And you would think that it would be a policy priority for this government to consider their interests, because it would be fair. It would be significantly fairer for those women, but it would be a good thing for the economy. It's a flat-out no-brainer. It is the most straightforward thing you could do to lift Australia's productive capacity. But there is zero interest, because this is a government run by men with almost no interest in the interest of women, who treat women's issues with contempt when they are raised here in this chamber at the estimates table in the media. We get glib responses. Well, women are Australians. We look after all Australians. Well, I can tell you that that is not what the data shows. The data shows women's economic interests are not improving. Women still face a gender pay gap. They face a super gap. They face a wealth gap. They face increasing rates of homelessness. And under this government, they face one of the highest rates of childcare costs in the OECD. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Seselja. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. Uh, and I wanted to start by responding to the uh, last part of Senator McAllister's contribution, uh, where, uh, in, in, in attacking the coalition, uh, she ignores the record rates of female participa workforce participation uh, in this nation under a coalition government. Uh, she ignores those inconvenient facts for herself. She talks about you know, there being no women in the government when we have the highest number of women in a cabinet uh, in the history of our Commonwealth uh, under this coalition government. So those criticisms should be seen for what they are because they are not backed up by the facts. This government uh, will always uh, prioritise uh, participation uh, in the workforce of women, uh, allowing families uh, to make choices. Uh, that has been our government's record. Uh, that's what we'll continue to do, and that's what our policies are directed uh, at. And, but you do have to take a, take a step back before I go into some of the stats, uh, read childcare and the support that the coalition and the Morrison government uh, has been giving to childcare and to families uh, accessing childcare over a number of years. You do have to ask the question, when you, when you hear from the Labor Party, um, and their critique on childcare, who does the Labor Party represent? Who does the modern Labor Party represent? Because what they are arguing against is uh, a childcare policy which has absolutely prioritised those on low and middle incomes. Uh, this is the government uh, that actually said we are going to give a higher rate of subsidy, a higher rate of subsidy to those on low and middle incomes. Uh, and yet we have a Labor Party <coughs> who claims to represent workers uh, who would say, no, what you actually have to do is you have to give more subsidies to those on very high incomes. That is the Labor Party's policy and that is the Labor Party's critique when it comes to childcare. And so when I hear, when, when we hear this line of questioning and this line of attack from the Labor Party, I am reminded uh, of the comments of Joel Fitzgibbon when he says he wants to put Labor uh, back into the Labor Party. Because you know, it is extraordinary 
I wouldn't have thought. I mean, I'm old enough to remember when people didn't have to say things like "let's put Labor back into the Labor Party," because perhaps many years ago, perhaps when I was just a just but a young man, uh, a very young man, Labor may have had a reputation as actually supporting workers, uh, and perhaps a reputation once upon a time, once perhaps in the distant past, as actually supporting low and middle income workers. Uh, but. What we have is a modern Labor Party who has forgotten about those roots, who has forgotten about those noble roots, dare I say it, of a once great Labor Party who used to represent those kind of workers and now need to be you reminded. Never, you never did. Oh, I never did. Yeah, I'll compare. I'll compare backgrounds with you. When you were campaigning for the legalisation of dope at university, I was working as a cleaner, mate. So I'm not going to take I'm not going to take interjections from Senator Murray White. You know, we understand what it's like to, to earn a living, and the modern Labor Party and that that interjection again. Yeah, I've worked as a cleaner. I've done the I've done the hard jobs, mate. I don't know what apart from agitating. Drug law reform, mate, with your mates at university. I'm not really sure uh, what your what your cred is on this. But the modern Labor Party, the modern Labor Party, I'll tell you, doesn't have a lot of cred. And when it comes to childcare, they are now putting to the Australian people and to the government that instead of, in fact, prioritising prioritising low and middle income earners as we are doing. Uh, that what we should be doing is giving higher rates of subsidy to higher income earners. This is a government that has a proud record, a proud record of delivering for families, a proud record of keeping childcare rates as low as they possibly can, as opposed to the Labor Party's policy, which saw the, the costs of childcare, the out-of-pocket costs, up 53 per cent during their term in government. Their policies have been proven to fail. Uh, and that is, why, that is why you have this existential crisis within the Labor Party, where you get the, the wiser heads, like Joel Fitzgibbon, saying to the Labor Party, you need to remember who you are. We need to actually put the Labor back into the Labor Party. Our childcare package supports low-income earners, mid middle-income earners. It supports families who are doing it toughest. Uh, and supports them in making the choices that they want to make to get on and look after their Thank families. Thank you, Senator Selger. Senator Kitchen. Thank you, Deputy President. In the other place, the Prime Minister uh, rose in the last hour and said, our plan is to get workers who are not in jobs back in jobs. But there was no detail, Madam Deputy President, no detail whatsoever. But what I would say is it is the Labor Party who has actually thought through on how to get people into jobs. And one of those instances is, to, is our proper plan for childcare, of the proper place for female workforce participation, and in turn, a proper plan for the economy. The government has shown a great unwillingness to support working Australian families by providing a fair and properly funded childcare scheme. The coronavirus pandemic and the economic destruction it has wrought has left us with a once-in-a-generation chance to build the economy we want, the economies that Australians deserve. Policymakers learnt this lesson during the Great Depression. You do not cut spending during a crisis. Now is the time for a bold plan to restructure the economy. Yet what do we hear from the, this current government? Nothing like that whatsoever. It is all announcement. Yet the Morrison government would also rather withdraw support early for struggling Australians. They would rather ascribe debt unlawfully to Australians under the robo-debt scheme, not put money into brave policies and nation-building legacy projects. And fixing the unfair childcare system in this country would be just that. Australians pay some of the highest childcare costs in the world. Fees have increased 35 per cent under the Liberals. This is simply not sustainable. It is only under a Labor government that this will be remedied. Our plan, which the Morrison government refuses to support, will scrap the $10,560,000 childcare subsidy cap. This cap often sees women losing money just because they undertake an extra day of work. This is just not acceptable. Don't those opposite want to reward ambition, hard work and aspiration? That's what they say, but again, it's all just words. 
Labor will lift the maximum childcare subsidy rate to 90 per cent. Our plan will not only help more women get back into the workforce, it will also help families with the increased cost in living that the Morrison government has overseen in the term of this government. It will provide for better early childhood learning opportunities. The way the Morrison government has designed their system is that women actually lose money should they wish to return to the workforce and work more than three days a week. The current system locks out more than 100,000 families who simply can't afford it. Our plan is good for the economy, and if the Morrison government is serious about being good economic managers, as they so often say that they are, they would support it. Our plan will lift both workforce participation and spur economic growth. Both KPMG and the Grattan Institute have modelled the economic benefits of increased investment in childcare. In childcare. KPMG noted that further investment in this sector could create up to 210,000 more working days a week. This is the equivalent of 30,000 to 40,000 full-time jobs. Now, if those opposite don't like KPMG, the Grattan Institute found that women would increase their hours by up to 13 per cent if the childcare system was reformed to make it cheaper. But as we know, the Morrison government is squibbling their response to the coronavirus-induced economic crisis. It isn't building a plan to create jobs. It isn't investing in critical infrastructure. It isn't easing the burden on families that this awful year has inflicted. Rather than put in place a proper plan for childcare in this country, the Morrison government, and particularly the bungling former flatmate, the Minister for Government Services, would rather hound people with robo-debt notices, all while they knew that this was unlawful. This is perhaps the cruel, most cruel act committed by an Australian government against its citizens that has ever been seen. The economy was already in trouble before last summer's bushfires and coronavirus because of seven going on eight years of inaction by the Abbott Turnbull Morrison government. Government debt will soon reach $1 trillion. The Morrison government has been re relying on outside forces to keep the economy ticking over, at every turn unwilling to intervene in order to protect the livelihoods of working Australians. Many Australians haven't had a pay rise in real terms for years. Business investment has been weak for years. But now, when faced with the opportunity to support a policy that would not only alleviate the financial stress felt by working mothers and families— Thank you, Senator Kitching. Your time Thank you. has expired. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, Senator Kitching, you're a good person and you're an honest person. And because you've got an honest face, it means I look at you across the chamber as you say what you do, and I know that not even you believe the bull that you've just been sharing with us, because you know as well as I do that pre-COVID we came into this position with record workforce participation for women. At 61.2 per cent, women were participating in the workforce more than they ever have. And you know, as well as I do, that despite the fact that those opposite love to pretend that they are the party of working people, that they are the party of women, the cost of childcare, childcare fees, went up by 53 per cent in the last term of Labor being in government. So we're not going to stand here and be lectured to by those opposite about how they're the party of affordable childcare. In fact, the very the very fact that senators stand up in this chamber and pretend that childcare is a women-only issue is itself disturbing, because on this side we know that caring for children is a responsibility that belongs to both parents. It's not something that lies simply on women. It belongs to the entire family. But you'd never know that from what's said by those opposite. You'd think that it only matters to a woman whether or not children are cared for. You know what? We operate in the real world, a real world where blokes like Senator Seselja, like my husband, like many thousands and millions of men across this country are equally invested Slade? in Slade too. Slade is a fabulous father who cares just as much for the caring of his children as the many other 
men in families. I can't speak for you, Mr Watt. Senator Watt, <laughs> you can speak for the legalisation of dope, but you can't speak on this issue. Because in your party, childcare is treated like something that only women can talk about. Here we know it's a whole family issue. That's why those opposite will only ever talk about childcare in the sense of institutional care in a childcare centre. You'll never hear them talking about income splitting and how that might help the whole family. You'll never hear them talk about the possibility of tax deductibility of in-home care. You'll never hear them talking about sharing the burden of um, raising children across the whole family with income splitting. No, no. It's all about the institutional solution. It's a closed-minded approach. It denies the reality of how many people choose to live their lives, and it denies the fact that there is an uncomfortable truth in Labor's childcare policy, a very, very uncomfortable truth, and that is that Labor's childcare policy is one that would tax middle-income families to subsidise the childcare of the very, very wealthy. And If you don't believe me, let me give you this maths. A family in Townsville earning $80,000 a year as a family, under Anthony Albanese, Mr Albanese's and, and those opposites policy, Labor's signature position from their budget reply, that family would be subsidising the Sydney family earning $360,000 a year. They would subsidise those on $360,000 a year with the money of the Townsville family earning 80k. Now, where I'm from, that doesn't make much sense. And to make it even worse, they want to bake in permanent spending of $6 billion over four years with no plan to pay it, as well as baking in a subsidy for childcare workers to the tune of $10 billion a decade, again with no plan to pay it. And so we won't take lectures from those opposite. We know the care of children is a whole of family issue. We are prepared to approach it that way. We've put record funding into childcare, $9.2 billion, growing to over $10 billion in the coming years. We've put forward the very first women's economic security statement, and we've renewed it. And we came into this COVID crisis with record women's workforce participation. That is an approach to women's working success and the success of the caring for children in families that we can be proud of and that should be an embarrassment to those opposite as they plan to take from middle income earners to subsidise those on the Sydney Harbour side. Well, good luck to them. We know which Australians we're fighting for. Thank you, Senator Stoker. Senator Walsh. Pity President, well, when asked about the government's plans for making childcare affordable, Senator Birmingham told us, and I quote, the government takes childcare seriously. Well, it's difficult to take this government seriously when it comes to early childhood education. And it's difficult to take this government seriously when it comes to anything that affects working women. Uh, and it's difficult to take this government seriously when it comes to addressing household budgets uh, and real household struggles. Because working families with children in childcare today, they are struggling right now. And this government has delivered them no relief. In fact, under this government, childcare fees have increased by more than 35 per cent. More than 35 per cent. And that's happened at exactly the same time as wages have flatlined under this government, with wage growth at record historical low levels under this seven-year Morrison government. And families well, they can do the maths. They know exactly just how expensive and difficult the childcare system is to navigate under this government. They know that many parents actually lose money if they choose to work an extra day or work more than three days a week. And that's why Labor will reduce the cost of childcare. And it's why the Morrison government should commit to our plan, our proposal, to do exactly that, because we will scrap the cap. We will scrap the cap, which often sees parents losing money from an extra day's work. We will keep working to fix Australia's broken childcare system, and we will take the pressure off family budgets with this reform. We will give families the support that they need to succeed 
in their lives and in their household budgets, support that this government just refuses to deliver. And cheaper childcare, we know, is not just good for families and for household budgets. It's good for the economy as well. It's good for the recovery. And failing to reform childcare, well, that is just another failure of the Morrison government to get our economy moving. We know making childcare more affordable. We know it will lift workforce participation. We know that that, in turn, will increase growth. And cheaper childcare, we know, on the Labor side, is fundamental reform. It's fundamental reform that will absolutely supercharge our recovery. But this government, well, it has repeatedly lacked the vision and the heart to power this recovery for all Australians. This government has repeatedly lacked the vision and the heart to power this recovery for Australian women in particular. First of all, they left too many women out of the JobKeeper program. Women who were, in fact, the hardest hit by this COVID crisis got the least support from the Morrison government. Casuals, hospitality workers, the arts and events sector, university workers. Then, after leaving all of those women workers behind, they removed JobKeeper early for early childhood educators. This government chose to target early childhood educators in this pandemic, the very people who were going to work every day educating our children while everybody else was being asked to stay home to stay safe, a sector that is 95 per cent women. And now they're leaving women out of the recovery. Women have lost more jobs than men in this crisis. There are more women unemployed in Australia than ever before. But the government took no steps to get women back to work in its budget. As we know, they spent one third of one per cent on women's economic security in their budget. They delivered nothing for jobs in sectors dominated by women workers. Nothing for aged care jobs, nothing for early childhood education, the arts, hospitality, higher education. Sectors dominated by women got either nothing, next to nothing, or indeed funding cuts from this government, because women's jobs just do not matter to this government. And when called out on this, we got the government's now famous response that what you can find in the budget for women is our package on road infrastructure, because women drive on roads. That's what women get in this budget, roads. The government just fails to understand that supporting jobs in sectors women work in supports not just 50 per cent of our population, it supports the economy you, as a Walsh. whole. Thank you, Senator time has expired. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator McAllister to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Seward. Thank you, De Deputy um, President. I rise to take note of Minister Cash's response, representing, I should say, representing the Minister for Health's response to my question about climate change and a health emergency. And quite plainly, the government doesn't think that climate climate change presents a health emergency. She refused to answer that question, articulated a few of the initiatives the government's taking, but it's curious that one of those did not include ensuring that, in fact, climate change was part of our long-term health plan, national priority health plan. Was, is it in that? No, it's not. So clearly it's not a priority for this government in terms of well, it's, let's face it, climate change is not a priority for this government, but it's certainly not a priority in terms of looking at its, its, the impact it is having on people's health in this country, but also what sort of systems response we need to properly address the impact of uh, climate change on our health system and on people's health. Let's be clear. Climate change is a health emergency. It requires urgent action by government. Literally, people's lives are at stake. If we do not address climate change as a health emergency, people's lives will be lost. We know that. Climate change is already having an impact on people's health and people's lives. As I articulated when I asked the question, 450 people last year had been died or had their lives affected by, through direct, in, direct impact or through air pollution. And, and thousands of others have had their, their lives impacted 
uh, through the pollution and the damage caused by climate change already. I'd like to point out that, that First Nations peoples will be particularly affected as climate change is as in the um, health emergency. Yeah. They already have poorer outcomes in their, uh, health, in their uh, health. We already know the gap in life expectancy isn't being closed. We know that First Nations peoples are living in overcrowded housing. Um, we already know that they do, they have, uh, many have less funding available and less resources available in order to respond to the climate emergency as it affects their health. Many live in rural and remote areas and, in fact, are already feeling the impacts of climate change on their health and are already being required, for example, to move in response to it. Just recently, we've had three important reports that have been uh, released that are addressing these issues. Just today, we had the climate, the Grattan um, climate change and health preparing for the next disaster report where they make seven recommendations and clearly point out that we can't regard the issue of climate change in terms of health as an optional extra. It has to be core business. Yet we know it's not included in the National Preventative Health Strategy, for example. You would have thought it was one of those key areas that government would have thought should have been there. Um, it's not included in the long-term national um, health plan, and research is not being funded at a high enough level. And then we've got the Medical Journal Australia and Lancet Countdown 2020 special report on health and climate change, the lessons learned from Australia's Black Summer. This report um, looks at the health of the Australian public and, and, and sees it as uniquely at risk from the effects of climate change. And it demonstrates the need for the federal government to adopt a national strategy in climate change, health and wellbeing. The report is clearly a, a call to action and also articulates the fact that many of our health experts are saying climate change is a health emergency. And then we have the Centre for Future Work report on climate change producing dangerous heat stress in workplaces. And this report articulates the impacts on, of climate change on people's health in the workplace. It says heat stress poses serious health and safety risks for many workers across Australia, and Australia must act on the causes of rising temperatures and changing weather patterns. So here we have, just recently, really clear evidence that the climate crisis is a health emergency. The government, once again, is missing in action when it comes to addressing climate change. And, and of course, they're refusing to accelerate our, our move to net zero emissions. Quite clearly, we need this government to commit to zero net zero emissions by at least 2035. At least 2035. We are failing to, to take this issue seriously and it Thank will directly you, lead to Seawitt. lives Your time lost. has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Seawitt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Um, we will now move to notices of motion to be given for another day. Are there any of those? Uh, Senator Dunian. Uh, uh, thank you. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, I give notice on the next day of sitting I shall move that provisions of paragraphs 5 to 8 of Standing Order 111 not apply to various bills, allowing them to be considered during this period of sittings. And I also table um, statements of reasons justifying the need for these bills to be considered during these sittings and seek leave to have the statements incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. No other motions to be given for another day. Senator Seward. No. Uh, I call to Senator Seward. Sorry, Senator Urquhart. Um, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business, Senator Urquhart? Thank you. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for senators. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. I move that leave of absence be granted to the following senators for personal reasons: Senator Wong for Monday, the 7th of December, 2020 and for Senator Brown for Monday the 7th of December till Thursday the 10th of December 2020. The question is that the motion is put by Senator Urquhart be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. I withdraw general business notice of motion number 8 
554, standing in my name for today, for the 3rd of February. Just to be clear, um, there was a confusion about the postponement of this. It's been sorted out with the table's office, and there will be a new motion um, uh, lodged today for tomorrow. Okay, thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Are there um, any other motions to postpone or rearrange business? I'll call the clerk. Postponement notifications have been lodged as follows. Um, General Business Notice of Motion Number 361 um, for the 8th of December 2020, postponed to the 16th of March 2021. General Business Notice of Motion Number 853 in Senator Hanson Young's name for today, postponed to the 3rd of February. General Business Notice of Motion 868 in Senator Waters' name for today, postponed to the 3rd of February. General Business Notice of Motion 909 in Senator Faruqi's name for today, postponed to the 9th of December. General Business Notice of Motion 916 in Senator Seawart's name for today, postponed to the 9th of December. General Business Notice of Motion number 906 in Senator Patrick's name for today, postponed to the 8th of December. And Business of the Senate Notice of Motion number 2 for the 8th of December in Senator Griff's name, postponed to the 2nd of February 2021. Thank you. <clears throat> I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business, and I intend to start uh, in general business uh, with general business notice of motion number 911, standing in the name of Senator Stilljohn. Thank you. Uh Deputy uh, President, I ask that general business uh, notice of motion number 911 be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Steele, John. Uh, I, uh, I move uh, that the following bill be introduced. A bill for an act to amend the Defence Act of 1903 to provide for parliamentary approval of overseas service members uh, by the Defence Force and for related purposes. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Steele John be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Steele John. Thank you. I present the bill and move that uh, this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Steele John be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Steele John. Thank you, Deputy President. I move that this bill now be read a second time and seek leave to have an explanatory memorandum related uh, uh, to table as explanatory memorandum uh, related to the bill. Just before I do that, Senator Steele John, I'll just call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Defence Act 1903 to provide for parliamentary approval of overseas service by members of the Defence Force and for related purposes. And the question on the second reading, uh, that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Thank you. I table the explanatory memorandum and seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated into the Hansard and to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. And um, I'll just clarify that we've adjourned the second reading debate. So we'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 912, standing in the name of uh, Senator Seawitt and others. Senator Seawitt. Thank you, Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 912 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Seawitt. I move the motion. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Seawitt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We now move to general business. Notice of motion uh, number 914, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 914 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Minister. 
Senator Dunning. I seek leave to make a short statement. His leave granted. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Real wages growth under the Morrison government of 0.07 per cent is in line with the 20-year average and the same as the average under, the, under Labor's last term in government. The fact is wages are forecast to grow by one and three quarters of a per cent through the year to June, the June quarter 2021 and one and a half per cent to the June quarter 2022. The key to lifting real wages is lifting productivity growth, and that's why we're focused on lowering taxes, investing in infrastructure, equipping our workers with better skills and improving our industrial relations framework. Thank you. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 914, standing in the name of Senator Gallagher, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 914 standing in the name of Senator Gallagher be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order. There being 32 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I'll now move to general business notice of motion number 864, standing in the name of Senator Wong. And I remind senators there may be further divisions. Senator Urquhart. I ask that general business notice of motion number 864 will be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunning. I seek leave to make a short statement. Uh, leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The government agrees that all Australians have a right to enjoy equal rights and be treated with equal respect, regardless of race, colour, creed or origin. Australia is a strong and robust liberal democracy with one of the world's most open and thriving multicultural societies. Australia owes its strength and its prosperity in no small part to the economic and social contributions of successive generations of migrants coming to our shores. Uh, the Australian government proudly acknowledges Chinese Australians' strong cultural, social and economic contributions to Australian life. Our nation has greatly benefited from the contribution made by uh, people of Chinese heritage, many of whom have distinguished themselves in all walks of life, including business, medicine, education and, indeed, politics. Thank you. Senator Faruqi? This leave is granted for one minute, Senator Faruqi. The Greens support this motion. What Senator Abetz did was disgraceful. There is no doubt about that. Interrogating a person's loyalty to this country because of their cultural background is unacceptable. It's just as disgraceful that Senator Abetz has dug his heels in and refuses to engage in self-reflection. And it's even more disgraceful that not one single minister of this government has condemned Senator Abetz for his racist targeting of Chinese Australians. The government should not be tolerating any insinuation that Chinese Australian communities are suspect or have questionable allegiances. This is horrid, toxic stuff. I was proud to put my name to an Asian-Australian Alliance open letter calling on Minister Taj to make clear that Senator Abetz's behaviour was unacceptable. I reiterate my calls today. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Uh, Minister. Um, on a point of order, yes. I just, uh, Madam Deputy President, wonder if you could ask Senator Faruqi to reflect on her contribution just then. Um, it's not temperate language, and I think there are a number of things that could even be sought to be withdrawn. So, um
Uh, Senator Faruqi was reflecting on the substance of the motion, but I do remind senators these are obviously important topics, and um, just to uh, be careful about how they express themselves. And I would ask Senator Faruqi to consider withdrawing, and I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator Roberts. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Roberts. Thank you. I see it as essential that senators be able to have the, have the authority to speak their mind and to call on Australian citizens to reject a foreign power, especially one of totalitarian government like the Chinese Communist Party. Secondly, I disagree with um, we will not be supporting this motion. I disagree with D1, which is uh, I, I believe that the laws and values of our country are the basis of our society and our sovereignty. Senator Abetz? I claim to have been misrepresented. Uh, Senator Abetz, what is it that you're seeking to do? I claim to have been misrepresented. And Are you seek... seeking leave? Or... Yes, I am indeed. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Abetz. I thank the Senate. I completely reject the outrageous assertion that has been made that in any way, shape or form I engaged in racist conduct. That should be withdrawn under any interpretation of the standing orders, Madam Deputy President. Secondly, the motion asserts that I demanded certain things. The Hansard chose no demand was made. Thirdly, I can indicate that no request for loyalty was made, yet that is once again repeated in the motion. Because they have no feathers to fly with, the two Labor Party operatives who gave evidence to a Senate committee found difficulty in answering a simple basic question as to whether a country, a dictatorship that has one million of its citizens in a concentration camp, ought to be condemned, they have this immediate reaction that to do so is racist. Thank I stand you. with the Thank oppressed. You, Senator Abetz. Uh, order. 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 I have just reminded senators that people have the right to remain, uh, to be heard in silence, and to be respectful towards one another. Senator Abetz. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Madam De uh, Deputy President. I ask, uh, can I ask uh, that the uh, vote be split on this? I'd like to vote differently to, on, uh, to paragraph C, as I would for D and E. Certainly. Patrick, the clerk has just alerted me to an error in the notice paper. So when you say C, we would normally call that A and B, and then following on B and C. So if you just like to restate which section, please. So I, I, I was recognising there was an error and calling it so as, as per the notice it. paper. The first paragraph is which I, uh, and I wish to vote differently to the, the second you. two. All right. So I'm going to put. So I'm putting the question on paragraph C as described in the notice paper. Um, so the question is that um, those in favour of paragraph C say aye. aye. Against? Um, I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Just reminding you, C is the first paragraph that should have been described as A.
Stop the bells. So the question is that uh, part C, as described in the notice paper of General Business Notice of Motion Number 864, standing in the name of Senator Wong, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order, there being 29 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. It's now my intention to put the remainder of that motion, D and E, as described in the notice paper. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 864, standing in the name of Senator Wong, D and E, be agreed to. Those with that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bell. So the question is at D and E of general business notice of motion number 864 standing in the name of Senator Wong be agreed to. The ayes shall move for the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order. There being 29 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I remind senators that there may be uh, further divisions, and with the agreement of the whips, it's my intention to ring the bells for two minutes. We'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 908, standing in the name of Senators Wish Wilson and Faruqi. Senator Siwa, are you taking this one? Oh, Senator Wish Wilson. Just waiting for my chair to be vacated. Fair enough. Uh, Deputy President, um, I ask that uh, general business of the Senate notice of motion number 908 uh, in, in my name and Senator Faruqi's name be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Wish Wilson. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave this ground for one minute, Senator Dunning. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The uh, Coalition Government supports the development of our offshore gas resources. New gas supplies will drive down gas and electricity prices for Australian businesses, provides an essential feedstock and energy source for Australian manufacturers, and provides heating and cooking for millions of households. Australia's competitive advantage has always been based on cheap energy, and gas will be central to our ongoing economic recovery. Exploration and production of gas in Commonwealth offshore waters has been undertaken safely and responsibly for decades. The Australian government makes its decisions in the interests of all Australians, while the Greens show their contempt for the Australian industry and Australian workers who rely on a reliable East Coast gas supply. So the question is: General business notice of motion number 908, standing in the name of Senators Wishulson and Faruqi, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 908, standing in the name of 
Senator Wish, Senators Wish, Wilson and Faruqi be agreed to. The ayes shall move with the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order, there being 27 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is negated. We will now move to general business notice of motion number 919, standing in the name of Senator Patrick. Deputy President. I seek leave to amend uh, business notice of motion number 919 before asking that it be taken as a formal motion. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Patrick. I amend the motion in the terms circulated in the chamber and ask that it be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that amended motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Patrick. I move the motion as amended. Thank you. So, uh, Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunningham. Uh, thanks, Madam Deputy President. The government supports a consumer's right to choose any vehicle technology that suits their needs. Our future vehicles, uh, future fuels strategy rather, will not be limited to one technology, but will consider a variety, including hybrids, electric, hydro hydrogen fuel cell, and biofuel vehicles. The government is already putting funding behind this with Order. a $74.5 million future fuels package announced as part of the $1.9 billion. Uh, package for new energy technologies in the budget. New vehicle technologies should be treated equitably with traditional petrol and diesel cars to ensure all motorists contribute to the upkeep of road infrastructure. Thank you, uh, Senator Dunningham. So the question is that uh, general business notice of motion number 919, standing in the name of Senator Patrick as amended, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
stop the bells. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 919 as amended, standing in the name of Senator Patrick's, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Order. There being 28 ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll now move to general business. Notice of motion number 918, standing in the name of Senator Steelejohn. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you for giving me time to put my chair back in the right place. Yep. Um, I ask that general business uh, notice of motion number 918 uh, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Steelejohn. I move the motion. So the question, uh, Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you. I seek leave to make short Leave statement. is granted for one minute. Thank you, Senator uh, thank Gallagher. Thank you. Labor will not be supporting this motion. The findings of the Afghanistan inquiry report of the Inspector General of the Australian Defence Force that credible information exists in relation to some members of Australian Special Forces having engaged in unlawful killings and cruel treatment while deployed in Afghanistan are appalling. Yet as appalling as these findings of credible information are, as the report makes clear, and I quote, this is not a finding of guilt nor a finding to any standard that the crime has in fact been committed. It's important that all of us in this place be mindful of those words and avoid utterances that might be seen to be reflecting on matters that could be the subject of future criminal proceedings. I would also emphasise that these allegations concerning a small number of soldiers should not be allowed to overshadow the service of thousands of Australian Defence Force personnel that served in Afghanistan with distinction. Thank you. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 918 and standing in the name of Senator Steelejohn Steel John be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. Ayes have it. Um, ring the bells for one minute. Yep. Stop the bells. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 918, standing in the name of Senator Steelejohn, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
order, there being nine ayes and 36 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We will now move to general business, notice of motion number 915, standing in the name of Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 915, relating to the number of formal motions that can be moved, be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal, there being none? Of course, Senator Waters. Thank you. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 915, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Aye. I believe the noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 915, standing in the name of Senator Waters, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 12 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll just inform the chamber it's my intention to finish with the rest of the general business notices and then do business of the Senate government business. And then I remind Senate there was a deferred vote from last week. So we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 917, standing in the name of Senator Farrell and others. Senator Urquhart. Thank you. Uh, I inform the Chamber that Senator O'Neill will also sponsor the motion, and I ask that general business notice of motion number 917 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to the motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Mackenzie. I seek leave to move amendments to this motion. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Amendments McKenzie. are circulated. Uh, I understand the amendments were circulated. Senator Gallagher. Um, thank you. We, I just uh, seek leave to make a short statement on the am amendment. Is leave granted? Leave is granted um, for one minute. 
The opposition will be opposing Senator McKenzie's amendment. The amendment um, reflects the views of many in the Morrison-McCormack government and is a perfect demonstration of why the Morrison-McCormack government cannot be trusted to deliver the Murray-Darling Basin Plan. Senator Dunningham. Uh, I was hoping to seek leave to make a short statement on the motion now. Or Yes? Sure, why yes. not? Okay. Leave is granted for a minute. Senator Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Uh, the Morrison McCormack government is committed to the Basin Plan. The Basin Plan implementation is a shared responsibility between Basin governments. On the 4th of September this year, Minister Pitt announced the $270 million Murray-Darling Communities investment package, bringing Basin communities back to the heart of the Basin Plan. We have considered the reports, listened to communities, and we are moving towards off-farm efficiencies and have ruled out any further uh, buybacks. We are delivering outcomes for regional Basin communities and the environment. Uh, stunts like this one from Labor do nothing to deliver for either communities or for the environment. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Senator, Sarah, uh, Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to make a short statement. His leave, leave is granted for one minute, Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you. I'd just like to um, put on the record the Greens will not be supporting Senator McKenzie's amendments to this motion. I point to uh, point C uh, in particular, which talks about the problems. Uh, as uh, the National Party described with the 450 gigalitres. I just want to make it very clear that any South Australian senator who votes for this will need to go back to Adelaide and explain why you've just sold out our state. So uh, whether it's Senator Birmingham, Senator Fawcett, any Liberal coalition member who votes for this well, prepared to see the wrath of the South Australians when you've sold us down the river. Thank you. Uh, Senator Roberts. I order. 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 I Senator seek Roberts. leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Thank Senator you. Roberts. The Department of Agriculture has already acquired 2,075 gigalitres for the environment, leaving just 450 gigalitres to come from efficiency savings. Connected Basin farmers do not have 450 gigalitres to give up, and they do not need to. For thousands of years, the high rainfall area known as the southeast sent a long-term average of 450 gigalitres of fresh water into the Coorong and Lower Lakes. Between 1864 and 2011, the South Australian government built a network of drains to take that water out to sea out in the Great Southern Ocean, where it is destroying native seagrasses. This motion is demanding water to fix the Coorong and Lower Lakes should still come from other states, including Queensland. One Nation has a better idea. Turn the drains back around and use South Australia's own water to solve the many environmental issues affecting the Coorong and Lower Lakes. Problems South Australia created for themselves. Simple solution. So the question, uh, Senator Patrick? I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? I think leave is granted for one minute, Senator Patrick. Um, I, I won't be supporting this amendment from Senator McKenzie. Uh, the plan involves a number of stakeholders. That includes uh, the, the environment, pastoralists, irrigators, uh, tourism operators, recreational users, and it's been uh, laid out and uh, agreed amongst all of the states. And when it gets tough for the irrigators, they quickly say, let's change the plan, let's not deliver the plan, let's do something different. And uh, it's quite disingenuous and it's quite disrespectful to the fact that uh, the plan has been agreed by all and it involves compromise by all. Uh, irrigators need to understand the importance of the plan and stick with it. So the question is, the amendment as moved by Senator McKenzie be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. The noes have it. So I now move the substantive amendment. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 917, standing in the name of Senator Farrell and others, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Thank you, Senator Roberts. So done. We will now move to general business notice of motion number 913, standing in the name of Senator A. Gallacher. Senator Urquhart. I ask that general business notice of motion number 913 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute, <coughs> Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The government is committed to formalising the Australian Industry Content AIC into the Strategic Partnering Agreement by the end of the year. 
We have a commitment from the French government, Naval Group and Naval Group Australia for a minimum of 60 per cent AIC over the life of the attack class program. This is a floor, not a ceiling. We have every ambition and expectation of reaching uh, the highest level of Australian industry participation with over 1,500 potential Australian suppliers and a forecast average of 2,800 Australian jobs over the life of the uh, program, this government is growing our sovereign capability. So the question is, uh, Senator Steele John? You uh, seek leave to make a short statement? Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted for one minute, Senator Steele John. Thank you, Deputy Press. Uh, once again, uh, it is worth noting that the uh, initial buy-in price of this project was $50 billion. Uh, the ANAO uh, have told us now that that price tag has grown to $80 billion. Uh, this is against a backdrop where we know uh, that spending on defence infrastructure and projects is one of the worst ways to spend public funds. Bang for buck, it delivers less jobs, it helps less people. It does more damage to our environment than nearly any other way of spending public funds. And as Senator Seward so often tells me, and any other person that will listen, it is a terrible thing in this country when people don't have enough to eat. We plunge billions into war machines. Thank you, Senator Steele. John. So the question is that General Business Notice of Motion Number 913, standing in the name of Senator A. Gallet, should be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to General Business Notice of Motion Number 910, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Before asking that this motion be taken as formal, I'd like to inform the Chamber that Senator McKim will be co-sponsoring this motion with me. Um, I ask that General Business Notice of Motion number 910 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Faruqi. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek to make a short statement. I believe leave is granted for one minute, Senator Dunningham. Excellent. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. The Australian Social Security System is a non-contributory, residence-based uh, program designed primarily to support Australian citizens and permanent residents. There's always been an expectation that temporary visa holders are able to support themselves while in Australia. Temporary visa holders who are unable to support themselves under these arrangements are strongly encouraged to return home. Most temporary visa holders with work rights were given access to their superannuation until uh, the 1st of July 2020 to help uh, support themselves. The government has provided $13 million to the Australian Red Cross to deliver emergency relief support, which is helping more than 50,000 temporary migrants. Those on temporary visas experiencing domestic and family violence are able to access existing national services that received extra Commonwealth funding, including 1800 Respect, Specialised Family Violence Services and the Trafficked People Program. Senator Gallagher. Uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Senator uh, Gallagher. Thank you. Um, there are, uh, the opposition will be supporting section A of this uh, motion, but um, in relation to section B we can't, um, and I would ask that the um, those the questions be put separately on that. I mean, this is a point I've raised a number of times in this place, where um, this part of the program for um, non-controversial items, or it's meant to be for straightforward and non-controversial items that don't require debate, in a party of government, when there is a section which calls on um, for change that involves considerable amount of um, money. Um, we go through our own processes. It won't be determined by a Greens motion in this place, and it is not the appropriate place to do that. This should be something that, where a debate is allowed, where there is discussion. It is not a yes or no. Order. But in the interests of um, getting through this part of the program, we'll just ask that those questions be put separately. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 910, standing in the name of Senator Faruqi, Part A, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, now move to section B. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 910, standing in Senator Faruqi's name, part B, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I uh, believe the noes have it. Division required. Uh, ring the bells for one minute.
stop the bell. So the question is at General Business Notice number 9110, standing in the name of Senator Fruki Park B, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order, there being 10 ayes and 36 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. We will now move to general business notice of number, notice number 907, standing in the name of Senator Bragg. Oh, Senator Patterson. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I ask that general business notice of motion 907, standing in the name of Senator Bragg, relating to the ABC and the New Daily, be taken as formal. So the question is, uh, is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Patterson. Thank you. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 907, standing in the name of Senator Bragg, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Uh, the ayes have it. Well, now that concludes the general business part of that. I'm now going to move to um, business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson. Okay, beg your pardon, my mistake. We'll now move to government business, uh, standing in the name of Senator Birmingham. Senator Dunningham. Thanks, Madam Deputy President. I ask that government business notice of motion number one relating to the Afghanistan inquiry be taken as formal. Is there any objection to that motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call uh, Senator Dunningham. Uh, I move the motion standing in the names of Senators Birmingham, Wong and Reynolds. Senator Lambie. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Re uh, I seek leave to make a short statement. Is leave granted? Leave is granted for one minute, Senator Lambie. Thank you. We all agree that the allegations contained in the Brereton report are serious, are serious, but I do take issue with the final point of this motion, asking those affected by these allegations and the response to reach out and get help. The Minister for Veterans Affairs runs a $12 billion department that can find the time, surely, to reach out to the Australian military witnesses, those military, uh, those military members accused and their families. I'd also like to express my deepest respect and sympathy to all those who have served two, uh, two squadron SASR since 1964, including Borneo, our Vietnam veterans, those who fought, fought in Afghanistan and Iraq, and those who were on other missions that we will never know about. To the thousands of family members that, I have, been, that have been attached to these men that are now feeling the shame and heartache and the repercussions because of the alleged actions of a few. I want to make sure this is fully acknowledged by all sides of parliament they, that they too are suffering. Uh, Senator Steelejohn. Uh, I uh, seek leave to move an amendment. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Steelejohn. I move the amendment uh, in the terms circulated in the chamber. 
Thank you. So the question is that the amendment to a government business number one is moved by Senator Steele. John be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the noes have it. I are you seeking a division? So no division. Um, th there's no. There's, that's not granted, Senator Steele. John. Thank you. So ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. So the question is that uh, the amendment has moved. No. The amendment. No, I think. No, we're on the amendment. Sorry. Uh, so the question is the amendment as moved by Senator Steele John be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I call Senator Seawitt as teller for the ayes and. Senator Dean Smith as teller for the nose. Order. There being nine ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now put the motion. So the question is that government business motion standing in the name of Senators Birmingham, Wong and Reynolds be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I reminded senators earlier there is a deferred vote from last week, so I remind senators that on Thursday after 4.30 p.m. a division was called for on a motion moved by Senator Roberts relating to China. I understand that it suits the convenience of the Senate for that division to be held now. The question is that that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Uh, I believe the ayes have it. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 
23 proposals. Beg your pardon. Oh, beg your pardon. Um, just resume your seats for a moment. Senator Smith. Uh, put that vote again for us. Yes, certainly. Yep. Uh, Senator Smith has asked for the deferred vote to be put again. Uh, if people take their seats, I'll, I'll put the question. So the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. So the question is that the deferred vote, that that motion be agreed to, the ayes shall pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes.
Without there being 31 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. And that concludes general business. We'll now move to the matter of public urgency. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 23 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As, I as a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator McKim. Dear Mr President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice today that I pro propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. The need for the Morrison government to take to the upcoming Global Climate Ambition Summit a pledge to increase its 2030 emissions reduction targets in lines with the science, noted, noting that the UK has announced a target of 68 per cent emissions reduction by 2030. Yours sincerely, Senator McKim. Is that proposal supported? Yes, it is. A call. I understand informal arrangements have been made. I ask the um, clerks to set the clocks accordingly, and I call Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Deputy President. I move that uh, the matter of public urgency be that the Morrison government must take to the upcoming Global Climate Ambition Summit a pledge to increase its 2030 emissions targets in line with the science, noting that the UK has announced a target of 68 per cent emissions reductions by 2030. Well, folk might not recall how pathetically weak Australia's targets are, if you can even call them targets. 26 to 28 per cent reduction on 2005 levels by 2030. In less jargonistic terms, Australia is currently the highest per capita polluter on the planet. If, by some miracle or by the dodgy accounting tricks that I'll talk about in a minute, we meet those targets, Australia will still be the highest per capita emitter on the planet. These targets are pathetic. They are not strong enough. They are not based on science. They are written by the fossil fuel industry that donates to this government and to the opposition, and they are writing the death warrant for the Great Barrier Reef, for our agriculture sector um, and for so many lives and for so much human misery as natural disasters just increase. Now, the United Kingdom uh, recently recommended that their pollution be uh, that their targets be increased to 68 per cent. Their government actually listened to their scientific advisers and they increased their 2030 target by that amount. When Prime Minister Boris Johnson is making more sense than your own Prime Minister, you know you're in trouble. Uh, and <laughs> It's about the one thing we'd like Scott Morrison to actually, Prime Minister Scott Morrison to actually listen to Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson on. But as I've mentioned, our two big political parties are completely in the pockets of the oil, coal, and gas political donors, um, who also offer them very well-paid lobbyist jobs once they leave Parliament. And I think all of Australia knows that. Uh, now, the Bureau of Meteorology has some very sobering news. It says Australia is not on track for the two degrees that we signed up to as a citizen of this world uh, to keep global warming to. In fact, we're on track for 4.4 degrees over our land mass. That's goodbye to the reef. That's goodbye to most of our productive agriculture. And that's hello to an awful lot of devastation that is entirely unnecessary because we have the skills, the nous and the resources to transition to 100 per cent clean energy as soon as possible. Uh, but we're not seeing any of that from this government. On the reef, we just had the final warning bell sounded by the IUCN with their three yearly World Heritage Outlook uh, released last week, now saying that the Great Barrier Reef is critical. It is the uh, most strongest listing that can be given to a World Heritage Site. And it's not surprising because we've lost 50 per cent of the coral cover of the Great Barrier Reef in five years with three severe bleaching episodes. We're meant to be heading into a La Nina, but there's concern that there will be yet another bleaching. And this is the last warning this government's going to get before UNESCO decides whether or not to list the reef as World Heritage in danger. Now, that would be factually accurate, but it would decimate the tourism industry. What we need this government to do is adopt strong 2030 emissions reductions targets. This is the critical decade. But today, today they want a pat on the back because they've said they're not going to cheat on their homework. They've said they're not going to use the Kyoto carryover credits and they expect some kind of praise when it was five 
five years ago that most other nations voluntarily said they wouldn't use their carryover credits, and when Australia is in fact the only nation that in that initial climate agreement in Kyoto were allowed to increase our pollution. The only reason we have carryover credits is because we were allowed to pollute even more when all of the rest of the world decided to tighten their belt. So I'm sorry, but we are not going to praise the Prime Minister um, for saying that he won't use dodgy accounting to somehow meet our targets. The other dodgy accounting point is that they're now trying to claim that they're on track to meet our targets because, again, we're relying on a provision um, about land use that no other country is relying on. If you take out that dodgy accounting, Australia is in fact polluting more than we were in 2005, which is meant to be our baseline year that we're meant to be 26 to 28 per cent better than um, by the end of this decade. We are not on a good trajectory. This is a critical decade, and we need this government and the opposition to stop taking the dirty money from coal, oil and gas and start listening to the science bodies, stop defunding them and actually adopt some climate targets that we can amply meet, that will generate more jobs, that will protect our reef and our way of life, and set us up for future economic prosperity. Stop putting your own personal interests ahead of the nation's. Senator Canavan. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, well, uh, in that contribution there from Senator Waters, uh, we really only heard us compared to one country, the United Kingdom, and I'll come to that country in a second, but, but there was no comparison with any other country in the world. So I, I, I for one, at first thought maybe we'd gone back into some twilight zone when we were once again a colony of the United Kingdom. We were, only, we were just being told to do uh, from our, uh, we're going to do, according to Senator Waters, what our colonial masters want us to do over in London. And yes, our colonial masters uh, in London would love us to cripple their own industry so they can continue to compete with us. They'd love us uh, to impose huge costs on our own country uh, that many other nations are not doing. Uh, but I, for one, pr am proud and cherish the independence that this nation has achieved since we threw off uh, the colonial chains and became an independent country. So, no, I don't think we should just slavishly follow uh, what Mr Johnson wants to do in London. Good luck to him. He's the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. He is the Order. Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Order. and he can decide what the policies are for the United Kingdom. Uh, uh, in this country, in Australia, we should decide what we want to do with a, by Australian elected officials, and including our Australian uh, Prime Minister. And, uh, uh, Senator Watt was over there saying, am I a Republican? I'm not a Republican. I'm a constitutional monarchist, and that does give us independence here in this parliament. But I was surprised to hear Senator Waters almost not just be uh, a monarchist here, but perhaps an absolute monarchist as well, because I think I think, uh, I think Prince Charles and Prince Harry they want us to do these order. things as Senator well. Senator Canavan, Senator Waters on a yes, point of uh, order. Yes, point of order, thanks. I'm a dedicated Republican, uh, so perhaps Senator, Senator Canavan Waters, could withdraw his not, outrageous that is flair not on a my point character. Of order. That resume I'm a... your seat. Resume your seat. Senator Canavan, you have the call. <coughs> well, well, thank you, uh, um, Acting Deputy President. But uh, well, I'd say to Senator Waters, start acting like one. Uh, uh, don't just adopt the policies of a, another country because a proud Republican would actually uh, want to cherish our own independence and cast our own uh, uh, course through the world. Uh, but I want to come to these other countries as well because uh, uh, Senator Waters, as I said, only mentioned United, the United Kingdom. Uh, but in fact, when you look closer around the world, uh, New, Zealand, New Zealand is not meeting our cousins, our good friends, New Zealand are not meeting their Kyoto targets. The Kyoto targets come due this year. They come due in 2020. So New Zealand has about three weeks uh, to meet its Kyoto targets that is failing to meet right now. It's only reduced its emissions by just under 3 per cent when it promised to, do, to reduce them by 5. And as many, much as Ms Jacinta Ardern wants to go around the world and, and, and spruik the fact that she is committed to net zero emissions by 2050, the fact remains that their country has not met the, the, the commitments they made just 10 or 15 years ago. So how can they be trusted to do something in 30 years' time? Likewise, Canada. Canada has barely changed its emissions. Uh, it is not meeting its Kyoto targets. Japan is not meeting its Kyoto targets. Almost every other country in the world is not meeting its targets. And then, of course, countries like China and India they don't even have any uh, real targets to meet under Kyoto or Paris, for that matter. But we are. We are. We are. Uh, as Senator Waters said, she she thinks it's through dodgy accounting, which I'll, I'll come to. But we are one of the few countries that's actually meeting our targets. The main other problem, though, I have with the uh, implication here in this motion 
that we should follow the United Kingdom and reduce our emissions by uh, somewhere in the order, I suppose, of 68 per cent by 2030, is that will actually do nothing for the environment unless we consume more stuff. Well, less stuff, sorry, unless we consume less stuff. Uh, because I didn't hear anything from the Greens and never hear anything from the Greens that we should somehow uh, 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 not buy as many solar panels from overseas or wind turbines or, 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 or electric cars. All of these things are made using coal. All of these things are made uh, often in countries with much worse environmental uh, records than we have. Uh, so, so it takes every time we put up a wind turbine, it takes about 900 tons of steel. Uh, Acting Deputy President, 900 tons of steel, uh, and it takes to, to make that steel. It takes around 800 tonnes of coking coal to make uh, one tonne of steel. So times 800 by 900, uh, you get a lot of coking coal embodied in those wind turbines. Every time, every time you want to build a, a wind turbine, it's 2,500 tonnes of concrete. That typically uses a lot of coal too in the kilns uh, to heat up uh, the lime and, and make concrete. So that, that also is a huge carbon emission impact. Uh, and again, we don't hear uh, the need for less wind turbines, at least from the Greens we have in this chamber. But of course, Bob Brown and Christine Millen are doing great work opposing wind turbines in Tasmania and all power to them. Uh, but this mob in here are, are cheering on uh, the extra carbon emissions we would get from wind turbines. Solar panels. Almost all of our solar panels are imported from China. Almost all of them. Where does China get the energy to, to power its factories to produce these cheap solar panels? Coal. A lot of it from our coal. It used to be our coal, at least. Our coal. They use coal uh, to produce solar panels, which we then happily import cheaply. Now, I would say to the renewable energy industry, if we want to really save the planet, let's make the solar panels here. I'd support that. I'm not against solar panels. I'm not against renewable energy. But let's make it here. Rather than make it dirty in dirty factories in China, why don't we make the solar panels here? All right? why, why do we allow these companies to take government subsidies all the time and then just import them from another country where the jobs are created there? Let's make them here in this country at least in a cleaner fashion. And of course, if we reduced, if we were to reduce our emissions by the 60 or 70 per cent, even if we were to reduce it by 100 per cent, even if we were to get rid of our carbon emissions tomorrow, in the words of Dr Alan Finkel, that would do virtually nothing, nothing uh, for the environment, because of course Australia only accounts for roughly 1.3 per cent of the world's emissions. So even if Australia was to get rid of all of its carbon emissions tomorrow, uh, it would not make a single difference to the world. It would not change the temperature. And that was confirmed. It was confirmed by our chief scientist, Dr Alan Finkel, when uh, a good mate of mine, a former Senator Ian MacDonald, asked Dr Alan Finkel at Senate Estimates what would the impact be of reducing the world's emissions by 1.3 per cent. And Dr Alan Finkel replied, virtually nothing. And he's absolutely right. It would do virtually nothing uh, for the planet. But we want to we apparently push on, push on. Uh, and continue them down this path where we self-flagellate ourselves for no uh, actual environmental outcome, when we cost jobs in this country but don't help the environment at all. And the latest absurdity here is this push to give up our Kyoto credits, give up our Kyoto credits, give up the fact that we've overachieved uh, uh, on on carbon emissions. Uh, we have to do that. Yet there is never, never a call from the Greens to penalise those countries who have underachieved. Why is all the criticism of our country? Why isn't there any criticisms of other countries? It's because the Greens don't really like Australia. They don't like our country. They don't stand up for it. They certainly don't want to put Australia first. Uh, so there's never any criticism of other countries not meeting their Kyoto commitments. And so, order, Senator Canavan, Senator Waters, on a point of order. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. A point of order, reflecting on a member of this chamber, and wrongly, I might add. So can I ask Senator order. Canavan Senator, to withdraw? Uh, let me rule on this point of order first. Uh, you referred, he referred to the Greens as a party, which is no different to you referring to the Labor and Liberal parties and making inferences about their motivations under the standing orders and conventions. Referring to a party as a whole uh, does not infringe the standing orders. There is no point of order. Senator Canavan. Thank you. Uh, and I've certainly touched the nerve today. So they don't take Australia first, but they don't put Australia first, the Greens, because uh, because they never criticise other countries. And if we are going to have to give up our Kyoto credits, why shouldn't other countries uh, uh, have, to, have to be allocated Kyoto debits? Why, why shouldn't other countries get Kyoto debits for all the underachievement they have presided over 
over the last 10 or 15 years. That seems pretty logical to me. And so if we are to give up these Kyoto credits, we should, we should make other countries do more in the next period to catch up, like countries like New Zealand, like Canada, like Japan, many other, others around the world. The final point that I want to make is I don't, know, I don't think we should give these things up uh, because I do agree with one part of what Senator Waters said. She rightly said that the reason we have these Kyoto credits, the reason that we have got around 400 million tonnes of credits uh, it's all a bit funny money, but we've, 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 we've reduced our emissions by 400 million tonnes more on the carbon accounting than we, we budgeted for or we promised to under Kyoto. Almost all of that, I agree with Senator Waters, almost all of that is because we've stopped farmers being able to develop their own land. So over the last 30 years... Order. Senator Canavan, Senator Waters. Yes, Senator look, it's an, I'm afraid it's another point of order on um, reflecting and misquoting me, uh, which he Senate, well knows. Senator so can you Waters. please be accurate in your Senator, representation? Senator Waters, you have set a very good example yourself in making accusations about other people, but he did not breach the standing orders in this case. Senator Canavan, you have the call. Thank you. And uh, yes, the Greens certainly can give it, but they can't take it. The, 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 um, uh, the Senator Waters was right that what we've done is we've stopped farmers developing their own land. We stripped them of their property rights, provided no compensation to them, no compensation whatsoever. Told them that little part of your block over there that you might have wanted to develop in the future, you bought your block, mining wanted to develop more food on it. You can't touch that anymore. And we've got this ridiculous situation where that, that is apparently a carbon credit, and that lets us spook the world and say how good we are. Well. If we have a surplus of these, this, these good, good intentions or good outcomes, why don't we give them back to farmers? Why are we giving them to the world? Why don't we give those 400 million tonnes back to our nation's farmers so they can grow more food? That seems like a good idea. Why don't we, why don't we, so if, we, if, we if we have locked up so much land, too much land? Order. Oh Senator McKim. Acting Deputy President, I draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Quorum required. Ring the bells. Quorum present. Senator Canavan, you have the call. Uh, well, look, thank you, um, Acting uh, Deputy President. As I was saying, um, uh, we should put our, our country first and our farmers first. Uh, that's the simple proposition I have, uh, that if we have somehow got this surplus of, of credits, let's give our farmers a break. Uh, they've been doing it pretty tough over the last decade with drought, some, some suffering, floods. And as I said, on top of that, in the last couple of decades, have their property rights stripped away from them. So let's give them some of those rights back so they can do something for our nation that we should all be proud of. And that's grow food uh, that we all enjoy, high quality food. Some of it will be exported, but we do benefit from it too. So let's give our farmers a break and put our country first and reject this silly motion. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Um, well, I think here we are, um, some 11 years on since the Greens um, sided with the National Party and voted down the CPRS. 
and it's you know really frustrating that we're here again with this urgency motion today uh, without a pathway forward on how we as a country and we as a parliament are going to deal with the uh, very urgent uh, case of combating climate change. It feels like we had this motion or this debate at the same time at the end of last sitting period, last sitting um, year, uh, when we it was a decade after the um, opposition to the CPRS, uh, and it really that triggered what has now become known colloquially as the climate wars in this country. And still there isn't a pathway forward. Still people come into this chamber and bicker and point and we're going to be better than you guys and you're not doing enough. And yet the people of Australia deserve, I think, some more leadership from politicians in this place. Um, you know, communities are worried about what's happening to our climate. People are worried about what it means for their jobs. Um, our kids are worried about what it means for their future. And yet here we are 11 years on having pretty much the same discussion. You know, I mean, that's, that's the depressing nature of this. And, you know, I know the Greens come in here and they're holier than thou on this, on this subject, but you are complicit too. You come in here and you point the finger and you vote down things like you did 11 years Order. ago and Senate, look where we Senator are Gallagher, now. Senator Gallagher, I just remind you to address your comments Thank through you, the Thank you, Mr chair. Acting Deputy President. But look where we are now. And it's very easy for, for parties in this place to project the blame onto others rather than to actually look and see what role they have played. And no one has been perfect. But the answer of how we're going to deal with climate change, how we are going to deal with the impact on people's lives, how we are going to deal with the impact of a warming planet, what it means for people's health, what it means for their jobs, what it means for the way they conduct their lives, is only going to happen when we all come together, realise the magnitude of the problem and work together, despite our differences, to map out a pathway forward. And that isn't the approach the Greens political party has taken in this place. Um, when you were given the opportunity to work with, your, you know, with the more progressive side of politics, you chose another way out. Only then, only then to change two years later and vote for a scheme that wasn't as good. Um, that's what you did. And here we are, 11 years on. and. Not, not a, we haven't made any progress. We've got a government that should be held to account that has been woefully inadequate in the way that they have dealt uh, with climate change. We've had, we've had a decade. We've had Order. under this Senator government. Senator Gallagher, please resume your seat. Senator McKim, I remind you of Standing Order 197. Interjections are disorderly. Your leader was given the courtesy of being heard in silence. I ask that you extend the same courtesy to other senators in this place. Senator Gallagher. Thank you. And where those of us in this place who do believe in climate change and do, who do want to see stronger action and who do want to see a pathway to secure jobs and to support communities who will be affected by this transition to help, you know, to, to make sure that they have good jobs, good high-paying jobs, and that they aren't concerned about what's going to happen for their community, their kids. That we are able to support that. Where where that where those part those people work together, you can actually deliver a reasonable outcome. But again, you know, the political imperative of um, the Greens, which really is to attack Labor electorates and make sure that you know, you're blaming Labor for everything instead of focusing wholly on the inadequacy of this government. You know, when we were last in government, emissions came down by more than 15 per cent. Under this government in the last seven years, they've flatlined and have only reduced by 1 per cent. The Paris commitment from Tony Abbott and uh, Scott Morrison is for a 26 per cent Order. emissions Senator reduction Gallagher, cut. I remind you to use the correct titles. So the Prime Minister. And former Mr. 
How is Mr Abbott is fine. He's Mr. no longer Abbott. in this place. Mr Abbott and the Prime Minister is for a 26 per cent reduction cut by 2030, and the government is nowhere near on track to meet this. Their own projections show that we'll only reduce our emissions on current policy settings by just 4 per cent over the course of the decade. And we are becoming increasingly isolated on the world stage, with only 70 per cent of our trading partners, with over 70 per cent of them, committing to net zero emissions by the middle of the century. We've got all of the um, peak uh, groups, whether it be the National Farmers Federation, the Australian Industry Group, the Business Council, all of the commu peak community organisations, the ACTU, all committed to net zero emissions by 2050. But we haven't got that commitment from our government. And part of the reason why we haven't is because people remain so divided about what the right thing to do is. You know? And part of that problem is because our side continues to bicker. Like whatever happened, why, why wouldn't those that believe in climate change and want to see greater action on it come together? work out what we're after instead of coming in here and trying to blame each other and you point at us and tell us how it's all Labor's fault and there is no, there is no commitment to work together. You know, look what happened in the ACT when the progressive side of politics when the progressive side of politics worked together. The ACT is powered by 100 per cent renewable energy. Why was that? Because the progressive side of politics put aside, didn't put aside their differences, worked out on a way to deliver a good public policy outcome. And I know, because I sat in that room, and it wasn't the Greens' political party that forced our hand. It was because we both wanted the right outcome Order. for our community. Senator Gallagher. And that's what we Senator Gallagher. Resume your seat. Senator Still John, a point of order. It is with the deepest sincerity that I draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Quorum required. Ring the bells. Quorum present. Senator Gallagher, you have the call. Uh, thank you. And I think those little procedural um, stunts there um, just seek to amplify the argument that I'm making, which is that you're not interested. The Greens are not interested in actually delivering the outcome here. What they are interested in is getting their social media um, video out, pointing the finger at the major parties, making themselves the, those that are without any fault. And the minute someone draws attention to their tactics and the way they're operating and the fact that we are going nowhere in terms of placing pressure on this government to actually, on their woeful record when it comes to climate change, is part of the problem. You, know, you, you didn't come in here seeking to resolve it. You, you seek uh, you don't seek to compromise. You Order. don't seek to collaborate. You don't seek to do. Senator Gallagher, again, I remind you to address your remarks through Thank the chair. Thank you. The Greens don't seek to do anything that's actually constructive or that might um, deliver the outcome they say they seek. 
Um, and this urgency motion is a classic example. I mean, the motion um, makes it seem that the uh, I think it's a 68 per cent target by the UK, but what you don't say is that it's based on a 1990 levels. You make it look like they're doing. Um, you're, you're using this, the UK order. target. Senator Gallagher, resume your seat. Senator McKim, on a point of um, order. Just on uh, off the back of your previous ruling. Um, Acting Deputy President, when Senator Gallagher says you, referring to the Greens, she is most emphatically not speaking to the chair. Senator McKim, that is true. You also, though, need, if you wish to have that level of adherence to standing orders, to remember Standing Order 197 and the interjections are disorderly. Senator Gallagher, you have the call. A serial offender, Senator McKim, on the interjection front. But the motion, um, as the urgency motion as it's put, has I think the reference to the UK has announced a target of 68 per cent emissions reduction by 2030. What they don't explain there is you're not measuring like with like in terms of the debate that's been currently had in Australia about um, mid-2030 um, emissions reduction targets because the UK target is based on 1990 levels and because of that this motion is misleading and the opposition won't be supporting it. However, if you had been factually correct, if you hadn't been seeking to mislead, Senator Gallagher, resume oh, for your goodness seat. sake, this is the Senator, sixth interruption in Senator ten Gallagher, minutes. Senator Gallagher, resume your seat. Senator McKim, on once a point again, Senator, the senator uses the word "you" when referring to the Australian Greens in direct uh, contravention of your previous two rulings, Chair. You are correct, and Senator Gallagher, I will remind you for about the fifth time. Please refer or make your comments through the chair. Why oh, they're so touchy this afternoon? Um, but the opposition will not be supporting. Well, yeah, yeah, Order. radio, radio. Senator Gallagher, please resume your seat. Senator McKim, I remind you of Standing Order 197 and the fact that you are willfully and consistently refusing to comply with the standing orders. Senator Gallagher, you have the call. Uh, thank you, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. And, um, we won't be supporting the motion because it is misleading in the way that it has been written, and I think that was probably deliberate. Um, and I look forward to the day when the Greens come to the Labor Party with our shared view on the fact that stronger action needs to be taken on climate change and the fact that we have a shared view that um, we should be Putting, asking more and requiring more of the Morrison government when it comes to action on climate change. Uh, when they come to us with a motion that is factually correct and when they collaborate with us and cooperate with us so that we are in a position to support it. Uh, thank you, Senator. Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Acting Deputy President. I'm reminded of uh, when Grandma and Grandpa dropped the kids off uh, after they filled them with sugar. And, uh, I think what they've done is driven, driven uh, the kids today to the, to the, to the Senate chamber. Um, look, uh, in terms of this debate, uh, and noting that I, that I come uh, to this place from an engineering background, I, I'm almost a little bit amused at the way there's this arbitrary uh, declaration of what the, uh, uh, what the emission target ought to be. Uh, like we're able to sit here and, and make a statement that it should be uh, this amount by this time, and then someone else wants to kick the, the ball a bit further or, or, or uh, have some other tactic. What we really need to do is we need to understand that we're, what we're trying to do is have energy that is clean, uh, that is uh, reliable, okay, and that is affordable. That's what uh, I think everyone is trying to achieve, and just throwing out targets of, of one of, of one sort, and then uh, uh, someone else coming back with a different target, and then a few months later a different target is called for. We should actually approach this in an, in an engineering manner. We should actually uh, be developing a long-term national strategy for emissions reduction, and we should be. Uh, uh, whilst it's okay to, to go into uh, to such an endeavour with some sort of requirement in mind, we actually need to work through and, and uh, determine how that might be achieved and in the execution of that plan uh, 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 what the cost is, 
what the outcome is and all the things that are necessary to achieve or, uh, a particular aim and indeed, and, and indeed whether the aim is in actual fact possible. That's the process that we should be taking and doesn't seem to happen here. We just have politicians standing up and saying, this is the new number that I want to declare today as, as the answer. We need to develop a strategy that is mindful of those goals that I talked about and it's mindful of the need uh, to uh, create job opportunities along the way and to grow the economy, uh, to maximise the benefits, minimise the cost and do so in a manner that is uh, without risk. And we want to make sure when we do that, it is a national strategy whereby we uh, uh, have uh, the federal government working hand in glove with the state governments and also working with local councils. And um, we can't do that if we're playing this um, emission reduction target football that we are. Um, I would encourage all to uh, perhaps pick up a, a, a book on system engineering, look at how you might approach a complex problem like this. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, you know, the government needs to very seriously look at a, the national plan that I talked about, a long-term strategy to, to emission tar targets. Have it open for everyone to, to look at and, and uh, criticise. Uh, that's the only way we're going to get a, a sensible outcome, not by um, uh, shouting and, and um, trying to outcompete each, each other in this chamber. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. I think Senator Van has the call next. You, you have a point of order? Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Uh, quorum's been called. Quorum is present. Uh, thank you. Senator Van. Thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. And it's great to be in here to speak on this uh, MPU. It's, uh, and I thank uh, Senator McKim for it. It's like a Dorothy Dix session for, for us on this side. And uh, no doubt he'll try another one of his tricks uh, through this, which I'll, I'll welcome because then I get to have a drink of water when I've got a bit of a rough uh, dose of hay fever today. So, um, Now, Mr Acting Deputy President, the Morrison Liberal government takes climate change seriously and we are, in, and we are serious about delivering real outcomes, because it is outcomes and action that matter, not motions in the Senate, not grand declarations of targets without a plan to achieve them. We on this side of the chamber are ambitious to reduce our emissions, but unlike those opposite, we actually have a plan. Those opposite coming to this place beat their chest, jump up and down, calling for greater action. <clears throat> but when you ask how they would achieve that, what do you hear? What do you hear, Madam Acting Deputy President? You hear crickets. It is clear that those, especially at that end of the chamber, are all talk and no action. They're all bluster and tokenism, positioning and politics. Well, 
we in the Morrison Liberal government are not playing politics on this issue. While those then enter the chamber are talking the talk, we are getting on with walking the walk. So let's talk about the facts, Mr Acting Deputy President. Climate change is a global issue, and Australia, as part of the global community, is taking action. We are 100 per cent committed to a strong and practical global action in response to climate change. We are 100 per cent committed to the Paris Agreement. It was, after all, a Liberal government that signed the Paris Agreement. It was a Liberal government that adopted a 2030 target. It was a Liberal government that adopted a clear plan to meet and beat our 2030 targets. It was a Liberal government that remained committed to the Kyoto Protocol when others wavered. It was the Liberal government that beat our 2020 target by 459 million tonnes. And it will be a Liberal government that will meet and beat our 2030 target. Why, Mr Acting Deputy President? Because of the Liberal government being in charge, we have been able to set ambitious targets and then reach them, all without increases on taxes on everyday Australians and especially small businesses. Those at that end of the chamber when it, uh, and those opposite winning government decided on, the only way to achieve emissions reductions was through the highly hurtful and harsh carbon tax. When Labor left government in 2012, their forecast was that emissions in this year, in 2020, would be 630, 637 million tonnes, and that was with a carbon tax. Last week, we learned that our emissions are 513 million tonnes, 20 per cent lower than what those opposite forecast that we would achieve. And guess what else, Mr Acting Deputy President? We got rid of the carbon tax. When you compare our track record with the track record of those opposite, we've done far better. When you compare our track record with similar economies, we've done far better. Australians' emissions fell faster than the OECD average, faster than Canada, faster than New Zealand, faster than Japan and faster than the United States. Canada is not on track to meet its 2020 target. Canada's emissions have virtually unchanged since 2005. And New Zealand expect that they will only achieve their 2020 target with the use of carryover. That is, New Zealand's emissions are down only by 1 per cent since 2005. As of 2018, well before COVID-19, our emissions were down more than 13 per cent. The latest data has Australia's emissions down by 16.6 per cent on 2005 levels. For those opposite to come in here and say we're not doing enough shows how little they care about facts, actions or outcomes. This Liberal government is getting on with the job. The pathway to meaningful reductions in global emissions is through the development and deployment of new technologies. We're investing in future energy technologies that will support jobs, strengthen our economy cut energy costs and reduce emissions. We are doing this without compromising the affordable, reliable power that Australians rely on. Our technology investment roadmap is focused on reducing the costs of energy, not raising it. <coughs> Pardon me. It is about making sure that there are more jobs and more investment, not less. Getting these technologies right will support 130,000 new jobs by 2030, many of those in regional Australia. And they will maintain Australia's position as a world-leading exporter of food, fibre, minerals and energy, and all at the same time as reducing our emissions. Mr Acting Deputy President, the widespread global deployment of these technologies could substantially reduce or eliminate emissions in sectors responsible for 90 per cent of the world's emissions. We want customers to choose lower emitting technologies because they make sense for them, for their household or for their business. This is not about a government telling businesses or households what they should do. Instead, it is about making sure that those lower emitting alternatives are there and at as low a cost as possible. This is a policy built on liberal philosophy, 
philosophy that has worked well for Australia for decades. Our plan is to reduce the cost of new technologies, not raise the cost of existing ones. In the budget, we also announce our $1.9 billion investment package to create jobs and bring new technologies into play. So, Mr Acting Deputy President, while Labor and the Greens come in here, beat their chest, put forward tokenistic motions, the Morrison government is getting on with it. We're dealing with the issues and we're getting great results. Reducing emissions, achieving our targets, reducing the cost of electricity for all Australians. We are focusing on delivering on the outcomes that matter, not tokenism, positioning or politics. Australia should be proud of our achievements. We should be proud of the fact that we are a world leader in energy, including renewables. We should be proud of the fact that we are one of the very small group of nations that have met all their international achievements. And we'll achieve this while supporting our key domestic sectors, like mining, like agriculture and like manufacturing. And it was interesting in the uh, report that Mr. Senator McKim quotes, and we talk to the, uh, the UK government in their plan. They talk about delivering part of their emissions reductions through the use of advanced nuclear power. Now, perhaps the senators at that end of the chamber could come in here and have a sensible debate about nuclear energy one day. If they're serious about bringing down, if they're serious about bringing down emissions, as opposed to just propping up their mates who, who sell solar panels. So. We celebrate Sorry, Senator, Ben. Uh, Senator, Senator Walters. Thank you, uh, uh, Acting Deputy President. Point of order, adverse reflection uh, by the Senator. It's actually their side of politics and that side that takes money uh, from vested Senator, interests, not the Australian Greens. Senator, asking to withdraw. Senator, that's a debating point. Uh, Senator Van, you have the call. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy Chair. And I'll just wrap up quickly by saying we celebrate Australian achievement. We believe in this country, we believe in enterprise, and most of all, we believe in technology, not taxation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, scientists and businesses and parliamentarians and the Australian community have been calling for the government to take action on climate change. But over seven long years, they refused to listen stubbornly indifferent to the consequences of inaction. Now the Australian government's failures have caught the attention of international leaders who are calling on Mr Morrison to take action on climate change and to commit to strong emissions targets. Not that long ago, five international leaders, including Prime Minister Boris Johnson and French President Emmanuel Macron, wrote a letter to Scott Morrison, my apologies, Mr Morrison, demanding that Australia make a bold new commitment at the Climate Ambition Summit. It couldn't be a clearer message. The world is looking to Australia for leadership, and this government fails the test. Australia has already lost 10 years to baseless fear campaigns against climate action, and we can't afford to lose another 10. When Labor was last in government, emissions came down by more than 15 per cent, and under the Liberals and Nationals we see no such progress. Eleven years ago, almost to the day, the Liberals, the Nationals and the Greens voted down Labor's carbon pollution reduction scheme. And eleven years later, as a direct consequence of that shameful act, Australia is still waiting, still waiting, still missing an effective climate change policy that will see a reduction in our order. emissions. Sorry, Senator Rice. A point of order, Acting Deputy President. Um, the Senator is misleading the chamber. There is no connection at all with that the Greens' is Senator rightful Rice. Um, Senator Rice. voting That's down the, the continue polluting regardless Senator scheme Rice. with our current Senator emissions. Rice. That is a debating point. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr uh, Acting Deputy President. And indeed, the Greens political party are touchy about this question because it was a great mistake 
and it's a mistake for which they have refused to apologise, a mistake they cannot even acknowledge, and it's a, the consequence of that is they continue to be completely unable to participate in constructing a broad-based support, broad support for climate action. And so Labor will not be supporting the Greens' urgency motion today because, yet again, it is characterised by misleading information, and I'm sure that the Greens will see that as no impediment to posting online a whole lot of information, misrepresenting Labor's position on climate action, polluting the political debate with misinformation. But let's be really clear. Labor is the only party with a track record of legislating for climate action, and it's the only party with a capacity to build a broad-based consensus to transition us to a carbon-neutral future. Because right now, at the government, under this government, nothing is happening, and that is by design, and that will not change until we change the government. According to recent research from the University of Melbourne, the cost to Australia of not delivering on the goals of the Paris Agreement, a goal that requires net zero emissions by 2050, is a staggering $2.7 trillion. Excuse me, Senator McAllister. Senator Wish Wilson. Just, just to keep you on your toes, I will draw your attention to the state of the chamber. It is much appreciated. Uh, thank you. Our quorum has been called. Oh, look, they, were, uh, see, they just go park next door. That's what they do. Quorum is present. Uh, thank you, Senators. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much. Um, before the Greens uh, called quorum in this debate, a uh, step that they have taken on multiple occasions for purposes that they are yet to explain, um, I was making the point that the costs of inaction are very significant for the Australian economy and at a time when we are looking for sources of growth, new sources of economic activity, new jobs, it is incredible that the government cannot see the opportunity that is staring them in the face. This is a goal that the CSIRO says will deliver higher wages, higher incomes and lower power costs. It's a goal that the University of Melbourne says will deliver 20 times greater benefits to the economy than any costs. The Business Council says getting to net zero by 2050 will mean $22 billion of new investment per year. All major Australian companies and the National Farmers Federation and the Australian Industry Group are committed to net zero emissions by 2050. 73 countries, including the UK, Canada, France and Germany, have already adopted it as their goal. All states and territories in Australia have already promised to be carbon neutral by 2050, and the Australian and the international community is united in this commitment. But it's the Morrison government that refuses to accept the target and to deny the science, to mislead and lie to the community and refuse to take action. And these failures have a real-life impact. Our government should go to a Climate Action Ambition Summit with a plan for climate, energy and economic reform. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Rice. Acting Deputy President. I want to take you back 40 years when I was 20 and I was studying meteorology at Melbourne University and I had just learnt about the science of the greenhouse effect and the likely resultant changes to the world's climate from the burning of coal, gas and oil. And I was shocked and I thought, this is serious, and I thought the world needs to be doing something. And that day changed my life. 
It made me realise that if the world needed to be taking action, then so did I. I had a responsibility to do what I could do to protect our planet, and that resolve has continued through to the current day. But 40 years of the world not taking action in line with climate science, with my country, Australia, leading the way in inaction over the last seven years, after the highlight of the Greens' Labor government, the Gillard government, from 2010 to 2013, that has been demoralising, because we know now that we have not done enough. And yet we've got governments and the opposition that are still trying to debate the physics and basically to say that what we are doing is, is going to be sufficient, and with the Labor Party unwilling to even commit to a 2030 target. We know that the really damaging effects of the climate crisis that there are really damaging effects already baked in. We are living with the bleaching of our coral reefs, with the largest living organism on the planet, the Great Barrier Reef, having lost half of its corals in the last 25 years. We are living with the places we love being destroyed by fire, our world heritage Gondwan and rainforests, living time capsules that survived a continental breakup and a, man a planetary mass extinction event being destroyed by the worst fires in thousands and thousands of years. And we are living with the deaths of three billion animals. And if we named each one of those animals and we read out their names at a rate of one per second, it would take us 96 years to finish paying respect to them. And we are living with millions of people every year being forced to move due to natural disasters, with global heating causing more frequent and intense disasters, and nearly one billion people living in areas of very high or high climate exposure. And we are living with immense grief of knowing that we are all part of the web of life on this planet and feeling the pain and the trauma of that loss. And that the reality that life is going to be more difficult, more dangerous, less safe for our children and grandchildren than it has been for us. And the denialism from the government and the Labor Party pretending that they're doing enough, playing with figures, compounds our grief in refusing to commit to shifting away from the mining expert, export and burning of coal and gas and oil at the speed and the scale that's required. They create despair and disillusion, especially among young people who know they are the ones who are going to be living through this crisis. So 40 years on, sadly, I no longer have optimism that we will act in time to turn this crisis around, but I continue to have hope that the world will see sense and, at some stage, take the urgent action that's required to shift to a zero-carbon economy at emergency speed. I'm no longer optimistic that Australia will be a leader, but I have hope that we'll be dragged along as a laggard. And my hope is kindled when I see commitments like that of the UK government committing to reduce its emissions by 68 per cent by 2030. I know that Australia could do likewise. So on behalf of every person and every creature on this planet, on behalf of future generations, I urge the government and the Labor Party to build hope and to dispel despair by similarly committing to ambitious carbon reduction targets in line with the science. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Senator. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting De Deputy President. And there we have it. Emotion and hyperbole, not one bit of science. In serving the people of Queensland and Australia, I want to firstly point out that the Greens last week wanted to declare a climate emergency because New Zealand did. Not because of the science, but because New Zealand did. The Greens wanted to declare a climate emergency because Japan did. Yet Japan is building coal-fired power stations hand over fist. Now the Greens want to pledge to increase 2030 targets in line with the science. Yet listen to what the CSIRO has divulged. I asked them, where's the danger? They said they've never said there's any danger due to human production of carbon dioxide. Never. And they said they never would. So why the policy? Why the Greens rants? Secondly, the CSIRO admitted that today's temperatures are not unprecedented. That means we didn't cause the mild warming, that cyclical natural warming that ended in 1995, and it's been flat since. Then, ultimately, the CSIRO relied not on empirical scientific data, it relied on climate models. Models, unvalidated and already proven wrong. 
What's more, the reliance on models means that they have Excuse got me, no sorry. empirical scientific evidence. Excuse me, Senator Roberts. Senator Rice. Order. The senator is actively misleading the chamber. He the is totally misrepresenting Rice, the CSIRO's climate no science point. in senator his Rice, contribution this afternoon. There's no point of order. It's a debating point. Senator Roberts. Thank you. What's more, in, in the last few months, we have, we have made videos and consulted with 17 eminent scientists, including those who've worked with NASA's data, who've worked at senior levels of the USA administration, who've been contributors and lead authors to the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, renowned climatologists, world experts in their field, sea levels, atmospheric gases, atmospheric physicists, mathematicians, former senior Bureau of Meteorology meteorologists, geologists with international awards, former CSIRO re senior researcher, first and only auditor of the Global Historical Climate Network and the climate modelers. This is not a matter of urgency. It is a matter of integrity. It defines the Greens as the deniers of science. So let's now go to the number of— Senator Waters. President, I draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Quorum required? Yep. Ring the bells. Stop the bells. Quorum established. Senator Roberts. So where's the science? Well, I asked the Greens that on Monday, the 9th of September 2019. It's been 445 days since I asked them to provide the empirical evidence proving that carbon dioxide from human activity affects climate. 445 days of zero. 445 days since I challenged them to debate me, Senator Waters and Senator Di Natale at the time. Zero. It's been 10 years since I first challenged Senator Waters in public in Brisbane on the 7th of October 2010 to debate me on the science and on the corruption of science. Zero. It's been almost five years since I've done it again, did it again in June 2016. There's no science from the Greens and they rely on emotion and rants because this is not a matter of emergency. Urgency. It is a matter lacking integrity. It defines the Greens as deniers of science. Why? All because Morris Strong pushed this nonsense. The fundamental cause for propagating the lies about science are due to human weakness. Gutless politicians afraid of differing from a false majority. Here's how he did it. 1972, the United Nations Environmental Program started with Maurice Strong as leader. 1976, a ban on DDT. 2006, the World Health Organization reinstated DDT's use. 40 to 50 million people died because of Morris Strong. 1980, Villach, Austria. 1985, Villach, Austria again. These are the times when Morris Strong had handpicked. Uh, Senator, sorry, Senator Roberts, just resume your seat. Senator Wish Wilson. Yep, a point of order, President, on, on relevance. Um, I know you allow a la fair bit of latitude in these debates, but Senator Roberts talking about DDT on a motion about climate change, um, I feel, is not uh, relevant to this debate. Senator Wish Wilson, that's not a point of order. Thank you. Senator Roberts. President, and it is not a point of order because it goes to the heart of the UN. It is a corrupt, anti-human organisation. And it is in line because not a matter of urgency, it is a matter lacking integrity. It defines the Greens. And their action is in line with the science, means do nothing. Senator McKim. 
Well, um, thanks, Acting Deputy President. State the utterly bleeding obvious. Our climate is breaking down around us. Now, stop and think about what that actually means for a minute. It means that the life support systems of this planet are failing. And what do we get from the major parties in this place in debates while the climate is breaking down around us? We get denial and obfuscation from the government benches, and somehow from Labor, what we're getting is, oh, it's all the Greens' fault. Well, let me remind Senator McAllister, it is not the Greens, it is the Labor Party that still supports the Carmichael coal mine. It is not the Greens, it is the Labor Party that supports fracking the Beedaloo Basin. It is not the Greens, it is the Labor Party that supports fracking the Galilee Basin. It is not the Greens, it is the Labor Party, along with the Liberal Party, that still support the tens of billions of dollars worth of direct public subsidies straight into the pockets of the fossil fuel polluters in this country. But somehow, from Senator McAllister and Labor, it is all the Greens' fault. Well, what I've noticed in this debate as it's evolved over the years and the decades is that the rhetoric of climate denialism is shifting. It's shifting away from challenging the science, and I, ex I, I exclude Senator Roberts here for obvious reasons, but the mainstream debate, the mainstream climate deniers in this place have shifted away from trying to dispute the science because the science is overwhelming. So what they do now is work on delay. And one of the primary ways that political parties work on delay is by setting targets off in the never-never. And the, the party most culpable of doing that in this place is the Australian Labor Party, who have got a 2050 target and fine, have a 2050 target, no problems there, but stop using it as cover for not having a 2030 target because the science is abundantly clear. We've got a decade or less left to take serious, significant and, yes, I will say it, radical action to save the life support systems on our planet, to fix the climate breakdown and any political party which does not have a 2030 target might as well be a party of climate deniers. Every day the majors refuse to set a 2030 target in line with the science. They decide that the millions of dollars they get from their deep-pocketed fossil fuel donors are worth more and are more important than the lives of ordinary Australians and ultimately the climate that sustains all life on this planet. And every day they fail to have a 2030 emissions reduction target in line with the science. They condemn our country to more summers like the one that we just suffered through. They condemn the Great Barrier Reef to death and they condemn millions of species of animals to extinction around this planet. And what have they sold out all those things for? That's right, a few dirty dollars from their fossil fuel donors. Shame. Shame. Senator Steele, John. Thank you, uh, Deputy Acting Deputy President. As a young person, I speak uh, to this motion. Uh, as a member of a generation that is staring down the barrel of a climate crisis, whose future looms ahead as one defined by drought and hunger, fire and flood. Fire and flood. We, the young people of Australia, have been demanding action from this parliament for decade after decade. And yet all we hear in return is the same nonsense, the same robotic talking points delivered by one side of the chamber and another. From one side of the chamber you get excuses 
and the literal talking points of the fossil fuel industry flowing forth into this place. And on the other side, the side where the opposition should sit, you see nothing but spinelessness, spineless cowardice in the face of the greatest crisis ever to face the human species. In my state of Western Australia, we have a state Labor government flush with hundreds of thousands of dollars funneled to them by Chevron, by Woodside Petroleum, and at their behest they are selling our future down a gas-poisoned river. They are fracking the Kimberley, and they dare on the eve of our state election to bring forth a so-called climate policy which does not contain within it an emissions reduction target, which does not retain within it a renewable energy target. On the eve of a uh, season of weather in our state which proves to be one of, the damaging, one of the most damaging in our history, at a moment in time in the history of our state where we as a community have come together like never before to keep ourselves safe from COVID and are now united in our desire to rebuild in a way which enables us to tackle the climate crisis. The McGowan government is making things worse. They are opening up our state to the wholesale selling of massive tracts of our land, massive tracts of country which have been sung and stewarded for tens of thousands of years to the gas giants that are lining their government pockets. It is one of the greatest acts of intergenerational theft in Australian political history. And it is a condemnation upon this place that right now there are children organising across the country for strikes and marches at a time when our focus should be on our education, on our mental health, on planning what we want to do with our lives. We are putting all that aside to plan demonstrations, to be able to plead with this place, to grab it by the strap of the neck and say, please act. Our future is at stake. It is a shame that that should be required of our generation. Senator Steele, John, your time has expired. The question is the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. No.
Stop the bells. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. Those, uh, those, <laughs> the ayes were moved to the right of the chair and the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes and Senator Seawitt as teller for the ayes. There being nine ayes and 31 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. <laughs> Thank you. I shall now proceed to consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. I'll just give senators a minute or two to leave the chamber. Okay. We will now proceed to the consideration of documents. The documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. Senator Waters. Uh, yes, I seek leave to uh, take note of the High Court and your report, if now is an appropriate time to do so. That's, that's, no, you don't need leave, Senator Waters, so go ahead. Thank you. Well, I take note of the High Court annual report, which was uh, tabled today. And this report outlines the High Court's response to allegations of sexual harassment against a former justice. Um, of course, it was uh, Dyson Hayden of which I speak. And I'd like to commend the Chief Justice of the High Court for her swift and comprehensive response, a response that stands in absolute stark contrast to the response of this building and this government to similar allegations. The High Court immediately commissioned an independent investigation into the allegations, and the reviewer, Dr Vivian Tom, was given a broad scope and support to ensure that her review was targeted towards ensuring that similar allegations did not arise in future. Dr Tom's report made clear recommendations to review the culture within the High Court and to invite current and former staff to share their experiences and their views on what can be done to protect staff against sexual harassment. The Chief Justice agreed to all the recommendations. She met with the women who came forward. She believed them. She offered an unreserved apology and expressed her shame that the High Court had not provided them a safe workplace. And she's taking steps to make sure that their experiences are not repeated and that the court has a robust complaints process that women can have confidence in. This government's response to allegations of harassment and bullying within parliamentary offices pales in comparison. The complaints process that exists under the Finance Department remains weak and without practical consequence. There is little appetite from this government to tackle the culture that allows harassment to go unreported and unpunished. 
Few commitments have been made in the response to the Sex Discrimination Commissioner's Respect at Work recommendations. Coming forward with allegations against those in power will always be difficult and will only happen if we create a culture in which complaints are handled respectfully, confidentially and taken seriously. I commend the brave associate in the High Court who came forward. I commend the High Court for its response and I call on the government to follow the example that the High Court has set, to take serious action to improve the culture in this building and to ensure that this building becomes a place that women can feel safe in. Thank you, Senator Waters. Would you like to um, continue your remarks? I seek leave to continue my Thank remarks. You. Thank you. Are there any other speakers for consideration of documents on page four of today's order of business? There not being any other speakers, we'll move to ministerial statements. Are there any ministerial statements? Minister. Uh, yes. I table documents responding to orders for the publication for the production of documents as follows. Federal Court and Federal Circuit Court fees, the Generation Replacement Study and the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility. Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek leave to well, I just take note of uh, the OPD notice of motion number 884 regarding the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility. Go ahead, Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I don't want to talk too much on this issue. Uh, I have spoken about it previously. Um, Senator Green, uh, with my support, lodged a notice of motion last week on this topic, seeking a copy of the review of the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility, also known as the NAIF, better known as the No Actual Infrastructure Fund. Uh, this is the $5 billion fund that was established by this government five years ago uh, to fund projects and create jobs right across Northern Australia. And five years on, what we've seen is that it's actually only spent $218 million. So after five years, it spent less than five cents in the dollar investing in projects across Northern Australia and creating jobs across Northern Australia. The NAIF was the centrepiece of the government's Northern Australia agenda, which was launched five years ago. And if there is any symbol of the failure of the government's Northern Australia agenda and the fact that it has failed to live up to the expectations that were created, it is the NAIF. Uh, and as we say often in this chamber, this Prime Minister and his government are very fond of making an announcement, very fond of getting a headline, not quite so fond of actually following through and delivering. And again, the NAIF is a classic example of this. I think everyone in Northern Australia was really excited about the Northern Australia agenda being launched by this government five years ago and was really excited about the possibilities that the NAIF had in store. But unfortunately, it hasn't come to pass, and it is just another example of this government making a flashy announcement, then running back down to Canberra and never actually following through. And that's why uh, the opposition last week lodged this notice of motion seeking a copy of the NAIF review, because for the fourth time in five years, the NAIF has been reviewed by this government. It's had reviews uh, from the Auditor General. It's had other reviews internal to government, and this review that has been un being undertaken over the last 12 months has been done by the department. It's a review that's required under the NAIF's legislation. So, as people who have an interest in what's happening in Northern Australia and why this government has failed to deliver, we are keen to see this review of the NAIF. The government has already flagged that it intends to make a number of amendments to the NAIF legislation in the new year. What we know about those so far seems encouraging. We've obviously got to wait and see the legislation. And last week, the Senate inquiry into the effectiveness of the Northern Australia agenda handed down a unanimous report across all parties, making a number of recommendations that we hope the government will pick up when it comes to amending the NAIF's legislation. But it would be very helpful, I think, to the parliament in making its decision whether to support the government's amendments, if we could actually see the review of the NAIF. I think it would be very helpful to people across Northern Australia who want to understand why the NAIF 
has been such a dismal failure to actually see the review that the government has been conducting. Let's get to the bottom of why it is that five years on, less than five cents in the dollar has actually been spent from the NAIF. But unfortunately, uh, probably the only characteristic of this government that matches its enthusiasm for making announcements that aren't actually delivered is this government's tendency to be utterly secretive and hold back information from the Australian public. And that's what's happened again in relation to the NAIF review. Uh, perhaps I see the, the minister uh, representing the minister from, for Northern Australia, who herself is from South Australia, uh, has entered the chamber. Perhaps she can enlighten us uh, about what the NAIF review has in place. Um, or maybe her interest is primarily on South Australia rather than Northern Australia. Um, she and I often talk about this. Um, but it is very disappointing that the minister has written to the opposition. Uh, well, actually, sorry, it is very disappointing that the minister for Northern Australia has written to Senator Rustin as his representing minister, advising that he's not able to table the NAIF review today as requested by the opposition. His reasoning is quite hard to understand because he goes on to say that the statutory review of the NAIF was initiated by my predecessor, Senator the Honourable Matt Canavan. I'm not quite sure why that's relevant to the decision of this minister, the new minister, to not table the review. Is it that he needs Senator Canavan's permission to table a NAIF review? Uh, I actually thought it was Minister Pitt, who was now the Minister for Northern Australia, not Minister, former Minister Canavan. I mean, we're reading every day that Senator Canavan is pretty eager to get back on the front bench and uh, get back in the saddle. So I'm not sure whether that's what Minister Pitt is referring to here by saying that the review was initiated by his predecessor, Senator Canavan. I really don't understand why that's relevant whatsoever. Um, Minister Pitt goes on to say that it seems his real reason for not tabling the review is that the review has not yet been finalised. He says that the NAIF Act requires the final report, by which I think he means the review, to be tabled in parliament within 15 days of finalisation. He makes the usual excuse of this government that they haven't been able to finish it because of COVID. Uh, for this reason, the timetable for the review was longer to ensure adequate time for consultation. Uh, and once finalised, the NAIF review will be tabled in the parliament. So I'm pleased that the minister has agreed that at some future date he will table the review into the NAIF. But I suppose I question why it is that this government is out there making announcements that it will amend the NAIF's legislation and that it will change various things to do with the NAIF when they haven't even completed the review, let alone been willing to actually table the review. I would have thought that if this government was serious about making changes to the review uh, to the NAIF, as they say they are, they would have actually finished the NAIF review uh, and then we could see what it says. But it turns out that this NAIF review is ongoing. It must be one of the longest reviews that we've ever seen. I mean, I think we've all resigned ourselves to the fact that the NAIF will take, at current rates, about 116 years to spend its $5 billion budget. It, I can only hope that the NAIF review is not going to take that long as well. Uh, but we certainly encourage the, the minister and his department to finish this NAIF review, to table the NAIF review, so that we can get on and understand what is the problem with the NAIF and what is it exactly that we need to fix. Thank you, Senator Watt. Is there any other ministerial statements? Senator Watt, do you want to seek leave to continue your remarks? To continue my remarks. Thank you. Your statements? No, there being no more, there's no uh, committee memberships, change to committee memberships, and I understand there's no messages from the House of Representatives. So I'll call the clerk. Business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing in the name of Senator Wish Wilson, a reference to the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee. I haven't called you yet, Senator Wish Wilson. <laughs> um, sorry. Senator Wish Wilson, you do have the call. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, 
I'll put this references to the Rural and Regional Affairs Committee, although I was, I was considering uh, potentially putting it to the Environment Committee. It's long overdue in this country that we look at a, a basic and important component of fisheries management. Commonwealth commercial fisheries are designed around a system of transferable statutory fishing rights, or FFRs, and fishing permits that have rules and regulations attached to each. And the aim is uh, to establish a managed microeconomic system that creates incentives and guarantees to achieve ecological, social and economic objectives set out in the Fisheries Management Act 1991. That's the first point I really wanted to highlight. 1991. The system we have in place for our fisheries management for transferable quotas goes back nearly 30 years. In fact, uh, hopefully, uh, if the Senate supports inquiring into this, it will be exactly 30 years since this system was put in place. And you know what, Senators? It's never been reviewed. I've had the Parliamentary Library do a literature search. While there's been aspects of fisheries quota management system reviewed, looking at whether it's achieving its purpose, is it still fit for purpose? Does it achieve the environmental benefits that are so often claimed? Does it achieve the economic and social benefits to communities and so on and so forth? It's a long time since it's been looked at and I believe it's long overdue for us to scrutinise this system, see if it needs improving, see if it needs tweaking, see if it needs reform and overhaul and what other international benchmarks could we be looking at and standards and where do we go from here. The reason I'm raising this acting deputy president is uh, healthy oceans. Obviously fisheries management are a critical component of healthy oceans. And it's generally accepted that Australia manages fisheries better than most countries around the world, our fisheries management system. But that doesn't mean they're perfect. Indeed, there's always room for improvement. And actually, as our oceans come under more and more pressure, as these cumulative impacts build up, uh, things from ocean pollution, like plastics, which we'll debate again tonight, uh, other sources of pollution, overfishing in other parts of the world, a lot of fish species that we fish, such as bluefin tuna, are migratory. Uh, as we see oceans acidify, but more critically, as our oceans warm, as our oceans warm and we lose uh, important habitat and ecosystems, the giant kelp forests of Tasmania, Acting Deputy President, you'd be very familiar with, an ancient ecosystem dating back millions of years that stretched all the way from Flinders Island in the northeast east of Tasmania down to the southeast Cape have all but disappeared. It provided an immense uh, ecological benefit to commercial fisheries and to all species in the ocean. That's gone. That's gone. The Barrier Reef up in the north, uh, half its coral cover has gone in the last 12 years. And so on and so forth. Seagrasses, reefs under pressure. My point is a simple one. As our oceans are under more pressure, we need to be very careful with how we manage our fisheries. And we need to incorporate those changes we're seeing in the broader ecosystems into our fisheries management. We've got to have an ecosystems-based approach to fisheries management. But if you look at the terms of reference that I've put up here, Acting Deputy President, this is primarily not about looking at whether we've got our fisheries management right in terms of the science underpinning the quotas and whether we're necessarily managing the uh, environmental aspects of fisheries sustainably. This is looking at the economic benefits of the way that we manage our fisheries. And I'm very pleased that my Tasmanian colleague, Senator Dunham, is in the chamber tonight to you, to you President, because I know he, uh, he's close to the fishing industry in Tasmania, and this is a matter near and dear to his heart, as it is to many Tasmanians, whether you're uh, a com working in the commercial fishing sector or whether you're one of the many tens of thousands of wreck fishers in the state. Uh, by the way, those groups sometimes don't see eye to eye, um, but they all agree we need to manage our fisheries as, as effectively as possible and we need to get it right. Otherwise, there won't be any fishing in the future like there is today. I think that's 
to me, plainly obvious, if we don't get it right. So Senator Dunningham understands that there's a big question in my home state hanging over whether the transferable quota system, whether it's for state fisheries or whether it extends into Commonwealth fisheries, is delivering the economic and social benefits to our community. In fact, the Institute of Marine and Antarctic Studies did a really interesting report that was only released in December 2019, so over a year ago, that very politely, as often happens when uh, IMAS, a research institution like that, with a lot of eminent economists and scientists put out a report that's well researched, they very clearly rang the bell that we need to do a lot more work on this. We need to do a lot more work on this. They questioned what benefits the average Tasmanian was getting from their fishery for a number of reasons. Uh, and they said this needs to be looked at and it certainly needs to be reviewed. They said they didn't have the scope to do that in their report. They raised a number of issues with the quota-based system, and I'm about to go through some of those in a second. And they said, look, the database is very limited. It's really hard to find information on this. Um, there may be better ways to uh, give benefits to our communities. So, what I, would, what I would like to do in this inquiry is pose the question to the Senate. Um, does this managed microeconomic system, as I described it, um, has it established around this specific set of individual transferable quotas and permits good fishing practice uh, that is both ecologically sustainable and uh, produces good dynamic economic and social community outcomes. And the terms of reference, as, as, as we've set out, they're, they're, they're quite broad, uh, uh, deliberately so. Um, so would, these, would this fishing quota practice uh, result in good fishing practice, including that it is economic sustainable, that the current quota system, how does it affect community fishers? How do they feel it affects them? Uh, does the current system disempower smaller fisheries, smaller fishers, and benefit larger fishing groups? Uh, how does it interact with the enforceability of ecological value of the current system and the current system's relationship to the health of the fisheries? Does the current system result in good fishing practice that is ecologically sustainable and economically dynamic and any other related matters? Now, Senator Dunningham is probably aware, uh, very recently the Tasmanian rock lobster industry had their AGM. And rock lobsters, like abalone, are under a lot of pressure in Tasmania. Things have radically changed in the ecosystem, and the industry understands that they respect that, and they want to put in place a long-term plan for their industry. They want to put in place a 10-year plan that looks at the future of their industry, and it will look at a lot of things like where are their markets going to be, given the problems we've had with China recently. They're very aware of how reliant they've been on China. Um, they want to look at the, how these environmental changes that they're seeing, like the loss of habitat, the loss of reefs to giant, not just the loss of giant kelp reefs, but the loss of reefs to invasive sea urchins that are a very, very pervasive problem. How do they interact with other fisheries? Obviously, uh, Tasmanians in this chamber will understand we've been having to translocate rock lobsters from the south of Tasmania to the east coast, so we have fish to catch. We're actually moving them. But that, I'm hearing, is creating problems from the places where they're moving them from, not to mention other aspects of that that I've heard. And so the industry passed a motion at, at their last AGM wanting their representatives to do something about issues, particularly pertaining to ownership of quotas. So uh, quotas can be owned because they're transferable. They can be owned by uh, corporations. They can be owned by investors, including super funds. And how many of them we don't know, but clearly many of the quotas are owned by foreign entities and foreign interests. Now, of course, this issue came up, and it's a sensitive issue, I'll give you that. This issue came up when Tasmania rock lobsters were sitting on runways in China. The fishermen said to me, what we don't get is we feel like we're being punished because of this trade war and the wine industry is saying the same thing. But their understanding is Chinese interests own a considerable amount of Tasmanian rock lobster quota. They're allowed to own our public resource, our fish, yet 
They're penalising us in the other hand. They don't quite get how it works. So I wanted to find out more about how much exactly is owned by foreign entities and corporate entities and investors, in short, not owner-operators in the industry. And the answer to that question is nobody really knows. Talk about beneficial ownership problems within these corporate structures and holding companies. Nobody actually really knows who owns these quotas. And there are some rules around uh, maximum ownership, but this is not just a problem that Australians are grappling with. This transferable quota system that's been used in fisheries overseas has led to a concentration of ownership in fisheries, where we've seen bigger, bigger scale operations push out smaller owners. If you believe in the free market, you can go, well, that's fine. That's what the free market's dictating. But it's having impacts. Where I have my house in Bichino, there's only two rock lobster boats left. There used to be 40 or 50. The Sunday session there used to be the most swinging Sunday session in the state. The pub doesn't even exist anymore. Sure, the industries we, we have penguin tours and other things now which are filling the gap, but my point is this. These, the fisheries quota system might have been successfully managing our fishery compared to other international jurisdictions, but there really isn't that many fishermen left. So other countries have looked at this and they've said, well, if you want to own quota, you want to own our fisheries, you need to either be whatever the nationality is, you need to be Australian, you need to be Tasmanian, and a country, a, other countries, including uh, European countries, have said you don't necessarily have to be, for example, Norwegian, but you need to have operated here for eight years as an owner-operator. We want to see that you've committed yourself, you've bought your boat, you're employing locals, you're committed to the long term of this industry, to its sustainability and to its future. These fishermen in Tasmania, they don't even know what the succession plan is. And this is not just a problem with fisheries. I've seen it in the wine industry and others. They've invested their livelihoods. They've bought all this knowledge from fishing. But where do they go? Do they just, just sell their quota to a, a foreign uh, superannuation company or a US pension fund? What happens then? Who do they bring in to operate? I think it's high time we at least explore these issues. I'm not going to preempt what the answers are, Acting Deputy President. I don't, I don't know that. But I know there's a lot of people out there with very strong views that it's time for a review, and certainly they have, uh, they have very strong views that things need to change if we're going to better manage our fisheries. But to me, it comes back to the long-term sustainability of the industry, both uh, ecologically and environmentally, because clearly uh, if quota holders are literally trying to squeeze every last dollar out of their ownership of, for example, Tasmanian abalone or Tasmanian rock lobster, they're very short-term in their focus. That's not going to be good for the long-term ecological future of the industry. And to give you an example, a quota was set in abalone last year on the East Coast. But the abalone industry at their AGM, for the first time ever, voted not to catch their quota. Even though the quota was given to them, they walked away from it that year and said, Things are pretty tough. We're not even going to catch our quota. That's because they have this, and they're invested in their industry. They understand it's under so much pressure. So, this is uh, a, also very much about community and economics. Is there a more sustainable way? Do we want smaller uh, fishing operators who are more aligned with their community, who have long-term futures, who can actually train people, who can invest? in uh, new fishing practices, uh, upgrade their technology. All these things are being asked by, by fishermen at the moment. And um, I have no doubt at all that the genuine next that I have seen uh, will be something that we will take on board as a chamber. Something, and it's um, not just my state of Tasmania. I've spoken to senators in here who know this is an issue around the country. All I'm asking for the Senate is let's review it. It's been 30 years since uh, the Howard government reformed fisheries, since the Productivity Commission uh, put in place the levy and the user pay system uh, and brought in transferable quotas. And I accept they have it was definitely better managed than it was under licensing agreements previously, but that doesn't mean we've got it right. Let's have a look at it. Let's see if we've got the settings right. Let's listen to the stakeholders and their concerns and see if we can improve the management of our fisheries and ultimately 
the health of our oceans. Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, this evening Labor supports this motion calling for an inquiry into the fisheries quota system. We note that Australia's federal fisheries regulatory framework is indeed world leading in ecologically sustainable fisheries management practices. The current regulatory framework under the Commonwealth includes two acts with additional and complementary requirements, as we know, under the EPBC Act. Commonwealth fisheries are notably sustainably, sustainably managed in accordance with the precautionary principle, a requirement that is legislated in the Fisheries Management Act and the 2005 ministerial direction which required Commonwealth fisheries to be quota managed. We believe that quota management is generally considered good practice from both a conservation and economic point of view. We hope this inquiry will assist industry and the regulator to better maintain key commercial stock at ecologically sustainable levels and grow the Australian fisheries industry. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Dunningham. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President, and I too am pleased to be able to um, speak to the motion before the chamber at the moment around this uh, reference to the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee moved by Senator Wish Wilson. I am pleased with the acknowledgement um, that's been given to the fisheries sector tonight around uh, how we do things here perhaps better than most other parts of the world, um, but also do acknowledge and accept the point that Senator Wish Wilson made in his uh, remarks there that there's always room for improvement. And I think anyone who doesn't agree with that um, is kidding themselves. So, uh, but look, I do agree with the point that Australia does um, assume a position somewhat as a bit of a world leader when it comes to fisheries management. And I think that that's something that both successive governments um, and supporters of the industry and the industry themselves have to be very proud of, uh, given the work that's been done um, to uh, bring the industry to the standard that it currently is at. Um, this is the se uh, seventh consecutive year that uh, Commonwealth fisheries in this nation have um, been found to be not overfished, which is a big tick for those who operate in our fisheries and those who manage them. Seven years in a row now we've seen positive results when it comes to management of fish stocks uh, in Commonwealth, solely Commonwealth managed fisheries. Um, outcomes like this have been supported by our quota management of fisheries and the pursuit of uh, ecologically sustainable development principles which have underpinned Australia's management for almost three decades, as Senator Wish Wilson pointed out before, since 1991. Uh, the principles of ecologically sustainable development are enshrined in, the Australia's, uh, in Australian Fisheries Management uh, Authority legislation, which incorporates three pillars, ecological, economic and social benefits. So AFMA, the Australian Fisheries Management Authority, take a strong and practical approach to the management of fisheries, such as having robust frameworks, including total allowable catches, individual transferable quotas, harvest strategies and ecological risk, uh, risk assessments. Rather. And I do want to take this opportunity to commend the team at AFMA. I think they do a fantastic job, especially in recent times. And I acknowledge also former fisheries minister, uh, Senator Rustin, here as well. Uh, they've done a fantastic job, particularly uh, throughout the duration of the COVID pandemic, um, trying to uh, adhere to the international obligations that are put upon Australia that AFMA discharges, but by being supportive and incredibly responsive to industry. Um, it's important to point out that quota management ensures that we have a very secure supply of seafood now and into the future. That management of uh, fish stocks is incredibly important. But the point remains that this is not a matter of just setting and forgetting. Um, and I think it was a point that Senator Wish Wilson made. Um, industry is very, very adaptive, very responsive to the conditions they operate in. They know the waters better than anyone else, and they know what's going on. And of course, we've just heard of two examples in Tasmania where uh, changes have been made by industry themselves around how they conduct themselves. And um, it is important to acknowledge that they are, as custodians of the resource and the environment it exists in, uh, good managers, good custodians. Hence, the uh, the world leader status that this nation has in many respects. Um, AFMA continually improves these processes and our country's ability to maintain a healthy marine ecosystem um, with the sustainable quota system forming a key component of our approach here. Um, this not only ensures access to our seafood, which for good reason is recognised globally for its quality and its safety, indeed its 
tastiness. It's also supporting a range of community benefits, starting with economic gains and jobs, but also recreational and indigenous cultural fishing and tourism as well. And so, uh, as I've already mentioned, um, we are very proud as a government, as I'm sure many in this chamber are, whatever political background they come from, of our fishing industry and indeed the management practices we employ here. Uh, and I do look forward to all of that being well on display and demonstrated through the inquiry um, at the Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee. Thank you. So the question is that motion moved by Senator Wish Wilson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Those against say no. I only heard one voice, so the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. Oh, I call the clerk. <laughs> Government business order of the day number one. Recycling and waste reduction bill 2020 and four related bills. Resumption of second reading debate and on the amendment moved by Senator Hanson Young. Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe, I think you're in continuation. I am. Thank you. Uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, for the last three years, uh, they have presided over bushfires, climate change, mass extinction, and a major waste crisis without taking meaningful, meaningful action. It's a government we're talking about. Meanwhile, our oceans, our rivers, our lands, and our country are being choked with waste. The Greens have been consistent in this parliament about what needs to get done. More importantly, we have been working with grassroots mobs and community groups fighting to end plastic pollution in our oceans, rivers and lands. Senator Ludlam in 2009 introduced a private members' bill for a mandatory cash for containers scheme, but those opposite voted it down in 2013. If we had a good and caring government and one that is not there for themselves, that actually cared for country, then they would have strengthened our response to the waste crisis and address how we produce and consume waste, particularly plastics. Every single bit of plastic that anyone has ever used still exists and it's choking our country. The government is making a big song and dance about this bill, flashing it around to take some heat off them while they take a chainsaw to our national environment laws. In some instances, literally like the chainsaws that tore through Japarung country. Do not be fooled. This is the first national waste legislation we have seen in over 10 years. It is a massive missed opportunity if passed as it is without substantive amendments. This bill doesn't address plastic packaging. Think about that. The biggest reform about the waste that we create to go through this place in a decade doesn't address plastic packaging. The actual source of the problem and why our rivers and oceans are being choked in the first place. Now here we are with a dodgy bill that is all, that all headline and no substance. That's what happens when you have a government that is led by the marketing department. A good and caring government would do something about protecting our oceans and waterways from plastics. In the absence of that government, it's up to the Greens to amend this bill to make the issue of plastics, pol plastic pollutions a priority. More needs to be done, and we are here to do it. I urge the government to agree to our amendments that make sensible improvements to the bills to make a real difference to our oceans, our rivers, our lands and waters. First Nations people cared for country, lands and waters because we are connected to them in ways most people could never, ever understand. When this country was colonised, 
Its colonisers and settlers came in here thinking that this was their land and that they have nothing to learn from its first peoples. It's only taken 240 years to trash, burn and desecrate our country. We lived, thrived, survived, sustained for thousands and thousands and thousands of generations. And the colonisers come, and you're all uh, beneficiaries of this stolen wealth in this country. It only took a couple of hundred years for you to destroy it all, and now we've got the climate emergency. So we know a thing or two about managing country and looking after country. You might want to start listening to the first people of the land. We know how to do it. We even have three and four-year-old kids talking about how we need to reduce plastic. You go to any kindergarten. In fact, you might want to do some um, learning back in preschool where they're actually teaching our children how bad plastic straws are. I have my granddaughters FaceTiming me, showing me their new, new uh, straws, recyclable straws and all the things that they're getting through their kindergartens because that's where they, they are getting a real education. Obviously that wasn't available for um, our government at the time when they were at kinder uh, and that's why plastic is uh, not a big concern to them. Listen to us and learn from us or go to the kindergartens and learn from the kids. And your first step should be agreeing to our amendments to approve this bill and listening to the three and four year olds uh, who would also agree. Because if we look after country, country will look after us. Senator Steele John. Acting Deputy uh, Chair, um, uh, I will just give myself a moment for my dinner to go back down my throat, having just graced from the dining room. <laughs> Whew. I obviously don't need to make use of the parliamentary gym any more than I currently do. Um, in, uh, in speaking to this, um, this legislative uh, monument to this government's lack of ambition, um, I wouldn't be able to do justice to this contribution without uh, first acknowledging my uh, esteemed colleague, uh, Senator Wish Wilson, the good uh, senator from Tasmania, or as he's known uh, by those who follow him on Instagram and Twitter, uh, the Senator Surfer himself. Um, I, Pete's a good mate of mine. We've worked together for a good many years now. And I have to say in all seriousness that I don't think there is um, anybody that quite matches his uh, passion for uh, the oceans, passion for our, our precious places and desire to see particularly our uh, rivers and oceans uh, freed of the scourge of uh, plastics uh, that so choke them all around uh, the planet. Um, we know that the issue of uh, plastics in our oceans, of microplastics, um, is of, uh, of, of great urgency, uh, both as uh, something that is affecting our uh, precious places, um, their livability um, for the countless creatures which call them home, uh, but also uh, that the presence of plastics in our food chains are leading to negative uh, health impacts um, for those in our community. Um, we know that if we don't take action uh, here in Australia, uh, in the Asia Pacific and indeed globally, um, then our oceans will become choked um, and our precious places polluted uh, with plastic. Indeed, global consumption of plastic is on track to triple uh, by 2040. 80% uh, of marine degree, uh, debris is indeed uh, uh, plastic and 40% of single use, 40% uh, of plastic is single use with an average lifespan of just 12 minutes. Uh, it is estimate. It's an absolute disgrace. It's an absolute disgrace. 
It is estimated that at least 8 million tonnes of plastic makes its way uh, into our oceans every year, totalling 80 per cent of marine, de uh, marine degree, uh, debris. Apologies. Uh, numerous studies have shown that the majority of plastic pollution found on Australian beaches is produced and consumed locally. Uh, we are indeed polluting, polluting our own blue backyard. Uh, we are only uh, we are only at 60 per cent, 16 per cent of recycling uh, uh, plastic recycling of packaging uh, as of this current moment. So what we have. Uh, is a global challenge of a significant proportion, uh, one which is being, I think it is fair to say, disproportionately contributed to uh, by the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, and we have uh, a situation where Australia, as a member of that region, is not only uh, failing to do its part, it is currently uh, disproportionately contributing to the problem. So in the face of this uh, global regional challenge, uh, we have this piece of legislation, much vaunted uh, by the Prime Minister um, and often deployed, in my opinion, as a distraction uh, from the great howling corporately funded void uh, where more substantive uh, environmental uh, and climate-based policy should be. Uh, we have this uh, legislation around which there is talked a big game around which the Prime Minister uh, likes uh, to draw great attention. And indeed, there are some uh, quite fine aspirations and intentions lying behind certain aspects of this bill. It is uh, necessary uh, that we ban the exportation um, of our waste overseas. Um, and this is the first time that legislation in relation to a, a national approach to waste has come before the parliament uh, in a decade. But it is very important not to be fooled by the hype and the bluster. This is a massive missed opportunity. And if passed in its current form, uh, that missed opportunity will only increase. If the government was serious about recycling and waste reduction, uh, we would have seen a lot more in this bill, particularly in relation to plastics. Um, and critically, uh, if we were serious about uh, both addressing this problem and uh, doing so in a way that is socially just and puts the responsibility of that uh, addressing on the, the, on, uh, fairly and squarely uh, on those who generated and uh, caused this crisis most, we would see uh, aspects within this legislation that would make corporations uh, responsible for their contribution uh, to this massive uh, problem, to the work uh, and the vandalism environmentally that they have done to our oceans um, and to our broader natural environment. Uh, we see none of these aspects in this legislation. Uh, this legislation seeks to ban the, ex the national export of waste uh, while putting in place none of the measures needed to create and support a national recycling industry here in Australia, a national recycling industry which would create uh, thousands upon thousands of good jobs. This is a wasted opportunity that is wa being wasted on behest uh, of massive corporations that are donors to the Liberal Party. Shock horror, aghast, who'd have thunk it? Uh, but it is really worth zeroing back in on the proposition at the heart of this legislation. That being that you can ban uh, the export uh, of uh, these types of waste in the absence of the setting up of an effective natural national structure then to manage that waste something which is particularly egregious given uh, that those that understand uh, recycling and waste management have been desperately lobbying the government. Uh, uh, Senator Wish Wilson has informed me on many occasions of the effort and work done by the industry to attempt to get the government to the table ahead 
of what was a very, um, a very easily foreseeable uh, decision on behalf of countries like China to stop taking our waste. But the government refused to listen, refused to engage, and now even today presents a piece of legislation which doesn't really do the job. When reaching uh, within myself to think of a way to clearly explain uh, what is fundamentally proposed in this bill, I would ask people to imagine how they would feel and what their view would be uh, should they have for, 12, uh, for a decade or more uh, complained of a leaking water system, a leaking sewer system in their house. And after 10 years, a plumber finally comes out to their place and says, oh, you've got a pretty busted pipe there. The solution, in my view, uh, is just to shut off your access to water, uh, shut off your access to the toilet, and shit on the floor. Now, that would not be something that folks would accept, and yet that is the proposition at the heart of this legislation, that we stop sending uh, this stuff overseas. Order. Senator Stilljohn, I will ask you to consider your language and its appropriate use in the chamber, please. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. Uh, that's the contention at the centre of this bill, that we stop sending our waste overseas, that we keep it here, while doing nothing to address the core reasons that it's created and do not a damn thing, not a damn thing, to hold corporations to account for their creation of this waste, for their building into the system uh, of wasteful processes that make it more difficult uh, to uh, care and manage for waste. Uh, you will not see a single line in this bill uh, that talks about product stewardship. Um, it talks about one of the central tenets um, of the need uh, to address uh, waste and recycling. There is nowhere near enough emphasis on making sure uh, that corporations that manufacture and profit from the creation of wasteful products uh, actually do their bit in cleaning up the outcome. I would also like to speak, and I will zero back in on this uh, during the course of the committee stage of the debate, uh, with the leave of my good Tasmanian colleague, uh, on an a often overlooked element of this debate, and that is uh, the reality uh, that there are folks in our community for whom certain plastic products are not a mere convenience but are indeed a mobility aid. And here, of course, I talk uh, about plastic straws um, and the need by many in our community, uh, many disabled people in our community, uh, to utilise plastic straws uh, in our consumption of food and, and beverages and what have you. Um, I said that rather robotically. What I should say is that sometimes you need a plastic straw to be able to go out of an evening and smash a JD with your mates. That's just the way it works. And the reality is that the renewable, uh, recyclable equivalents uh, of straws, renewable straws for instance, are not yet up uh, to scratch, not yet able to replace uh, their plastic counterparts. Um, and there are also challenges uh, when it comes uh, to the safety of some uh, straw replacements, metal straws for instance, uh, when it comes to folks in our community that may experience periodic um, spasmodic muscle episodes that may result in harm to them. Uh, now, as you can imagine, we have heard in the Greens very clearly from the disability community as to uh, the need to address these issues appropriately in any such legislation that would move in these areas, recognising fundamentally, centrally, uh, that uh, the need to create the pressure, the emphasis, the expectation uh, to create uh, alternative uh, solutions uh, should fall upon manufacturers. It should not be the responsibility of disabled people uh, to have to advocate for their right to be able to consume uh, food and liquid like the rest of the community. Uh, and while we must limit uh, the use of plastic products to the greatest de 
uh, agree possible. We must do so while continuing to allow uh, disabled people to use them as the necessary mobility aid uh, that they are for so many people. And that is why, uh, within the amendments being moved by Senator Wish Wilson during the course of this debate, there will be uh, targeted exemptions uh, levelled at, uh, uh, created for the purpose of allowing um, these products to still be used. Uh, by disabled people uh, and have access to them when they are needed. I shall talk in more detail about those exemptions during the committee stage of the uh, debate, uh, but for this second reading period, I think I shall leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Stilljohn. Senator Davey. Thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy Chair. Look, I just want to reinforce to the chamber that the Australian government is introducing this legislation because it does take responsibility for our waste very seriously. We take um, this issue so seriously, we are one of the first nations to have actually stepped out and said we, were, we are going to stop exporting waste. We are going to deal with it onshore, and to do this, we need this bill to pass. And I am absolutely amazed that the Greens aren't backing us 100 per cent in, in doing this. This bill implements that export ban, so we stop exporting our problems to other nations. But that is what we see time and time again from the Greens. They want us to uh, stop mining clean energy, high efficiency coal onshore so that we leave the responsibility of meeting the international demand for coal to other nations who produce dirtier coal. They want us to uh, stop sensible forestry in this nation, whereby we have a sustainable, long-term forestry policy, but they'd rather us export that so we see massive clearing in other nations. We have to stop exporting our problems. We have to continue in this nation to implement policies that increase our sustainability, both for our environment and for our international obligations and for our industry. This export ban that we're proposing for waste glass will commence from 1 January 2021 and all waste export bans will be in place by July 2024. This legislation will also incorporate the existing Product Stewardship Act of 2011 with improvements to encourage companies to take greater responsibility for the waste they generate, including through better product design and increased recovery and increased reuse of waste materials. What in that is going to be a problem? This legislation will lead to increased recycling and increased remanufacturing of waste materials, which will transform our waste and our recycling industries and boost jobs and, importantly, provide massive opportunities for regional areas that have the space to develop waste recycling and manufacturing um, warehouses and the capacity to deal with it. This bill is good for the environment, it's good for jobs, it's good for regions. I'm, I'm still struggling to see what the problem with this bill is. Now, the important thing about this bill, when we're talking about the recycling and waste reduction components of it, it provides a framework for three kinds of product stewardship schemes, voluntary, co-regulatory and mandatory. The voluntary product stewardship scheme drives action to reduce the negative impacts of waste from products and materials on the environment. Again, where's the problem in that? It is a good thing. It also provides accreditation of voluntary product stewardship schemes. A member of such an arrangement can use the product stewardship logo on their products to signal to the community that they are taking responsibility for the waste their product generates. 
the co-regulatory product stewardship scheme, which is a combination of industry action and government regulation, where government sets the minimum outcomes and operational requirements, while the industry has some discretion about how those requirements and outcomes are achieved. The National Television and Computer Scheme is a successful and well-established co-regulatory -reg product stewardship scheme that will continue under this bill. And then the mandatory product stewardship scheme can require a person, such as a manufacturer, importer or distributor of a product, to take specific actions in relation to a product. The mandatory requirements may be imposed where there is a high level of environmental or human health risk. Now, the government has consulted widely on this bill, and the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment have con conducted this consultation over the past couple of years on these measures, including discussion papers, including industry consultation, including a regulatory impact statement. And now we have finally have the bill before us. And I cannot see no reason not to support this bill. I commend it to the chamber. Thank you, Senator Davey. Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thank you, Deputy President, and, uh, and I thank uh, senators for their contributions in the debate of, uh, of these bills. Uh, the Recycling and Waste Reduction Bill 2020, the Recycling and Waste Reduction Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2020, the Recycling and Waste Reduction Charges General Bill 2020, the Recycling and Waste Reduction Charges Customs Bill 2020 and the Recycling and Waste Reduction Excise Bill 2020. Uh, across these bills, uh, they represent a package of legislation that implements the commitment agreed by all Australian governments, uh, working cooperatively together at a state, territory and Commonwealth level, to ban unprocessed waste exports, to strengthen existing product stewardship legislation and to provide a national legislative framework for recycling and waste reduction now and into the future. This will enable Australia to realise the full economic value of waste and to maximise the ability of our waste management and recycling sector to recover and remanufacture waste materials. These, will, these bills will see significant and positive benefits through the creation of jobs, growing the Australian economy and, crucially, reducing the amount of waste that ends up in landfill. The Supporting Recycling Modernisation Fund, announced by our government in July, will see a $1 billion transformation of Australia's domestic waste and recycling facilities, building a sustainable waste and recycling sector to process the waste streams we have been sending offshore. As our Prime Minister has said, it's our waste, it's our responsibility. These bills introduced by our government will seek to turbocharge Australia's approach to product stewardship, to develop a circular economy by encouraging businesses to take greater responsibility to induce the environmental footprint of products across their life cycle. Our government is taking specific action in relation to plastic waste. Since the waste export ban was agreed under the leadership of Prime Minister Morrison, exports of plastic waste alone have fallen by around 5,000 tonnes per month. This is the equivalent of the weight of the Royal Australian Navy's two largest ships each year being saved in terms of plastic waste exports from Australia. Our government is developing a national plastics plan informed by the ideas and suggestions raised at the first ever National Plastics Summit in March. The plan will include initiatives to reduce plastic pollution by targeting every single stage of the plastic life cycle and will recognise that everyone, including governments, industry and the community, has a vital role to play in managing our plastic waste. Under the National Product Stewardship Investment Fund, $10.5 million will be provided to support 15 projects to reduce waste and improve recycling. One of these projects, run by the Australian Food and Grocery Council, will recycle and reprocess 190,000 tonnes of soft plastic packaging per year. That's the equivalent, Madam Acting Deputy President, of almost 200 billion chocolate wrappers. That's even beyond the capacity of my nine-year-old daughter <laughs> or her uh, younger sibling. Under the government's $1.1 million funded National Consumer Education Program, 
the Australian Packaging Covenant Organisation will deliver a series of campaigns to improve consumer and household recycling awareness and behaviours to improve the resource recovery outcomes for packaging. The Australian Packaging Covenant Organisation are also working to gain government accreditation for a voluntary product stewardship scheme for packaging. I note that the Senate Standing Committee on Environment and Communications considered the provisions in these bills in detail and recommended they be passed. I thank the committee for their work and their support and their consideration of these important aspects. The committee made three additional recommendations. First, that the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment continue its engagement with state, territory and local governments, as well as with industry, business and environmental stakeholders in the implementation of these bills, particularly with reference to costs, penalties and the proposed naming and shaming criteria. I can confirm that the Department of Agriculture, Water and the Environment will continue to work closely with a broad range of stakeholders to implement each phase of the waste export ban and to further the product stewardship outcomes sought through this legislation. This will include our consultation to ensure stakeholders understand the Minister's expectations on recommended actions and timeframes for products listed on the Minister's priority list. Organisations will be given ample opportunity to do the right thing prior to being named and shamed. The Department will also provide guidance on potential compliance action and penalties for breaches of legislation. As part of the 2020-21 budget handed down in October of this year, our government announced that it would defer introducing fees and charges by setting them at zero dollars when the regulation starts. This is to provide relief for businesses dealing with the economic impacts of COVID-19 and gives businesses time to adjust to the new regulations. The effect of this will mean that exporters will not have to pay for an assessment of a waste export licence or to make an export declaration for the first two and a half years of the scheme. The department will instead start recovering the costs of administering the regulation from 1 July 2023 and will prepare a cost recovery implementation sta statement in 2022. This will allow for meaningful consultation with stakeholders on the proposed approach to cost recovery and the amount of any charges. We should recognise, Madam Acting Deputy President, and that our government is proceeding with these very important reforms and measures uh, to better manage and better ensure Australia takes responsibility for its waste in the environment uh, of a global pandemic. That notwithstanding the changes that the world has seen through the course of 2020, uh, we have maintained momentum and commitment to these reforms, uh, but we've done so recognising uh, through that Senate committee process uh, and as a result of the advice coming forward that we do need to be mindful of the costs and impacts on Australian businesses as well uh, and make sure that we get outcomes in relation to waste and recycling but that we don't do so in a way that is at the expense uh, of Australian business competitiveness and capability, but in fact that we do so in a way that builds, as our government has sought to do, uh, jobs and opportunities for more Australians in relation to the management of waste and recycling. The second recommendation from the Senate inquiry was that the Commonwealth have a specific focus on achieving alignment of infrastructure, investment and data when working with state, territory and local governments to coordinate the implementation of the bills and broader reform to waste management and recycling. Our government is working closely with states, territories and local governments to implement a program of waste reform measures with a view to aligning just that – infrastructure, investment and data. This includes supporting consistency around single-use plastic bans and delivering agreed national data and reporting improvements. Our $190 million Recycling Modernisation Fund will leverage some $600 million of co-investment from state and territory governments and from Australian industry for critical waste infrastructure. I welcome and applaud the drive and cooperation that we are finding from states and territories and from Australian industry to invest 
in the type of recycling capabilities and plant capacity that is necessary for the vision and reforms we're applying to be able to be delivered and implemented in a timely way uh, that ensures we do get and achieve the optimal outcome of reduced waste going to landfill, reduced waste going overseas, but enhanced recycling in a way that builds profitable, commercially viable industries for the long term reusing those products. The type of co-investment from the Recycling Modernisation Fund working with state and territory governments and industry will create an estimated 10,000 jobs and divert 10 million tonnes of waste from landfill. This will ensure that Australia can have, will have, the necessary waste management and recycling capacity in place by 2024 when the full waste export ban comes into effect. The National Waste Policy Action Plan also features several actions where the Commonwealth will work closely with states, territories and local governments. These include supporting consistency around single-use plastics bans, delivering agreed national data and reporting improvements and aligning education efforts around reducing food waste. Many jurisdictions have shown different approaches in terms of leadership when it comes to tackling questions like single-use plastics bans. These initiatives are important from states and territories. But in terms of ensuring we get both the optimal environmental outcomes uh, as well as the most efficient, regulatory effective uh, um, measures in place uh, that minimise impacts in a negative way on the economy and maximise potential positive impacts on the economy, the cooperation and national harmonisation of questions like single-use plastics bans uh, are crucial, as indeed is ensuring that the sharing and knowledge that can come from enhanced national data and reporting capabilities uh, will help to drive investment in the right sectors uh, of our recycling industry uh, and will help to ensure that the industry advances that are necessary are achieved. The third recommendation that came from the Senate inquiry, uh, the Senate Standing Committee on Environment and Communications uh, investigation into these bills, uh, was for the government to expedite consideration of a cost-benefit analysis of large infrastructure projects, including mandatory targets for the use of a percentage of recycled material. The cost-benefit analysis that underpinned the former Council of Australian Government's decision regulatory impact statement for the waste export ban assumed a $250 million uh, of investments in new technologies and infrastructure and some $100 million to support domestic demand for recycled products. This analysis found that the waste export ban and associated investment in infrastructure is expected to see the Australian economy grow by $3.6 billion in turnover and $1.5 billion in GDP over a 20-year period. Madam Acting Deputy President, this is a clear demonstration uh, of the type uh, of virtuous cycle that we seek to achieve through these reforms and this investment that has the Australian government taking responsibility, Australians taking responsibility for Australian waste. That we cease the practice uh, of unnecessary exporting of that waste into our region and pushing those environmental and ecological pressures uh, into other nations and other locations but instead take responsibility back here. But in doing so, we embrace the potential that technology provides uh, for us to be able to reuse, recycle and generate enhanced economic outcomes as a result of that. And that, of course, is uh, the consistent theme right across uh, our government's environmental policies and approaches. Our determination to invest in technology and capability that achieves environmental outcomes in a manner that supports Australian jobs and Australian livelihoods rather than taxes or takes away from them. The Commonwealth procurement rules, I am pleased to advise, 
are being amended to strengthen the requirement to consider environmental sustainability. In fact, I can advise I think they have been amended, if my recollection as Finance Minister of Publishing those updated Commonwealth procurement rules uh, at the end of last week, have been amended to strengthen the requirement to consider environmental sustainability and the use of recycled content when determining value for money in purchasing decisions. Madam Acting Deputy President, I understand that there were four additional recommendations uh, made through that Senate inquiry from the Australian Greens. Uh, and of course, I note that Senator Wish Wilson has proposed to amend the bill in the Senate to implement these recommendations through amendment sheets 1029, 1043, and 1052. The government does not agree with these recommendations and, as such, does not support the amendments flagged by the Australian Greens. The fourth amendment, that the bill be reviewed five years after its commencement, I'm pleased to inform the Senate, was already implemented through a government amendment to the bill in the House of Representatives. Madam Acting Deputy President, it's uh, my pleasure to commend these bills to the Chamber. These are important reforms uh, that ensure uh, Australia is well placed in terms of our ability uh, to be able uh, to deliver an enhanced recycling and waste reduction regime, to do it in a way that creates Australian jobs and enhances and delivers on our environmental commitments to the region in which we live. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. All of that, that opinion say aye. All against say no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bell for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is that the second reading amendment moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. The eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone as teller for the nose and Senator Brockman, no, Senator, Senator Seawitt. <laughs> Senator Brockman is paying attention. There being nine ayes and 39 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. The question is that the bills be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Recycling and Waste Reduction Bill 2020, Recycling and Waste Reduction Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2020, Recycling and Waste Reduction Charges General Bill 2020, Recycling and Waste Re Reduction Charges Customs Bill 2020, and Recycling and Waste Reduction Charges Excise Bill 2020. Is it the wish of the committee that the bills be taken together and as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bills be agreed to with amendments. And Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, President. I'll, I'll probably just very quickly warn senators. This, we, we might, I might be talking for a while, so uh, although this so, doesn't mean I won't call a <laughs> quorum. Uh, so be careful. Don't don't count your chickens. Don't count your chickens. Um, <laughs> So, uh, yes, Senator uh, Wish-Wilson, so Wish 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 we don't, might just wait for a moment while those who aren't interested in Senator Wish-Wilson's remarks would leave the chamber. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Wish-Wilson. Um, uh, Acting Deputy President, um, I have a number of amendments to move tonight. Um, and just before I move my first one, um, could, I, could I just say that uh, the legislation before us tonight, Senator Birmingham touched on it in his speech. Uh, the government has actually um, 
made six or seven minor amendments to the bill already uh, after speaking with the Greens. Um, senators are probably aware that it, it takes some time uh, for these things to come together. We've been having discussions for a number of months with key stakeholders. Um, we have circulated our amendments that are before the Senate tonight. Um, I would have thought nearly two months ago. Now there have been some minor revisions and we've made some changes, but we've been very, very conscious to make sure that everybody has seen these amendments. Two of them are substantive, uh, and I thank senators for their time, especially in recent days, uh, going through those substantive amendments with us. Uh, but we've, we just wanted to get that very clear up front. Um, we've circulated these with plenty of time, uh, and I, I, I understand that there may be reasons that um, political parties will vote against the Greens amendments tonight, but I certainly hope they're not on back of minor technical details because we have put an incredible effort in trying to uh, work through this with, with, with everyone. So I just wanted to acknowledge again um, uh, Minister Trevor Evans uh, in the other place. Uh, thank you for listening to some of our uh, concerns. As I said, there are six or seven amendments that the government's already put in. They were fairly minor, but they were ne nevertheless important, especially in terms of um, especially in terms of uh, I suppose uh, stakeholders wanting to be more confident uh, that this is going to be a robust piece of legislation. Um, could, could I also say that, um, you know, consulting uh, Minister Birmingham mentioned that the government had consulted very broadly with uh, putting this legislation together. Now, um, having been through a separate Senate inquiry, which I talked about in my second reader speech on uh, the Greens' private members' bill which our amendments are based on. I'm very familiar with who all the stakeholders are. Uh, and may I say, um, consultation is not the same thing as actually necessarily listening to uh, stakeholders as to what they want. Because if you consulted broadly and you'd listened to key stakeholders, uh, then you would be supporting Greens amendments and we wouldn't be having a committee stage tonight. Um, those key stakeholders, if I could very briefly remind the Senate of who they are, they're local governments around the country and local government organisations. Um, who uh, support mandatory product stewardship schemes and they support banning problematic single-use plastics. Uh, there is the uh, environment movement and community groups like um, Plastic Free July, a whole range of groups that also support mandatory schemes and banning single-use plastics. Uh, and then, of course, there's the recycling industry, who I mentioned um, recyclers in Australia employ over 60,000 Australians. They have made it very clear in the Senate inquiry, Senator Birmingham, uh, reference plus the Senate inquiry into my private members, the Greens private members bill, um, that they support, they demand mandatory product stewardship schemes. They have been there for the last 30 years and seen the packaging industry consistently fail under voluntary schemes or co-regulatory schemes to meet their targets. And they say, if you want us to put money into uh, your, you know, your, your recycling funds, if you want us to co-invest, if you want us to upgrade our infrastructure, upgrade our technology, our processes, we need the architecture right. So the fourth stakeholder is the packaging industry, and no, uh, no, no, no jelly beans for guessing who doesn't want a mandatory scheme. It's the packaging industry. Um, however, um, as I as I mentioned in my second reader speech, they were very clear. They the voluntary schemes that this bill enshrines in law. It takes existing existing ambition and says, OK, uh, these are your voluntary schemes, we're going to put them into law. They clearly say they're going to meet their voluntary schemes. They're very confident they're going to meet their 2025 targets. The Food and Grocery Council said that, Woolworths said that, um, Amcor said that. Um, it's been very clear that they're very confident they're going to meet their targets. They also said on record, uh, and Senator Birmingham also referenced additional costs we have to be very careful in this environment about imposing costs. Woolworth said, black and white, in the Senate inquiry that because they're taking their voluntary schemes so seriously and they're so determined to meet their 2025 targets, there will be no additional cost to them of a mandatory scheme because they have to do the same thing anyway. That's direct from a company that has consistently opposed any kind of government regulation around plastics. That's what they said in the Senate inquiry. And I'm happy to read those things to senators or to the minister uh, if they haven't seen those. So this kind of frames up where we are tonight. If we actually want to uh, 
take real action on plastic pollution and we want to create real jobs, uh, then we need to vote for these amendments. We've, we're very, it's very much a half-cocked approach to say we're not going to be able, we're going to ban the export of these wastes, problematic wastes like plastics, which puts the onus back on us to deal with them, and then on the other hand say, well, we're not going to put in place the architecture that actually successfully does that, that builds a circular economy so that everything's designed for its end of the life. The recycling industry is saying, for example, we do not have faith or any confidence that the packaging industry will meet their targets. And if you want us to invest and you want Australian jobs, you want to fix the problem, give us some certainty. That's what we can do tonight. So, uh, Acting Deputy President, um, I would like to start by moving um, my amendment on single-use plastic, which is sheet 1030 revised. So I seek leave to, uh, to move to move that amendment. Don't need leave. Is leave granted? Leave is granted, Senator Wish Wilson. Okay, thank you. Um, so let me start by talking to this one. Um, I was very pleased with Senator Birmingham's contribution talking about the need to harmonise. And that's a word that's come up consistently in our Senate inquiries, the need to harmonise a state-based approach to banning single-use plastics. Back in 2017, when the world's first Senate inquiry, which um, a number of us participated in, I was very proud that this Senate uh, looked into the problem of marine plastic pollution, and one of the recommendations was, was to ban certain single-use plastics. Unfortunately, the European Parliament beat us. They were the first parliament in the world to look at what they found in the beaches and their oceans, and uh, their definition of a single-use plastic was something that had a readily available alternative. So it wasn't going to inconvenience customers, it wasn't going to inconvenience businesses, but they could determine what these 10 pr plastic products were, like plastic cutlery, for example, uh, and they could say, we don't need that. We're going to ban the sale of it, we're going to ban the production of it. Um, there are better alternatives. So they came up with this, uh, this legislation that was world-beating, and um, I was quite keen to include some of that in an amendment, but after discussions with Labor, we've kept, we've, we've revised, um, we've revised uh, certain aspects of our, of our other amendments to uh, incorporate just the, uh, the packaging covenant ambition. But to get back to single-use plastics, so the European Union have done this, they've done it. Okay, so it's. Definitely possible. And uh, for the Prime Minister who claims he who told the UN he wanted to act on plastic pollution, for the Prime Minister, um, if he wanted to do one thing in this parliament, just one thing, to stop plastics going into the ocean, he would do what the European Union did, take the ten most common plastics we find in the ocean that we've already got alternatives for, and he would simply ban them. That would be the most important thing he could do. But that's not on the table, it's not on the cards tonight, except in a Green Amendment. No one's been able to give me a good reason why. Especially, and here, here's, here's the rub, because the states are already doing it. Recently, Queensland banned single, certain single-use plastics. South Australia led the, led the charge, as they did uh, around container deposit schemes uh, many years ago. Uh, Western Australia has just put in place a ban on single-use plastics. Sadly, Tasmania, Victoria and New South Wales haven't followed yet, but they're very likely to do that. And everyone agrees, whether they're the packaging industry, whether they're the recycling industry, whether they're local government, who, by the way, are also banning single-use plastics at a local jurisdiction, everybody agrees we need a national scheme. We need harmonisation. Now, I accept it's not going to happen overnight, uh, Acting Deputy President. That's why we have given a, in our bill, after consultation, we have given plenty of time for this ban to come into place, where we actually harmonise the scheme. It's good for business, it's good for the ocean, and it's exactly what the Australian public want, let me tell you. They are ready for a ban on problematic single-use plastics. Thank you, Senator Wish-Wilson. The question is that the amendments 1 to 4 on sheet 1030—oh, sorry, Senator Steele john I just would like to uh, seek leave to speak to the amendment as well. Leave. Oh, just leave. leave. Okay. What a wonderful invitation. Thank you. Um, uh, so I'd like to uh, to speak to this uh, particular amendment because I think it uh, showcases how important it is as we uh, legislate around these critical issues 
to be engaged with uh, the communities, all of the communities uh, in our, um, well, in our different states uh, that may well be affected by uh, legislation as it passes through this place. Um, the reality is that uh, disabled people are uh, very much environmentalists too. Uh, we don't want to have to, uh, in the uh, course of these debates, have to choose between uh, the mobility aids that we need uh, to live our daily lives and uh, the action to protect our environment um, that we know is so urgently uh, needed. Uh, we don't want to have to put our own care needs above the environment uh, to have an, uh, and have an effective uh, solution to this uh, that ensures that our voices are part of a process uh, and that implementing policies which interact with our care needs. And this is a really critical point. To avoid uh, ending up in a situation where you, you've got yourself a really damaging dichotomy, it is so important to engage with disabled people in these processes. Um, and we have uh, done uh, just that myself uh, and uh, Senator Wish Wilson have worked with the disability community over uh, the, the process of putting together these amendments and it became very clear that there were a number of issues that needed to be addressed, one of which is uh, the reality that renewable uh, straws are not appropriate or usable by many disabled people. And that there are various reasons why disabled people require plastic straws and why some do not uh, have the ability to use uh, alternatives such as metal, uh, paper, glass, bamboo or indeed silicone straws as has been proposed by some. Now often these issues relate to the nature of the person's uh, impairment. Uh, some of the other reasons raised by, by the community include the fact that these options uh, can potentially harm disabled people and that these harms can include choking hand, uh, hazards and quite serious injuries. Um, they also create difficulties uh, with being able to appropriately uh, position and use uh, straws. They can incur a higher cost and uh, many of them um, are not safe to use uh, with high temperature liquids. Um, we can create uh, solutions to the massive uh, environmental challenges that face our society uh, while also being inclusive of disabled people and I think this is the critically important point. Uh, there is work to be done in the development uh, of uh, renewable straws and reusable straws that do meet these accessibility requirements and the pressure and the onus to make these developments must lie fairly and squarely with manufacturers. It should not be the responsibility of disabled people uh, to advocate for their right to be able to consume foods and liquids like the rest of the community. Uh, limiting the use of plastic products to the greatest degree possible whilst continuing to allow them to be available as a necessary, full, uh, to, as a necessary tool for disabled people uh, to use to eat, eat and drink uh, isn't unreasonable, it is indeed very achievable. And we have specific sections um, of, the, uh, of the propositions put forward by Senator Wish Wilson which deal with this. As I say, we have worked closely with community uh, to develop these solutions um, and we would like to acknowledge uh, that banning plastic straws and the conversations that often take place around these topics uh, impact on uh, disabled people. They're often a source of distress because being able to go out in public, to be able to drink in public and socialise and participate in community life uh, is really important and that is why into this uh, proposition we have built in uh, relevant exemptions. Uh, that this amendment uh, has within its sections which relate specifically uh, to exemptions in relation to the need to use plastic straws as a mobility aid. And with the short time I've got left, I will read uh, the particular sections of the exemption. Um, uh, one, uh, that it would be a... Uh, so I'll read the, the relevant section that is proposed by Senator Wish Wilson, that is 94M. Uh, and uh, section one, an act in relation to the prohibition of plastics uh, is exempt, so a plastic item is exempt uh, if it is uh, to be supplied uh, to a person or class of persons with a, a disability as defined under the Disability Discrimination Act 
1992 that the disability is such that a failure to supply a straw would cause an inconvenience or potential harm to the person or class of person. Uh, that the rules may provide that a specific act in relation to a prohibited plastic is a plastic exempt act, including by providing that an act is a plastic exempt act if specified conditions uh, mentioned are met. Uh, three, before the minister makes the rules that provide a specified act in relation to a prohibited plastic, the minister must be satisfied that one or more of the following uh, in relation to the act has been satisfied, that it is necessary to satisfy food and safety requirements, uh, that the act is necessary to ensure that the access need of one or more persons is, being, uh, is met, that the act relates to medical purposes, therapeutic purposes or purposes relating to health, um, and that the act to providing uh, for ensuring the security of personal safety of one or more specified persons or class of person. Uh, so the comprehensive structure that we offer um, is one which would lay the framework for a flexible uh, structure in, in which we could deal with what is undoubtedly, uh, undeniably, an environmental challenge of significant proportion, uh, while also ensuring the retention of the right of disabled people uh, to use the mobility aids that are available to them in a way that enables us to be part of the communities in which we live. Um, I want to thank Senator Bush Wilson for his uh, engagement on this issue. It's been uh, a pleasure to work with him on it um, and to continue to work together as we uh, chart a course in this space that avoids uh, false dichotomies uh, between protecting our precious places um, and ensuring that the rights of disabled people are upheld. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator McAllister. Uh, thanks very much, Madam Deputy President, Acting Deputy President. Um, I might indicate at the beginning that um, Senator Wish Wilson is correct. He has sought to engage with certainly outside of the chamber in relation to his amendments, and we thank you for that. We thank him for that. Um, and it may be that we are able to provide support for some of the amendments that have been circulated, but uh, in relation to the one before us now, we will be opposing this amendment. Um, it's true that some single-use plastics uh, are unnecessary and harmful, and they should be designed out and eliminated as soon as possible. And as Senator Wish Wilson indicated, uh, some state and territory governments already have or are planning to take legislative action to do exactly this. It really doesn't make sense for these things to happen uh, one by one without the coordinated support of the federal government. Nonetheless, it's not responsible to try and tackle this issue through an amendment without coordinating the reform process with those states and territories and also seeking an analysis about the impact of the approach that's selected. And it's on those grounds that we are not in a position to support the amendment tonight. But we do call on the Morrison government to stop advocating what should be the Commonwealth's national leadership role. We should look to avoid repeating what has happened with container deposit schemes, with different schemes, different arrangements across different states and territories. Uh, Senator Wish Wilson referred to harmonisation. The only entity possible that is capable of doing that is the Commonwealth, and the Commonwealth should take that responsibility and commence work with states and territories uh, on this question. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Wish Wilson. Thanks, um, thanks, President. Um, I might start with a question to the Minister on this uh, this this amendment. Uh, and perhaps if I could just very quickly um, just run through, because this is the most common question I get asked by people: What does a single-use plastic ban actually mean? Uh, and the media of could say, "Well, what are you actually going to ban?" So just very quickly, we this exemption would ban by 1st of January 2022 uh, lightweight carrier bags, um, some some of which have been banned in states, but. Uh, not, not um, comprehensively. Uh, microbeads, which are still part of a voluntary scheme and haven't been totally banned. Um, by January 
1st, 2023, so in three years' time, um, six, a six-pack plastic ring holders. Um, and if you don't think they're bad news in the oceans, um, go on to my Instagram. I'll give myself Senator Surfer a plug. Um, go, go on and have a look. And, there, and I know you, you, a bit of joviality there, but the, the, the picture is very serious. It's a, it's a fairy penguin in my home state of Tasmania. A friend of mine was a bushwalker, took a photo of it. He, um, he runs a big shop in Launceston, it's quite well known, and the penguin's been choked by one of the six rings. The other five are sticking out from around its neck, but you can clearly see where this poor distressed bird has suffocated like, and I don't exaggerate this, millions of other sea creatures from plastic ingestion. We know hundreds of thousands of birds alone die from plastic ingestion, not to mention other creatures uh, who uh, cross paths with a whole range of different plastics in the ocean. Um, so we want to uh, remove cotton buds, uh, balloon sticks, st straw stirrers, cutlery, plate bowl or other dishes, polystyrene food or beverage containers, oxo-degradable food or beverage containers. Um, and I will say that even in the West Australian, uh, the recent West Australian government ban, they highlighted the need for federal coordination at some stage. So, so my question is to the minister: um, These are products that have readily available alternatives, uh, and they're based on the EU, uh, the EU bill. Um, minister, um, have you uh, are you familiar with the directive of the European Parliament? and of the Council on the Reduction of the Impact of Certain Plastic Products on the Environment, or what's commonly referred to as the EU Directive, uh, which was passed in March 2019 and formally adopted by the Council of the European Union in May 2019. Are you aware of the details of that legislation and the fact that they banned uh, these harmful single-use plastics to the ocean? Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chair, and, uh, and thanks, Senator Bush Wilson. And uh, can I uh, thank you for your amendment? And uh, at the outset, uh, thank you and Senator Steele John for uh, the thoughtful contributions uh, you made in relation to moving uh, the amendment, and Senator Steele John in his contribution in terms of the framing of the amendment and some of the exemptions uh, that uh, that were uh, considered and, uh, and placed by the Australian Greens uh, in this amendment. Um, uh, I, I thank you because I know that um, uh, the amendment uh, and indeed um, the contributions you've made uh, come from uh, a very genuine place uh, in both of your uh, instances uh, and, uh, and of course the outcomes that you are seeking to achieve through, uh, through these amendments are outcomes that I think Senator McAllister indicated uh, sympathy for and, uh, and they're also outcomes that uh, the government uh, has, uh, has sympathy for in terms of uh, seeing an end of use in relation to certain plastics, uh, an end of use, uh, an end of manufacture, import or distribution ultimately. Um, uh, plastics that you've cited in your amendment, uh, such as shopping bags and straws and microbeads. Um, now, as has been acknowledged and was acknowledged by you uh, in your contribution, Senator Wish Wilson, uh, states are already legislating to phase out uh, a number of single-use plastics, uh, and the Commonwealth uh, does look to play a supportive and, where possible, coordinating role over time in this regard. Uh, I referenced in, uh, in my contribution the National Plastic Summit uh, that brought together uh, um, states, territories, industry and others uh, in March of this year, um, which is, uh, is outlining the development of a National Plastics Plan. And, uh, and uh, that seeks to target the different stages of the plastic life cycle, uh, and, uh, and I think that, along with other fora that bring together Commonwealth, State and Territory uh, environment ministers, provides an opportunity uh, for, uh, for us to work towards um, uh, a greater harmonisation in relation to the steps uh, that the states uh, are taking, uh, and, uh, and we welcome that. Um, industry too are taking steps, and, uh, and we note that um, there has been a substantial phasing out of, uh, of microbeads, uh, some estimated 99.3 per cent now phased out, uh, and the government will continue to work uh, with industry along with the states and territories uh, in that regard. We do believe at this stage uh, that seeking for cooperation and collaboration is, uh, is the appropriate way uh, to be able to build upon the gains that have been made. Um, and uh, and 
uh, to maintain that goodwill in those discussions, um, which is why we do not support the amendments uh, as you've put them forward. I should also thank you, Senator Wish Wilson, for your acknowledgement of the work of Mr Evans uh, and some of the engagement undertaken in, uh, in your remarks. Um, you ask a question in particular about the European Union's uh, directive. Um, uh, Senator Wish Wilson, uh, I don't have details around that directive uh, before me uh, tonight. I am uh, in broad terms uh, aware of its existence and, uh, and aspects of it. Um, uh, also that, um, uh, that, uh, that the nature of our parliament passing a law and its application uh, if passed into law across the country is sometimes a little different to uh, an EU directive and the extent to which the, uh, the 27 member states um, at various times or places pass those directives into law in their own different procedures and practices. But um, uh, I don't, as I say, have the details there, uh, but I do, uh, do, whilst opposing your amendment, uh, acknowledge the good progress being made by many states uh, and certainly commit the Commonwealth will continue to work collaboratively where we can with the states to, uh, to uh, help them on this journey. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Um, yes, I acknowledge that obviously dif different parliamentary structures. However, I think we all agree Australia is a nation girthed by sea, uh, and we are a we are an ocean loving uh, community very broadly. Um, even people who live further inland than those who live near the coast still love love their oceans and and, and take these issues very seriously. Um, and I would just remind the Senate this is not this is obviously this this amendment is based on the European legislation which was primarily aimed to help reduce the impact of marine plastic pollution um, but it also is recognized by the recycling industry in fact APCO uh, have one of as one of their voluntary uh, one of their voluntary targets is to phase out problematic single use plastics why because they can't be recycled um, there's talk of different techniques that potentially they could be recycled, but everybody knows they're problematic. Um, they cause problems in the sorting process. Um, they go to landfill. Um, they need to go. So everybody seems to recognise uh, we need we need to do something about this. Um, I was particularly interested in the government's response to this because, I mean, the, as as I mentioned in my second reading speech, the prime minister he went to. New York and address the UN General Assembly and said Australia was going to lead on this issue. Yet what I see from the European Parliament is, is leadership on reducing single-use plastics. But here's my question, Minister, because um, I noticed in your speech and in, in many, of, uh, many contributions from Liberal senators uh, talks about plans, plans, lots of plans uh, to complement what we have here today. Um, the problem is twofold. Um, plans such as your plastic plan, we haven't seen the detail. And plans aren't legislated. Uh, they're not necessarily going to be enforceable. They're, they're policies uh, that I think we all agree, doesn't matter who's in government, that will live and die at the whim of a government. And the recycling industry and others are saying they want to see legislative certainty. They want us to get the settings right. They need that certainty to invest to move us to a circular economy, to move us out of the waste crisis. And of course, uh, for those many millions of Australians who care about the impact of marine debris and marine plastic pollution on our marine life, uh, they want to see this done. So, Minister, um, why haven't you released your plastics plan? When will you release your plastics plan? And will there be a comprehensive strategy in your plastics plan to phase out problematic single-use plastics. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Minister. Thanks, um, uh, thanks uh, Madam Chair. And, uh, and look, I, I note uh, Senator Wish Wilson's remarks in relation to, uh, to the Prime Minister's commitments to leadership in this space and, uh, and his references to plans versus action. Uh, I guess in response to that, I would point out that uh, that at the time the Prime Minister made those remarks, he had a plan to ban the export uh, of waste. 
Tonight, the parliament is considering legislation that gives effect to that plan. Uh, and so I, uh, I'd contend that leadership clearly is, uh, is being displayed in implementing and working uh, against the plans that our government has developed uh, to be able to be, uh, in many ways, uh, um, uh, world leading in terms of uh, restricting um, uh, the export of waste. I also note that, uh, in this sense, commensurate with our federation and consistent with it, uh, we've taken leadership in the areas as a national government of our obvious responsibility, that is how we engage with the rest of the world, uh, and that we have said very clearly that the exporting of waste is not something that Australia should do. It's inconsistent with the commitments that, uh, that we think we make to the rest of the world and particularly to our region. And that's why, as a national government, we, uh, we are applying uh, the ban and the commensurate steps to be able to deal with the flow-on impacts of, uh, of that. The states and territories historically have, uh, have had uh, lead responsibility in relation to some of the matters that your amendment touches on, uh, and it is part of the reason why we, uh, why we think that um, uh, it's appropriate to continue to back and encourage uh, their leadership to support that, hopefully to a point of, uh, of consistency across a large range of areas, uh, but that it is about uh, supporting uh, their, um, their autonomy in a federation, but also encouraging that leadership. Uh, the National Plastics Plan, uh, which is uh, as I say, being informed by the ideas and suggestions raised at the National Plastics Summit in March, is now moving into, uh, into the next stages, particularly around that cooperation and collaboration with industry in the states and, uh, and territories. And, uh, and I'm advised um, that consultation around, uh, around um, the draft plan uh, will be able to commence around uh, Q1 next year or thereabouts. Uh, and, that, uh, and that we should be in a strong position to then be able to progress the implementation of that, just as right now we are implementing uh, the uh, waste export ban that, uh, that we had previously announced. Thank you, Minister. Senator Wish Wilson. Yeah, look, thank you, Minister. Um, as someone who does care deeply about this issue and, and has genuinely campaigned to reduce plastic pollution in oceans for nearly 15 years in, in and out of this place. I, I can tell you um, it was absolutely clear. The Prime Minister first said in a press conference in Sydney that his daughter had asked him to take on this issue because school kids, children care about this. They wanted him to act. And he very clearly said in the, at the UN that he would address the issue of plastic pollution in the ocean. Now, ask any senator. Uh, and you, Minister, to tell me how this legislation tonight reduces plastic pollution in the ocean. Because I can tell you, and I'm, I'm not being facetious at all or you know, you know, in, in any way uh, you know, not genuine about what I'm saying, but an ex a waste export ban bans the export of waste, and I support that, the Greens support that. I like the idea that we can deal with this issue in this country ourselves. We shouldn't be sending particularly contaminated, low-grade waste to other countries where it's out of mind, out of sight. I like the idea, but how is this bill going to tackle the issue of marine plastic pollution? Because it excludes plastic packaging. And I would say it deliberately excludes plastic packaging. I do recognise what you said in your contribution, Minister, that. Um, APCO are going to seek to apply to become an accredited product stewardship scheme under the Act once it passes. And that's great. I talked to Minister Evans about that. It was raised in the Senate inquiries, and I was glad that APCO said they were agnostic about that. I was glad when the Food and Grocery Council said they would support that. So it's great that they're going to become an accredited product stewardship scheme, but it's voluntary. And I don't need to remind the Senate of the fact that APCO have never met their targets, have always fallen way short under the NEPM, under that alternative structure. I will once again recognise tonight that I do believe APCO are doing things differently and they're they genuinely saying they're, gonna, they're pulling their socks up. But the problem is the recycling industry just don't agree with that. They've seen this problem going on for too long and they want it addressed. Um, so where does a ban on exports of plastic waste 
intersect with acting on plastic pollution in the ocean. It could actually make things worse. It could actually make plastic pollution worse. If we go down the road, uh, as was uh, outlined in Senator Hanson Young's uh, second reader amendment, to just burn this stuff for energy, you know what that's going to do? Let's put aside all the arguments whether you're for incineration of plastic or not. You know, the arguments around efficiency, uh, emissions, uh, CO2, toxic emissions. The problem is this. If you continue to go down this road of the lowest common denominator and waste to energy is just slightly above on the waste hierarchy going to landfill, what it means is you are going to produce more plastic, consume more plastic, and what we know is that plastic consumption, especially single-use plastic, is highly correlated with litter. And that's the problem we've got with our oceans. Some of it comes from maritime sources, but the majority of plastics in our ocean come from land-based sources, from rivers, from beaches, from parks, from landfill, from a whole range of different sources. If we don't change the way we consume and the way we produce and redesign for a circular economy, we're never going to solve this problem. So these, this waistband could actually be even worse if we don't have the architecture in place. And I would argue that a ban on the most dangerous single-use plastics that already have alternatives that the Australian people want to see is a very sensible amendment. By the way, we're giving everyone three years to work with the states to go through that process, which I agree is very important. Senator McAllister raised it. Yes, we need to be working with the states. But like I said, West Australia themselves even said in their statement they want to see federal leadership on this. We're all heading in the same direction. Um, here's an opportunity tonight to legislate that, and we've got three years to work for it. But you know what? We've at least given the Australian people some certainty that this is going to happen, because the federal government has shown leadership on what I would argue, putting climate change aside, is the biggest pollution issue on this planet that we all have to play our part on. We all have to do our bit. Plastics through the ocean, the scourge, the toxic tide of this stuff that's all through our food chain, it's through everything. We have to start acting now. Right now, tonight, the Senate has a chance to do that. And I would urge all senators to support this amendment. And of course, you wouldn't be surprised to know um, if, we don't do, if we don't get this amendment up successfully tonight, we won't be giving up. Because I don't think the Australian people would find that acceptable. Uh, and Minister, um, I know you. You seem, you seem to not be in a position to want to provide any detail around your plastics plan, um, but I will look forward to its release with great anticipation and hope that you have some very detailed and comprehensive strategies for phasing out single-use plastics. And we'll recontinue the debate after that. So I commend uh, this amendment to the Senate. The question is that the amendments on f one to four on sheet one zero three zero revised be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is that the amendments on one to four on sheet one zero three zero revised be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seward, teller for the ayes, and Senator McCarthy, teller for the noes. There being 30, 11 ayes and 35 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Would, could honourable senators either resume their seats or leave the chamber? There are more amendment sheets. Senator Wish Wilson. Oh, oh, oh. Just in case any senators are wondering, I may talk for a little bit on this one too, <laughs> um, acting Deputy President, because um, it is such an important it is such an important topic. Um, I'd like to uh, I'd, I'd like to seek leave to move another substantive amendment. So there's two substantive amendments tonight. One we've just dealt with with a ban on on single-use plastic. Which I'm, I'm very sad to say hasn't been supported by the Senate tonight, but we won't be giving up. Um, and the second amendment that I would like to um, seek leave uh, to move is sheet 1134. That's um, what, 1 to 11. Is uh, leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you. And I just would, would also. Uh, mention to the Senate what I mentioned earlier that we did pull. Um, we did pull amendment uh, on sheet 1029, so that we, that will not be moved tonight. That's that's off the off the menu. Um, and the reason we, we pulled that was because we had we had some very constructive discussions with uh, with senators from from Labor and, and other parties. And uh, what we've done in this amendment is actually very simple and very straightforward. We've taken APCO's the Australian Packaging Covenants um, voluntary schemes. Uh, which they're very confident they're going to meet, 
They provided that evidence to two Senate inquiries. Their key stakeholders, the Food and Grocery Council, said they were going to meet their targets. Um, Woolworths said they were going to meet their targets. Amcor said they were going to meet their targets. They're very confident. So we said, great. If you, want to, if you can talk the talk, then you won't mind walking the walk. We're simply going to take what's already in existence and, and mandate it tonight, so that by uh, 2025 uh, the targets that are currently voluntary, uh, which is to have 100 per cent uh, of all packaging when you walk into the supermarket, is either going to be recyclable or compostable. Um, 30 per cent of uh, that packaging will be made from recycled product. And of course, that one is absolutely critical to the recycling industry uh, in Australia. Uh, if they had confidence that APCO were going to meet their targets, we wouldn't need a mandatory uh, product stewardship scheme that's being moved by the, by the chamber tonight. Um, because that allows them to uh, invest, increase their recyclate, take plastics for, as an example, and they know there'll be a market, a readily available market for that plastic, because in law in this country, that packaging, 30 per cent of it is going to have to be made from already recycled material. Now, that's very important to the waste management associations. Um, the evidence is very clear. Um, Rose Reid and Gail Sloan spoke at two Senate inquiries uh, and were very upfront that they wanted a mandatory product stewardship scheme. In other words, they wanted the certainty, they wanted the policy certainty that their industry could invest the money and get on with the job. And that means Australian jobs. That means tens of thousands of Australian jobs. And if senators uh, probably don't necessarily know just how jobs rich potentially the recycling industry is, um, in, a, in, a, in a recent report uh, on the recycling industry, a, 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 an independent uh, report, um, uh, which I'll get you the name for in a second, um, Sorry, which I'll get you the name for in a second. Um, it was very clear that even just washing, better washing recycled material could lead to 20,000 new jobs in this country. This is from an in, the uh, Technology uh, Centre in Sydney, uh, engineering excellence, who are looking at how to re-engineer products, who are looking at the processes that, that are necessary. Um, that report is the only independent assessment of the state of recycling in Australia and how we build a circular economy. Uh, but they're clearly saying uh, if the recycling industry had the policy certainty, and they don't, they outline that as one of the key problems with this government's approach. That, by the way, they're very complementary of the government's approach in other regards. But what they said was their feedback from speaking to stakeholders was very clearly that they didn't have the confidence, uh, the necessary confidence to invest. <coughs> the recycling industry across the board doesn't believe that we have the policy settings right in this legislation, but they do support a mandatory product stewardship scheme for plastic packaging. Now remember, they already employ 60,000 Australians, and they're the ones saying there's tens of thousands of new jobs if we get on with building a circular economy and fixing the waste crosses and looking after the planet. So um, I will just reiterate to senators that um, not only have these key companies, uh, and by the way, I was on a fantastic hookup that was organised uh, with Plastic Oceans, with the CEO of Amcor and other stakeholders. And the CEO of Amcor, the second biggest packaging company behind Vizzy, said on the call, and I've got the transcripts, he supported mandatory product stewardship schemes. Not just product stewardship schemes, he used the word mandatory product stewardship schemes. So I sometimes wonder why the government just won't do this, why they won't give the recycling industry, local governments, community groups and environment groups the certainty they need that we will finally have a policy framework so we can meet our targets. No more uncertainty. Let's get on with it. Lastly, could I just reiterate that uh, Woolworth said in their submission, and they said it under evidence, because I asked them very specifically, uh, that there's no difference to their costs of meeting a mandatory scheme versus a voluntary scheme, because they're taking it so seriously and they're getting on with it. They understand this is a significant matter of public interest. It isn't going to cost them any more to have a mandatory scheme. Right? So this idea that somehow mandating voluntary targets is going to cost 
businesses more money. Actually, there's no basis in fact to it at all. There's no prescriptions here about exactly how industry should meet them. The Senate in this legislation is not saying to the industry, here's your targets, this is how you're going to meet them. It's like, you've got voluntary targets, great. You love them, you're talking them up. Don't mind if we put them in law. Up to you how you meet them. Go away and do it. Fantastic. We can breathe easy knowing that by 2025 we've finally got on with the job of building a prop rebuilding the recycling industry, having a proper circular economy and actually protecting our planet. That's what this is about. It's a win-win for everyone. The only group, as I said, who have opposed it seem to be a couple of the big, bigger packaging companies. So um, I really don't understand why we wouldn't support this tonight. Uh, and I would say I've been through some detail in my last two and a half minutes or so. Um, this essentially uh, asks for businesses with a turnover of over $5 million. So no small businesses will be captured in the packaging industry. There's not many small businesses in the packaging industry as it is. There's plenty, by the way, in the recycling industry who want this amendment. Plenty of small businesses that want this amendment in the recycling industry. Packaging companies with a turnover of $5 million don't have to report to the minister. The minister, when he receives reports for those businesses over $5 million, can look at them. If he sees that there's a problem with them meeting their targets, he can then ask for a please explain. He can then go to the process of providing a direction. If they don't comply with that direction, there's still discretion at that point as to whether the minister will actually put in place penalties or enact those penalties, which are in this legislation. This is based on the mandatory product stewardship scheme that already exists. There's no reinventing of the wheel here. This is a very simple but extremely important amendment. And, um, you know, if we amend this tonight um, and it goes to the House, I would ask the government to consider that we've all done a good job here. We've all done our bit to try and solve the waste crisis. We've all done our bit to create Australian jobs in the recycling industry. And we've all done a solid for the oceans. And the Australian people expect that. They're listening and watching tonight, um, or they'll be listening into this. this is, I've never seen an environmental issue as big as plastic in the oceans. It cuts across every... No one likes it. It doesn't matter who they are. Um, that everybody wants to do something about it. And this, this one's very simple. So um, I would urge senators to uh, support this amendment. Uh, and um, please, let's hold the packaging industry to account. Let's take what they've said they're going to do anyway, put it into law and therefore give the recycling industry the certainty they need to invest in a circular economy. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, Labor supports this amendment. And in reflecting on the significance of the proposal before us, it happens that I also have had a long professional involvement with uh, the waste and recycling sector and I had the good fortune quite a number of years ago to work for the New South Wales EPA where there were some very creative and thoughtful policy makers there and it has been a long objective to actually get the packaging um, and uh, the packaging products working in the circular economy and that mm. has been on the agenda for uh, many, many years. Uh, it's a decadal project. And of course, when Labor is in government, it's a project that we are keen to pursue. We have a very strong record on effective reform in the product stewardship space. In government, we delivered the Product Stewardship Act, and these bills uh, continue that uh, trajectory. Labor established the first co regulatory scheme for computers and televisions, and that's a scheme that today remains very successful. Uh, we have so, I'm sorry, Senator McAllister. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, De uh, Acting Deputy President. I draw your attention to the state of the chamber. Uh, quorum. Okay. Thank you.
19. Quorum, quorum present. Senator McAllister. Uh, thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. Senators, I would just urge that you uh, depart the chamber, if you could, please. <laughs> Senator McAllister. It's been great. Um, we, Labor does. I was speaking about Labor's support for the Greens amendment before us now, before I was interrupted by a senator who called attention to the state of the chamber. Um, what I was saying was that we do have concerns about the lack of progress being made under the voluntary plastic packaging targets for 2025, and we agree that the government's overwhelmingly, or perhaps underwhelmingly, hands-off voluntary approach has not been effective to date. Only 16 per cent of plastic packaging used in Australia is then recycled. The government has pledged a rate of 70 per cent by 2025. But how can we possibly be satisfied that this will happen if we don't change the regulatory framework that has so far and for so long allowed the recycling rates of plastics to remain appallingly low? So, in line with the views of the waste and recycling industry, we support a stronger approach, one that would see improved recycling outcomes for packaging by ensuring the agreed Australian Packaging Covenant targets, which are already in the National Waste Policy Action Plan, have a mechanism in place through which they can be achieved. It's worth noting, as I did in the second reading debate, that the forthcoming ban on the export of plastic waste will not naturally result in a serious lift in recycling and remanufacturing unless there is greater producer responsibility with respect to design for recycling and reuse and a commitment to the incorporation of recycled content. And that is what the scheme would achieve. This is critical to realising not only the environmental outcomes that we're looking for, but the new jobs and the economic activity that would come through establishing a proper recycling industry. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Minister. Thanks, um, thanks Mr Chair. Um, so, uh, so, Mr Chair, the government doesn't support uh, these amendments. Um, uh, there are a number of existing processes that are uh, occurring at present, uh, and, uh, and we think it would be prudent uh, to, uh, to be able to enable those processes to run and assess progress at a future point rather than impose another process or expectation on uh, industry. Some of the steps we're seeing from industry at present in relation to, uh, to packaging uh, and some of the regulatory frameworks that already exist at the state uh, and indeed Commonwealth levels um, uh, do, uh, do see real progress and we're concerned that another layer will not necessarily be helpful at this point in time. Um, uh, we see APCO, indeed acknowledged, I think, by Senator Wish Wilson, working to implement the 2025 national packaging targets, which will see 70 per cent of plastic packaging being recycled or compost composted by 2025, um, and, uh, and working to gain government accreditation for their packaging product stewardship scheme. Uh, the government has already uh, put in place a legislative framework focused on packaging uh, via the National Environment Protection Used Packaging Materials Measure 2011. Uh, which I understand will be reviewed uh, over the course of the next 12 months, providing further opportunity. We've, of course, already discussed the role of the states and territories in phasing out problematic plastics and the Commonwealth's willingness to play a supportive and coordinating role in that regard, as we have also discussed the role that the National Plastics Plan will play in relation to uh, the development of various measures and initiatives to reduce plastic pollution uh, across every stage of the plastic life cycle. Uh, the government is also concerned that at this time, this, uh, this rather uh, challenging economic time uh, coming out of recession, uh, that, uh, that uh, the type of additional um, uh, red tape uh, requirements or costs that could accrue uh, to some 26,000 Australian businesses uh, may not be uh, helpful, uh, that it is better to uh, push and encourage the type of processes underway to be fully implemented. Uh, than, to, uh, than to see potentially iconic local uh, food manufacturing and processing businesses like Bundaberg, uh, Cooper's Brewery or Beechworth <coughs> Honey uh, facing, uh, facing additional um, cost pressures potentially. So, uh, so Mr Chair, at this stage uh, the government is, uh, is not inclined to support uh, these Greens amendments, uh, but certainly, uh, certainly through the different steps that are underway uh, continues to, uh, to uh, expect to be held to account uh, in relation to uh, seeing continued decline 
uh, in the use of single-use plastics and, uh, and greater responsibility in the management of plastics. And, uh, and I certainly note, I think, Senator Wish Wilson's opening remarks that, uh, uh, that I acknowledge he is nothing but persistent in relation to such matters. And, uh, and so I would anticipate fully uh, that, uh, that as we work through the implementation and development uh, of that National Plastics Plan, uh, that, uh, that we will certainly face uh, further uh, uh, engagement from the Greens and, uh, and scrutiny from the Greens on those matters uh, and, uh, and welcome the opportunity to be able to outline the next steps of process, uh, progress that will be being made. Senator Wish Wilson. Acting Deputy President, I've just got one word for this notion that somehow this is going to add an extra process or costs to what's already in existence. Now, I'm going to choose this word very carefully, I and I'll say, that. I'll say bunkum. Okay. okay. Baloney. Two words. Okay. The, we went through this ad nauseum in the inquiries. We are simply taking the existing voluntary process, no changes to that, and saying, keep going, but we're going to mandate your targets. That's it. There's no additional processes on businesses, no additional costs. They admitted that in the Senate inquiry. They're doing this anyway. Senator Birmingham said in his last contribution that APCO, the Australian Packaging Covenant, are applying to become a voluntary accredited product stewardship scheme under the Act. They are going through this anyway. There are no additional costs. But let me tell you what there are, Senators. <coughs> There's penalties if they don't meet their targets in 2025. If the minister at the time, he or she, chooses to go down that road. But the incentive is there and it's very clear. The Australian people and the recycling industry expect you to meet your targets this time. Just a quick reminder, in 2005, the previous iteration of the Packaging Covenant set themselves a five-year target for 2010 of 30 per cent of all materials plastic would be recycled, 30 per cent of all packaging. And as Senator McAllister said in her contribution, in 2020 it's 16 per cent, not even half of their 2010 target. Now, while I accept APCO are a different a different iteration, different group now, and they're getting on with it. It's not acceptable to the recycling industry. If we want the jobs and we want the investment, we really need to accept, put all aside all this fear campaign about extra costs. There won't be any, Acting Deputy President. There won't be any. But there will be consequences if the industry is greenwashing and full of spin, and no one's going to be there to hold them to account. APCO, the packaging industry, have never been penalised for their dismal failure. By the way, a dismal failure which APCO themselves were open and honest about in the Senate inquiries that talked about this. APCO, their CEO, was very clear that they had failed. There was no doubt about that. There was, the trustless were different. I'm not going to criticise them at this point, but I can tell you the stakeholders in the recycling industry aren't confident that that is the case. They want the certainty and they want it tonight, <coughs> Acting Deputy President. So I just would say to Senators uh, once again, we have the opportunity here to put up a very significant amendment that is actually very simple and very effective and will go a long way to helping fix the waste crisis. It is what one of the biggest employers in this country, 60,000 Australians for one industry. That could be a whole lot larger. It's what they want. Let's give it to them. Let's get out of the waste crisis. Let's build a circular economy where everything has a value. Everything's set up for its end of life. Everything's designed. Enormous innovation potential going into this. Research and development. Green jobs. Let's, let's vote on it tonight. So I commend this bill, this amendment to the Senate. The question is that Australian Green amendments 1 to 11 on sheet 1134 by Leave Together be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. 
Against no, the noes have it. Division required, ring the bells. Stop the bells. So the question is that the amendments moved by Senator Wish Wilson, sheets uh, numbers one to eleven, sheet one one three two by leave. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. Though the ayes shall move to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Giacconi as teller for the ayes and Senator Dean Smith as teller for the noes. Beg your pardon. I think I gave an incorrect. I think it's one one three four.
Aí. Order, there being 33 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is negated. So I'm in the hands of the Senate. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Can I say how disappointed I am? Uh, no, yeah, like, to, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. No, I don't need to call a quorum, but, but generally, I'm, I'm, I'm really disappointed that we actually that we had a chance, and, and I want to thank the Labor Party for supporting this amendment. Senator McAllister said they understand how important jobs are, especially in rural and regional Australia. The recycling industry is a huge employer, and it's a shame that One Nation here tonight doesn't know the value of jobs in rural and regional areas. They have turned their back again on the battlers in these areas, the industries that's going to employ them. Recycling, in many cases, will employ low-skilled labour, but there's a huge demand for low-skilled labour. They've supported the big packaging companies, some of the wealthiest companies on the planet, some of the biggest donors to the Liberal Party. They've supported them tonight, turned their back on holding big business to account after 30 years of failure and inaction. And I've got to say, Acting Deputy President, they're mad as meat axes, these people. You can't give them any logic, any sensibility, it doesn't matter what you do. And this country is being held to ransom by one nation. So let me make that very clear here tonight. Now, Acting Deputy President, I would now like to move. I have a number of other uh, amendments here that I would like to move. Um, I will move uh, amendments uh, on sheet 1052 revised, which is a product stewardship ship scheme advisory group. And are you seeking leave to move them I'm seeking together? Leave to, I'm seeking leave to move that. Is Thank leave you. granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. So you've moved uh, one to four on sheet 1052. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, under the original uh, legislation in 2011, uh, when the Product Stewardship Act went through, um, it was considered important to have a uh, group of eminent uh, experts and uh, very important stakeholders who could advise the government around their product stewardship uh, schemes and their product stewardship act. And while I accept the government has a very good initiative in place with a product stewardship scheme, a product stewardship centre of excellence, uh, which is a new initiative and a new plan by the government, uh, which will look at how to constantly improve product stewardship schemes, how to make them work, it doesn't matter what kind of waste product or waste stream we're talking about here. It could be uh, computers, e-waste. Thank you, Deputy President. Could you perhaps ask uh, some of the senators to leave the chamber if they're not? I will ask those senators who are not in involved in the debate to please leave the chamber. Take your conversations outside. Thank you. Senator Wish Wilson, you have the call. It doesn't matter what waste stream we're talking about. It could be uh, solar panels in the future. It could be wind turbines, as uh, Senator Roberts raised in his, his uh, fantastic contribution. It doesn't matter what kind of product scheme, stewardship scheme we're talking about, um, the centre of excellence, I do believe, from what I've heard from speaking to very informed and experienced stakeholders, is a good initiative, and I uh, applaud the government for that. Um, but, however, uh, the advisory group uh, is independent. Uh, it has uh, key and eminent stakeholders. And while this Senate removed the advisory group from the Product Stewardship Act, it was part of the, uh, this government's uh, war on green and red tape. Um, I do, and I stood up in the Senate chamber. In fact, it was two Christmases ago, I remember, exactly this week, the night of our Christmas party, that I argued we shouldn't remove this advisory group. They play a very important role in working with government and making sure that product stewardship schemes are independently assessed and that they have that kind of external advice 
which is important to the department. So um, I commend this uh, amendment to the Senate. Senator Roberts. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, I seek just to make a response to uh, Senator Wish Wilson's comments. Senator Wish Wilson approached me this morning to discuss his amendments, especially 1134. I invited him into my office straight away. We made arrangements. We spent a good deal of time listening to him. And, he, and there's some merit in some of his uh, some some details in his amendments. We also then took a responsible position and invited the government to respond. We asked them questions. We genuinely analysed and considered and reviewed both positions. In the end, we believe that the that the Greens amendment will add additional burdens that are not worthy of uh, consideration because they will put an additional 26,000 businesses under enormous paperwork loads, and some retailers, small businesses, people are already burning the midnight oil. Order. They will hurt small companies and hurt retailers. We also learned that there is a consultative process underway with the government involving state governments and other entities in this country, and we will wait for that to happen and have, let it happen properly, and then we'll assess that on its merits. We will let that consultative process continue. Senator Wish Wilson. I have to respond to that, Acting Deputy President. Um, I won't disclose the, the details of our conversation this morning. May I say One Nation have had these amendments. One Nation, for nearly two months, we've been speaking to their office for many, many weeks, as have a number of stakeholders, speaking to their excellent advisers who I believe supported these amendments. I don't know what your reason was, Senator Roberts, for turning your back on the recycling industry tonight and the 60,000 Australian it employs, but I hope they note, I hope they note your uh, excuse that you've just given for not supporting this, that somehow you've bought the packaging industry lies and disinformation that this is going to add extra costs to business. I was very clear that industry themselves said it wouldn't. And it excludes small businesses, and I went through that with you ad nauseum this morning, Senator Roberts. So it's clear you've made up your mind. You've chosen to side with the big packaging companies and with the government, and you've turned your back on it. And now you're trying to make uh, excuses and work your way through it. But there is no evidence at all that this is going to add to the costs. We are taking an existing process and mandating it. That's all we're doing. I don't know how many times. I have to explain it to you, but I'm sure what, how many, no matter how many times it's not going to sink in. So that's all I have to say. The question, Senator Roberts. Acting Deputy President, thank you. Our advisers were initially recommending to oppose this amendment. We listened to Senator Wish Wilson. They thought there was some merit in continuing the discussion. We then invited the government and they addressed Senator Wish Wilson's positions. When we consult with people, and when we want to influence people, when they disagree with us, we don't get upset. We just accept it that they have a view and we respect that view. We know that small businesses will end up with huge, massive paperwork loads. We're not willing to have that. There are many other flaws in this. There are some points of merit, as I said, but on balance, we are not going to support uh, Senator Wish Wilson's motion amendment. We just didn't. The question before the chair minister. Thanks, um, thanks, Chair. If I may bring us back to the question before the Chair, um, uh, which I understand we are on uh, Amendment Sheet 1052, um, which, um, in which the Australian Greens, Greens are seeking to re-establish the Product Stewardship Advisory Group. Uh, the government's view is that uh, this amendment is, uh, is unnecessary and duplicative uh, in the sense that the uh, government uh, has already provided uh, amendments to recognise the advisory role of the newly announced Product Stewardship Centre of Excellence. Um, this uh, $1 million supported Product Stewardship Centre of Excellence will play a key role in driving Australia's circular economy towards the 80 per cent recovery rate across all waste streams by 2030. Uh, the new export body will provide mentoring and best practice guidance to both new and expanding product stewardship schemes. I understand the Centre of Excellence uh, will be uh, housed or coordinated by the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, and clearly will provide the type of independent, excellent advice uh, that, uh, that, is, uh, that is appropriate in these circumstances. 
Senator McAllister. Uh, thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, I'll just give an indication of Labor's voting position on this amendment, and we will be supporting this amendment. Um, Certainly under the product stewardship arrangements that Labor put in place in 2011, there was an independent statutory body in the form of a product stewardship advisory group, and it was taken away by the Abbott government, which, not unlike this government, had a general aversion to independent advice and oversight. Um, and so, while Labor was successful in getting the government to strengthen consultation through amendments made in the other place, uh, for example, by inserting a requirement that the minister must consult with states and territories and also with the soon to be formed Product Stewardship Centre of Excellence. Uh, we consider that there is real merit in the proposal before us. There's little doubt that an independent statutory advisory group would be a better and stronger source of input and assessment. Very quickly, Senator uh, Wish-Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Just very quickly, um, just to uh, sort of make myself more clear. Um, the minister, um, under the bill, the minister still doesn't need to consult directly with stakeholders, um, like, for example, uh, a uh, environment groups or uh, recycling groups. Uh, the word is very clearly "may consult," and uh, we we believe that um, the you know consultation amendment um, is drafted so that we you know we make that compulsory that the, that the government does seek that advice. There being no further contributions, I will put the Australian Greens amendments, numbers one to four on sheet 1052, revised, and ask that those amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells. He ran away, Ian. He ran away.
stop the bells. So the question is amendments one to four on sheet one zero five to um, move together by leave. The question is the amendments be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone for the ayes and Senator McGrath for the noes. <coughs> Order. There being 32 ayes and 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll just give senators a moment to depart the chamber. Can we depart the chamber in relative quiet, please? And I will give Senator Wish Wilson the call. Thanks, um, Acting Deputy President. This one's fairly simple. I'd like to move um, amendment on sheet 1032 revised, uh, one and ten together. Uh, I seek leave to do that. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. Um, no need to talk to this one for, for too long. Um, I, just might, I might talk a little while and let senators leave the chamber and then have to come back. No, I'm only kidding. It is Christmas after all and we all need the exercise. Um, this one's uh, simply about financial contributions. Everybody agrees we need better information, um, better labelling laws. Uh, the problem is uh, when you're look, talking about education programs, how do you fund them? So this, this amendment is fairly straightforward. Uh, it requires members of the uh, packaging uh, covenant, uh, or if it potentially is a new iteration, if it falls under this legislation as a voluntary product stewardship scheme, and it requires certain members to make financial contributions to help pay for raising that education uh, and awareness. So it's actually fairly straightforward, and I commend the uh, amendment to the Senate. Senator McAllister. Thanks very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, Labor opposes this amendment. Uh, we do believe that producers should be held responsible for ensuring that the products that they manufacture can be recycled and producers should be expected to shift towards circular and sustainable use of materials. That is how we will achieve better outcomes for waste and recycling, and that means better environmental outcomes, less resource depletion and new manufacturing opportunities. However, Without any expert analysis uh, with, of the impacts and the benefits of a plan such as proposed in this amendment, Labor can't support it. 
Uh, it's not really clear that this is the best way of achieving the change that's intended and there has not been sufficient engagement with producers and other stakeholders. Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, Chair. Uh, the government uh, also opposes this amendment. We'd rather see industry given the chance to deliver on its commitment to the national packaging targets and to establish a government accredited product stewardship scheme for packaging. Uh, we do not uh, believe it's appropriate at this time to impose uh, levies on industry as costs that would likely be passed on to consumers uh, when there is um, a high degree of goodwill and activity seeking to achieve uh, the outcomes already. The question before the chair is that the amendments 1 to 10 on sheet 1032 revised be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
stop the bells. The question is that amendments 1 to 10 on sheet 1032 revised be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt, tell her for the ayes, and Senator Ciccone, tell her for the noes. There being 10 ayes and 38 noes, the matter is negated. I will just give senators a moment to resume their seat. And I shall give the call to Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. So, um, senators would be pleased to know we've only got a few uh, amendments to go. Um, I'd like to seek leave to move uh, amendments on sheet uh, 1031 revised. Uh, there being no one objection. And four there being no objection, leave is granted. So this amendment is essentially on um, on stronger stronger labelling. Um, these amendments would propose. Labelling requirements for certain plastic products to alert consumers uh, of the potential harm of the product to the environment. Um, you know, by January 2022, so uh, in a couple of years' time, uh, the packaging of the following products must state that the product is harmful to the environment if released of or uh, incorrectly disposed of. Um, uh, sanitary products, uh, wet wipes, balloons, and cigarette filters. Now, could I say, in relation to the single use plastic ban, uh, Acting Deputy President, that the biggest criticism that I got for putting, this, for putting up the ban of single-use plastics tonight, um, the, the amendment which sadly was voted down, was that it didn't go anywhere near far enough from people that have been campaigning in this area for, for decades. Uh, for example, they wanted a ban on single-use plastics to include balloons, uh, helium balloons. Um, they wanted cigarette filters banned. For those people who don't know, cigarette filters are plastic. Um, if you put them in uh, water and you leave them for a few months, come back, um, you'll see that it's full of plastic filaments. And of course, cigarette butts are the most common item that we find on our beaches in Australia. They make their way into the water. It doesn't take them long to decompose, and then you have millions, if not uh, potentially billions, of pieces of microplastic in the ocean from cigarette filters. Um, so filters, uh, 
was something we'd love to have banned, but we knew that was going to be very problematic. So we wanted to stick to items that had readily available alternatives that people could use. That doesn't put a disadvantaged business. But what we did want to do was at least have stronger labelling that let consumers know that, for example, when they buy balloons or they buy cigarettes, that these things, if not disposed of properly, will be extremely harmful in the ocean. And we all know balloons. Um, while we've worked on balloon releases, uh, we know um, it's becoming very politically uh, incorrect to release balloons now at public events. Sadly, there are still balloons being released at some events, but most people get now they go straight into the ocean. Every balloon you see in the old days in the MCG is going straight into Port Phillip Bay or even further in the ocean. Um, at least we've cracked down on that, but this is the best we can do uh, without going too far. Now, that's not something you'd normally hear from, from me or the Greens, but this is our version of compromising. So that's what I'm saying to the Senate is it's not a big deal, but it's important, so please support it. Senator McAllister. Uh, I, I'll indicate Labor's voting position. We oppose this amendment. Um, when it comes to lifting waste and recycling, as I've made clear all through this evening, the current labelling regime falls a long way short of what's required. But this is a complex issue and it can't be fixed by forcing plastic manufacturing manufacturers to apply some form of warning message on their product, and that risks further complicating a current mess of labelling features. <clears throat> Poor product design, and it is about design, means that for some packaging only certain elements of the product are recyclable, and that forces us to use very complicated labelling that makes it very difficult for consumers to understand what they are supposed to do with the product in their hand, a conversation I have with my family on a very regular basis. Um, we would like to see a comprehensive review of label packaging. We think that's necessary to determine what kind of reform would be sensible and effective, and we call on the government to undertake a full review of product labelling that would drive change through consumer choice, greater transparency, increase proper sorting and disposal, and allow responsible producers to be recognised for making sustainable product decisions. Minister. Oh, thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. The government doesn't support this amendment uh, either. Uh, industry has delivered strong uptake of the Australasian recycling label. Uh, over 400 APCO members are now committed to its use, and those numbers continue to grow. Uh, as I've noted before in this debate, industry has also delivered on phasing out microbeads, with 99.3 per cent of use now phased out. Uh, for these reasons, uh, we don't support these amendments by the Greens, uh, which would apply regulation onto industry. Uh, when in fact government working cooperatively with industry is already achieving significant outcomes. The question is that uh, Greens Amendments 1 to 4 on sheet 1031 revised be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required? Aye. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is that amendments 1 to 4 on sheet 1031 revised be agreed to. The ayes were passed to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt, teller for the ayes, and Senator Ciccone, teller for the noes. There being 11 ayes and 35 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'll ask senators to remain in the chamber. Hopefully we can deal with the final two amendments relatively quickly. Senator Wish Wilson? How long have we got, Acting Deputy President? Okay. Um, Senator yeah, Wish Wilson, no. you have the call. Okay. Um, so the next two amendments um, are, of course, very important, um, and they relate to uh, a priority list that is actually, funny enough, um, the aspects of this legislation that deal with product stewardship scheme are very similar to the 2011 uh, scheme brought in by Labor. There's just a bit of fiddling around the edges and some rejigging. There's not really a lot new there, but one thing that is new is uh, the fact that that we have a priority list that the minister can add a packaging stream like plastic to the priority list. So um, these, uh, these amendments— um, Senator Wish Wilson, could you just um, indicate which amendments you are oh, currently sorry. Uh, there's two. Yeah, there's two left. So um, I would be—why uh, don't I just start by moving um, amendments on sheets 1043 revised to— uh, one and two. Are you um, seeking leave to move them seek together? Seek leave to move those. There being no objection, leave is granted. Th that, that, that amendment. Um, and the, uh, th this puts plastic packaging uh, on the next priority list. So once this legislation is passed tonight, the minister goes through a process where they can put any packaging stream on a priority list. And when it's on a priority list, I suppose what is, effect is different about it is that the minister can name and shame. A, uh, a, an organisation, uh, a company, a member of, uh, for example, the Packaging Covenant, um, for not meeting their uh, their targets. All right now, I'd rather, have, of course, seen a mandatory scheme that provided penalties for businesses that didn't meet targets. But this allows a minister to stand up in parliament under quite restrictive conditions, may I say, and name and shame a business that doesn't do the right thing. And there are, there are a number of free riders. In the packaging industry, that's why they've never uh, come anywhere close to achieving their targets. There are a lot of businesses that actually need a bit of a G up. Um, so this allows the um, minister to put them on a priority list, which essentially puts them on notice. Um, so, yeah, um, it's pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward. Um, we want to mandate tonight 
having plastic packaging put on that priority list. Um, so it's kind of a halfway house between a voluntary scheme and a mandatory scheme. Uh, it says, OK, um, you're applying to be a voluntary product stewardship accredited scheme, but you're, you're on the, product, you're on the uh, priority list now. You've got 12 months to show some progress. Otherwise, the minister can go into the chamber and uh, name up the companies that are free riding and causing problems. So um, I ask the Senate to support such a, such, such a simple, logical uh, motion that helps fix the problem. Senator McAllister. Uh, thanks very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, Labor supports these amendments. Um, in relation to the first amendment, we moved a similar amendment, in fact, in the other place, and it's a shame that the government didn't support it over there, and we hope that they will here. Um, but to give an example of how little has been achieved when it comes to waste outcomes of packaging at present, the recycling rate for plastic packaging is only 16 per cent. And without further regulatory action, it is pretty difficult to see how the government's target of 70 per cent by 2025 could possibly be achieved. It, it, we are months away from it being 2021, and we should stop kidding ourselves about the lack of progress. Uh, amendment 2 basically requires the statutory review of this act to be undertaken by uh, an independent body rather than the department, and this is very sensible. Uh, the statutory review of the Product Stewardship Act, which was due in 2016, didn't, wasn't delivered until this year. Um, it's plain that we need an independent body to engage on this task. Minister. Thank you. Very briefly, the government does not support the amendments moved by the Greens. In, uh, in this regard, uh, the minister has a priority list that provides uh, industry and the community with a clear statement of expectations by the government. Um, APCO have committed to seeking government accreditation for their packaging product stewardship scheme, and the government believes that such processes should be allowed to run their course uh, rather than imposing regulation on industry uh, additional to that which has already been pursued through these, uh, these arrangements. The question is that Senator Wish Wilson. Yeah, thanks, uh, Acting Deputy President. Sorry, um, I, I was moving. Um, I said I'd move sheet 1043 revised, one and two together, but. Sorry, I haven't moved um, 1071, so that's I, going to be dealt with separately. Correct. So, yep. So, um, so we are dealing with um, just providing an independent review, as Senator McAlister said. So we are yeah, we're, currently so we're, moving items yeah. one and two on sheet 1043 revised. Okay. The question is that amendments one and two on sheet 1043 revised be agreed to. So those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. I think the noes have it. Vision required. Ring the bells with the agreement of the whips for one minute. No. Four minutes. Real. Four minutes. Yeah, no, it's real. My mistake. Fair enough.
Stop the bells. The question is that amendments one and two on sheet 1043 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator uh, Urquhart to teller for the ayes and Senator McGrath teller for the noes. There being 32 ayes, 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Wish Wilson. So, uh, thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, so, the final Greens amendment here tonight is uh, on sheet uh, 11071 um, and this actually uh, puts into law that compromise I mentioned earlier between having a uh, mandatory product stewardship scheme, which um, the Senate has rejected tonight, uh, versus a voluntary scheme. This builds on what the government's actually put up, which I think is constructive, that we have a priority list which puts uh, waste streams and their businesses on notice. Senator uh, Wish Wilson, please resume your seat. It being 9.50, the committee reports progress. Senator Faruqi. Deputy President, um, I just rise to withdraw, withdraw the word racist from a statement I made earlier about the actions of Senator Abetz. I propose that the Senate now adjourn. And Senator, I will just give uh, Senators a moment to resume their position. Senator Henderson, perhaps, are you interested? No, uh, Senator, Senator Gallagher. Uh, 